Products are all around us. Everything we eat, touch or use every day was created as a result of project. And successful project management enabled to complete this task and create the product. The modern society continues to run on the project management. So the question is, what exactly the project management is? Basically, it's an art and science of getting things done to make unique product. It is how Japan built the first high speed rail system, the bullet train, in 1964. This is how the International Space Station was made by a group of 15 nations and 5 space agencies. Also, this is how your smartphone was designed in California and put together with more than 100 parts from more than a dozen of countries. And isn't about just making things. Service industries like information technology, software and healthcare have some of the most advanced project management techniques and processes. You can think of project management as keeping track of three flows. The flow of people, flow of process and the flow of tool. So in this course we would learn in depth about the project management and how to make a successful career out of it. This course teaches you both practical and theoretical idea. It has same breadth and depth as PMP course or any other project management course taught in university. I love teaching project management because the ideas and techniques are useful everywhere. This course is divided into two parts. Part 1 will cover the topic from basic project management till project procurement. And part 2 will cover the remaining section including how to develop a career in project management. Ideas you will learn in this course can be used in any kind of project management across any industry. Further, in the description below, you will find the link to download the course material. And if you like to read more about this, please feel free to do so. See you in the class. So, what is project management? Well, in simple terms, project management is basically an art and science of getting things done. And art is basically referred to as soft skills and science is basically referred to your hard skills so point management is basically combining your soft and hard skill to get the job done remember the project is basically a sequence of various activities and you need to perform this activity to achieve the overall objective so an art because there is no one definitive answer for how to best manage a project and a science because there are well-developed techniques and process that can help to complete the project successfully. So project management is basically art and science both at the same time and you need to you know, utilize all this soft and hard skill to complete the project. Like every art, project management also has its own history. Project management concept is not new to the human civilization. In fact, Project management dates back to the ancient time where several projects were done. Let's take some few examples. So the very first example which comes in my mind is Noah's Ark. It was a project management through which Noah's managed the construction of Ark and saves the humanity. Then another example is the Great Pyramid of Giza and also the Great Wall of China. They were all constructed through the project management practices. Even though the project management was not a formal term, but these all great projects were done through the project management practices. Then if we talk in terms of development of project management tools, the Gantt chart was the first tool which was developed in 1917 by Henry Gantt and is one of the common tools which is utilized in project management as a Gantt chart. Then the next big project which comes in my mind is the Hoover Dam project, which was done in 1931. That's another good example of project management. And then in 1950s, there was an official term coined for project management. So till 1950, there was no official term for the project management. So all these projects were done through the various project management practices, but there was no official term for the project management. So it was in 1950 when this term project manual was coined. And then the next development in terms of tool was CPM method, which is another tool, in fact, a key tool for the managing any projects and which was developed by the DuPont Corporation in 1957. And then another milestone is the found, uh, foundation of uh, PMI, which is Project Management Institute. And this Project Management Institute is basically known for its PMP certification 
and it was founded in 1969. So if we talk about the recent example of project management, SpaceX is one of the good examples which we can take as a successful project management. Also, the S model car of Tesla is a good example of project management. So basically through this example, I wanted to demonstrate the project managements are basically the backbone of modern economy. Everything we eat, drink, touch is a result of successful project management. And also the project management was developed through several fields of application, which include civil, construction, engineering, software and defense. Now the next question comes in, what are the origin of the project requirement? I mean, how the projects are decided and how they actually originate in a business scenario? Well, there are several factors. Mostly these are the six factors which basically drives the requirement of the project. First one is your market demand. Depending upon the market demand, there may be requirement of new projects. Then another is strategic opportunity. Depending upon the company's long-term vision or strategic positioning, they may decide to come up with new program or new projects which can help them to grow their business. Then the customer request. The customer may also have the specific requirement and they can ask the various company to do some projects so that they can benefit from those new initiatives. Then another driver factor is the technical advancement. There's a continuous development of technology which may lead to new projects requirement. Then there's a legal requirement. So there's a continuous updation in the government policies. New policies are coming depending upon the various situation. And again, that may lead to requirement of new projects. And then comes the risk mitigation. Remember, when any company or any business is doing its operation, they are continuously exposed to various kind of risk. And to mitigate those risks, company may come up with several projects or let's say the several specific initiative or activity which can help them to reduce those risks or reduce the impact of those uh, risks which, through these projects. So these are the six factors which basically originates the projects or the requirement of the projects which you know further taken up by the various department or various company and to meet the project or, or to meet the overall organization objective. So managing project is crucial for success of any firm and also the project management is very common term however it is often misunderstood. So what exactly the project management is? Well if you see the term project management it basically consists of two terms one is project another one is management which basically forms a project management term. So let's first understand this project and management term separately and then we'll combine together to arrive at definition of project management. So what is project? So if you go by definition of project, it basically a temporary endeavor with a beginning and end and it must be used to create a unique product, services or result. So if you see the keyword is here is temporary. It means it has a fixed start and end. And then the next keyword is your unique product. So basically what it means, every project produce some kind of unique product, services or result. It's not same as the previous project. So if you see the project is basically nothing but a series of tasks which is completed to reach a specific outcome under the given constraint. Now constraints could be anything. It could be financial, it could be related to your time, it could be related to the scope of work. Also, the project doesn't continue forever. It has fixed start date and fixed finish date. And also the project is not like operations where you do the continuous similar activity at the same in a repeated fashion. So the project in project is basically the no same activities are performed every time to produce the same output as it is done in operation. So no two activities are same in a project and every project is basically leads to some kind of unique product. And if you want to see a quick example of project, so designing a Tesla car is a project where you have to design a new model, but to produce the same model car in a production plant is kind of operation. So that's what's the difference between projects and operation. So having understood the definition of project, let's understand what is operation and what are the difference between operation and the project. So if we go by definition of operation, so basically operation is an ongoing activity that produces repetitive and long-term output like manufacturing product and supplying services. 
So the keyword is here if you see is repetitive. So basically operation is producing same kind of product in a repetitive fashion. So operation is nothing but the ongoing work effort. And the main objective of the operation is to sustain the business. So to capture the market or bring the new project or sell the more product to increase the revenue of the company. That's the main objective of operation. And that's why we call it it's repetitive in nature, right? So once the objective is reached, the operation adopts new sets of objective and continue to the work. So like once the new model arrives in the market, then the uh, the manufacturing plant will start producing the new kind of uh, Tesla car instead of you know producing the old one. So this is how the operations work in a business scenario. So basically, if we try to compare the project and operation, there are basically the three differences. So for project, it's a temporary endeavor where operation is like ongoing routine activity, which is kind of repetitive in nature then the projects always produce a unique output unique product or unique services whereas in operation you will always get the same kind of output then the project is basically terminated once objectives are met so it has basically this fixed start and finish finish state and once objectives are met the project is terminated whereas the operations continue to operate it's basically adopt new objective and keep on uh, making its operation in repetitive it's just like producing the new model of cars now having understood the project and operation let's understand what is management so if we go by definition management is basically an art of getting things done through and with the people in formally organized group so basically it's an art of creating an environment in which people can perform Individual can cooperate towards attainment of group goals and process of dealing with and controlling things people is basically management. So in the management, if you see the keyword is basically you're getting things done. So let's define the project management. So if we take the definition of PMI USA, the project management is basically application of knowledge, skills, tools and techniques to the project activity to meet the project requirement. So you remember, programming is nothing but you need to utilize your knowledge, your skills, your tools and techniques to the project activity. Remember, a project is basically a sequence of some activity which you need to perform to attain the project objective. So if we combine all together, programming is simply application of your knowledge, skill, tools and techniques to the project and attain the project goals. So if you see in overall, basically you need to focus on the three things. One is the planning, planning of your activity, planning of resources, everything has to be planned and then organizing. Based on the plan, you need to organize all those resources and then throughout the project, you need to manage and resource those resources through controlling and monitoring and make sure project team is working as they are supposed to and attaining their objectives as it was planned initially. Well, by now, I hope the project management concept is clear. But if you're still wondering what exactly project management is, then you can go through the story of Mike and Ted. I think the best example of project management is when I was completing my graduation. My friend, Mike, was a technical geek who loved to solve problems of people. One day, he received a call from her mother, Linda, seeking help to buy the best smartphone. Linda wanted to enhance her social network skill and expand her friendship circle. With the power of IT, Linda wanted to expand her homemade cookie business in her town. Mike was elated to hear her decision to join digital networking sites. He was determined to get the best mobile phone for his mother. After all, this requirement came from his mother and did not want to goof it up. So, Mike initiated brief conversation with his mother to understand the full specifications. He wanted to ascertain the key requirements like what kind of websites she would use while using mobile. Does she have any preference for iOS or Android type phones? What are her favorite colors? When does she want the phone to get delivered? What apps she would use? What is the budget for the phone? What accessories she would like? And so on. After listening to his mother's requirements and phone features, Mike did some quick planning. He decides to break this project into several steps. Also, Mike sought my advice on how he can buy the phone at the lowest price. His first step was to find the best place to buy the phone. 
His mother's budget for the phone was on the lower side, however, the targeted phone was of high-end features. He was unable to find the required phone at such a low price. So, he decided to look for online stores, where he could get the phone at discounted offers on the latest mobile. After several hours of research on the internet, Mike found the phone, he was looking for the desired price range. And for sure, finding the right phone for the woman, who carried him for 9 months takes a great deal of research. After pinning down the right mobile, Mike moved to the next step of ordering the phone online. However, Mike would need a credit card, to do the purchase, and get the mobile at the targeted price. And for that, he again turned on me for help. I knew, how seriously he is pursuing this mini project, and I was happy to help him out. So, with my credit card, Mike executed the online ordering of the phone with the fastest network provider plan, including the phone accessories. After the order placement, Mike continuously monitored the shipment status on daily basis. After two days, Mike checked the online status of the shipment as delivered. But Linda informed him, that she has not received the parcel. Mike was at the end of his wits. Mike thought he has been part of some online fraud. He made a phone call to customer care, for registering his complaints. To his surprise, the customer care executive took the matter on a priority basis. The team ran several checks through the various departments. Actually, there was confusion over the shipment address, and it was delivered to the wrong address. After several rounds of discussion, and phone, team assured Mike that the phone would be re-delivered to the correct address. The team issued a new shipment tracking code. As a proactive guy, this time Mike directly coordinated with the shipper's delivery team, and delivery boy. This way he was able to clearly communicate, and control the further delays in delivery. It took 5 days for the shipper, to re-deliver the package to his home address. Finally, the mobile phone was delivered on Sunday morning. Mike outfitted the phone with a screen protector, activated the network SIM card, and installed all apps as desired by his mom. Also, Mike taught her mother, how to create a Twitter and Facebook account, and follow someone. After spending his whole Sunday, Mike made the phone ready to use in all respect, and handed it over to his mother. Finally, the mission success was celebrated through a closing ceremony with Mike's favorite pizza. And, that is how Mike bought the perfect smartphone for the most favorite people in the world, his mother. By the way, did you notice that Mike has effectively used his project management skills to complete this mini project at his home? Well, that's a perfect example of project management. At the core, this is how the personal, as well as professional projects, are managed. So, does Mike's story sound familiar to you? I think the best example of project management is, when I was working at the world's, number one technological firm, Amazon. My colleague, Ted was a tech-savvy person who loves to solve problems of people. He was fascinated with the technical gadget and phones. All his friends and relatives always seek his help before buying any electronic items. One day, Ted had a quick chat with his boss Jen at the coffee corner. During the discussion, Jen told him that management is taking up several strategic initiatives to improve employee morale and productivity. Ted was intrigued by this new development regarding company strategy. He learned from Jen that company is starting several projects to achieve the mission. One of the initiatives was to provide an advanced smartphone to each employee. This initiative excited Ted, and he told Jen about his interest in the area of technical gadgets. Ted narrated several incidents, when he helped his colleagues and friends to buy the latest smartphone. After hearing for some time, Jen was assured that Ted is the right person to handle this project. On the same day, Jen had a discussion with management, and Ted was assigned as project manager. The project goal was to buy the best suitable smartphone for the company's employees. These employees were located in several geographical locations. The company has a very tight budget for this project. Also, Jen informed that management wants this project to be completed before Christmas. With a time period of little over two months, and a tight budget, Ted found himself in the middle of Pandora box. He has to quickly plan out all the activities, like identifying the best smartphone for different grades of employees. Right vendor, retailer, fastest delivery partners, and local team to coordinate the distribution. All of a sudden, what initially looked a fun project, is now changed into a mammoth task. Ted reached out to me for help in initiating the project. I told Ted that basically, it is the same activity that Ted performed for his mother, to buy the best smartphone. However, now it has to be performed on a large scale. Now, Ted would need a team of experts, and professionals who can perform tasks through well-defined processes, and practices. 
I helped him in developing the project charter and stakeholder list. With the approval of the project charter from Jen in place, Ted was ready to kick off the project. Mike quickly formed his project management team to do scope planning, work breakdown structure, schedule development, budget planning, quality, and risk planning. Ted come up with a perfect project management plan to execute the project work. However, at the very next week of execution, Ted's project management journey came to a hard stop. The cost management team informed him that rate of the handset which they had considered for the initial budget is now increased by 30% due to inflation and an unexpected shortage of electronic components. Ted thought of reducing the phone features. However, this will defeat the whole purpose of the project. If he removes some popular features, the phone becomes redundant and will not contribute much to the improve the productivity of employees. Ted was scratching his head and could not think of any solution for it. Management has already approved the maximum possible budget, and there is no way that the management will approve any additional budget. After evaluating several options over the weekend, Ted came to a conclusion to terminate the project. This will save some money for the company. Monday morning, while Ted was preparing to report his conclusion to Jen, the sourcing manager, Randy, came to his desk. Randy informed Ted that he may have a solution for his problem. Randy suggested that if mobile order is placed directly to manufacturers instead of retailer, the company can avail a heavy discount on the price. With this discount, the project can be completed under the budget. However, there is one condition with manufacturers: transportation and handling of shipment has to be managed by the company. Ted was sure with employees over that 10,000, the company has its own logistics team. The transportation of shipment can be handled internally. Ted briefed this situation to Jen and got the approval of the revised plan. Ted communicated the revised project management plan to the team. The team continued to execute the project work as per the new plan, and in fact, the team was able to accelerate the work. After 2 months of hard work and continuous effort, Ted was able to provide the best smartphone to all his colleague in the company well before Christmas. Also, the project was completed under the budget approved by management. By the way, have you noticed Ted and Mike? They both use their soft and hard skill to manage the project. So oh, that is why I call project management is basically art and science of getting things done. Also, the project management is kind of continuous process which basically identify and solve problem throughout the project life cycle. Basically, it is an integration of various knowledge areas like scope, cost, time, and even communication too. So, with the combination of creative idea, knowledge, skills, and tools, project management will get the job done, whatever your goal is. So, before going further, I would like to talk about the forefathers of project management. So, there are two forefathers of project management. One is Henry Gant, another is Henry Foyer. Henry Kant is famous for the Gantt chart as a tool, and Henry Foyle basically developed the five project management function, basically which is known as initiation, planning, execution, monitoring, and closure. Well, if you look closely, everyone is doing some sort of project by knowingly or unknowingly. In fact, your life is a project too, and it's a tool to promote the change and be it your personal life or the business. everywhere projects are basically promoting change and helping people and businesses to attain their objective so the next question comes that how the project and business goals are combined together how they are tied up so the project and company business goal they goes hand in hand so let's say the example of tesla so let's say the long term business goal is to capture the transportation market in industry now to achieve this business goal tesla may come up with several projects so one project is like tesla car where they want to basically capture the market of car industry and then the spacex is another project which is basically to travel the space uh, to capture the space travel and so by doing several projects basically companies try to achieve the one common business goal by doing all those projects and each projects may have the different goal which may support to the overall objective or the bigger vision of the company now the next question could be why do we need a specific project management discipline because 
Projects are always been there, right? So why do we need a specific discipline to manage a project? Well, the projects in modern days are complex. So they are consist of a lot of stakeholders and to manage all those complexity of the project, you definitely need a specialized project management team so that project can be done very efficiently and meet its objective at minimum cost. Also, project management provides a leadership and vision because it's very easy for a team member to deviate from the main goal and the project management team basically helps the team to align with the project objective which is aligned with the company's goal and in absence of project management simply it leads to chaos. So basically project management drives the team toward the goal in a smart way. So when I say smart, smart means basically specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely. So here's a quick summary. So first one is your project, which is basically temporary in nature and it's create unique product. Then operation is the ongoing work efforts and it's repeated to in nature. This is basically to sustain the business. Project life cycle, we will be learning in detail about this in later chapters. Uh, but project life cycle in brief is basically the phase which marks the completion of one phase or deliverable business. Product management, we all we already know that's to apply the skill knowledge, tools, and techniques to the project management activity to achieve the objective. Then the project management process group, basically the five process group, which is initiation, planning, execution, monitoring, and control. And we will be learning more detail in later chapters. So by now we have learned about the projects, operations, project management, and its overall concept. Now the question comes at how exactly projects are managed professionally. What is exactly the professional project management? So in previous section, we have learned about the project. Also, we have learned about what is the difference between project and operation and what is the meaning of management. And by combining these two terms, project and management, what exactly in terms of concept means by project management but when this project management has to be performed in business environment how exactly does it look like basically what is exactly the project management in a professional environment or i call it professional project management environment what exactly do you mean by professional project management and that is what we are going to discuss in this chapter So once you know what is the definition of project and management, it's not a rocket science to guess what exactly project management would be. Now the key part is that we need to understand what exactly the project management will look like in terms of professional world. So many times project management might look complicated to you and if you're working on a project in office, definitely many times you might feel that it's a complex process. But the chances are that you might have already handling some sort of project by knowingly or unknowingly, maybe in your office or in your personal life. So when I say personal life, let's say you want to buy a mobile for your mother or let's say for your girlfriend. Now buying a mobile itself become a project, but during that tip period, you don't realize that it's a kind of project. It seems to you as a normal activity and you perform it without any problem but let's assume that in office you need to buy mobile for all of your employee now that's become a complex project even though those activities are same but the magnitude of those activities now increase and which brings other complexity maybe in terms of design or the requirement from the specific band of employee or there may be some other budget constraint time constraint which will basically bring in the complexity and that's basically makes the project management complex. But if you don't need to much worry about the complexity part of the project management, because if you see in terms of management, so just to tell you, uh, tell you the, some facts that 56% of project managers are only certified, right? So the remaining 44% are still working as a project manager they are successfully managing those projects without having any certification so project management is more like uh, having an experience and applying those skills tools knowledge 
throughout your experience and managing the project and reaching the objective. Also, there's another interesting fact if you see that 33% of project fail not because the project is complex, but they don't get proper support from the senior management or key stakeholders. So getting a successful project completed, it's very important to have key stakeholder support or management from the top management. So let me further explain the example which I mentioned in previous section. So I mentioned the buying a mobile for a mother or your girlfriend is one of the examples. So let's say Ted wants to buy a perfect smartphone for his mother. Now, what kind of step Ted would be taking to basically complete this task? Remember, the objective is to provide the best smartphone to her mother, right? That's the objective of this, uh, let's say, mini project. So the very first logical step would be, you know, that Ted would gather the information for them from her mother. Basically, he would like to know what kind of mobile or what kind of smartphone her mother is looking for. And then based on the, you know, the gather information from her mother, he would basically go and do some research, maybe online or through the store and find out, you know, how to purchase the best smartphone, which basically meets her mother's requirement, right? And then once he find out what exactly the mobile model or specification, then he will simply go and execute the order online or maybe you know go to the uh, online uh, offline store and and make the order to purchase uh, that smartphone and once then he made the order then either he will directly get the mobile phone or maybe if he has paid online and make the order online then he will basically track the shipment coordinate with delivery guy so that the shipment is delivered right on time and at the right address right and then once he get the mobile probably he will activate and install all the apps maybe train her mother that how to use those apps or how to use mobile and finally you know her mother will be able to use and the best smartphone which Ted has bought so if you see the whole process right this one two three four five is basically nothing but in code the five process of project management so if you see the first process first process is basically your initiation right so initiation means ted has basically initiated at this step and gathered all the requirement for his mother and then based on those requirement he did a uh, proceed for the next step and that is basically nothing but planning. So once he found out what kind of mobile, what kind of uh, requirement is needed, based on that, he did some planning. And then once he planned everything, he basically executed the order, right? So here he basically executed the order. And then once he executed the order, he continuously monitor and control right remember this word monitor and control sorry about my handwriting uh, and then you know finally he basically got this uh, mobile phone and handset and then handed over it to uh, his mother and then finally you know did the completion you will say of this project or mini project and completion means basically the objective is achieved right so and remember the objective was to get the mobile phone so if you see this is the core of any project management process step so it is initiation planning execution monitoring and then completion and when we go to the professional project management we will see these five project management process is continuously being performed at various stages of project so before going deep into the project professional project management processes uh, let's quickly see several definitions which is provided by the project management knowledge bodies uh, like pmi or apm or other various uh, source of knowledge or we can say the source of information so and in overall i mean they all points toward the same 
definition or similar kind of meaning of break man -made. so if you see uh, the first definition which is basically from the PMI USA Project Management Institute of USA and they basically define the Project Management is application of knowledge skills tools and techniques to the project activity to meet the project requirement so project requirement is basically nothing but these are the objectives which you need to meet when you complete the project so we have already seen this uh, definition in previous section so this is one of the you know most utilized or most uh, shared uh, definition of project management you will find all over the uh, internet then the next definition is coming from uh, the APM and again if you see they have also the similar wording so project management is application of process methods skills knowledge and experience right they have added word experience here to achieve the specific project objectives according to the project acceptance criteria within the agreed parameter so when we say in the agreed parameter this is nothing but referring to the various constraints right so this is this we will be discussing later in detail but this is what this means so basically idea is that you apply your skill your knowledge your experience to achieve the project objective under the given boundaries or let's say under the given constraints then the next definition is i have taken from uh, wikipedia so again the wikipedia where the lot of uh, subject matter experts provide the opinion in terms of you know, defining the project management and if you see the wordings of the project management as per the wikipedia it's a leading work of team so it's basically they're calling project management is a process of leading the work of a team to achieve the goals and meet the success criteria at the specified time so here they are talking about one of the constraints that is uh, every project has to be done within specific time limit and then they have the, some specific criteria maybe budget uh, criteria or some specific goal need to be reached so those has to be achieved through a team and that is what exactly the process is called as project management process and here they are also mentioning the challenges of the project management so the main challenge of project management is basically to achieve all the project goals within the given constraints so constraints are very important because these are the defining boundaries for any project to complete so if you combine all those various definitions and we try to figure out what are the key areas where all those uh, project management bodies are focusing on so they are basically calling the project management is nothing but the process of planning organizing and managing resources to achieve the organization objective right this is what they are all pointing towards so this is basically nothing but it's consist of your planning then organizing and then managing the resources managing resources from the start till the end of the project so here are some other facts about the project management so if you see 75 percent of business and executive if you see especially we talk about in software project they know from the beginning that the project will fail and then another interesting fact about the 50 percent of all project management offices closes within three years right well just think about it <laughs> So in my project management experience, what I understood that project management is basically about managing three flows. That is flow of people, flow of process and tools. So I call it that this is the PPPT of project management. So these are the three pillars of any project management. And if you want to manage any project successfully, you need to focus on these three terms that is a people process and tool and while project in progress you need to find a harmony or some kind of balance between all those three pillars so they could be lack of uh, resources they could be lack of the process they could be lack of tool or they could be excessive use of you know all those three pillars so it's a best combination of the, all those three pillars or three element 
that basically ensures uh, the success of the project and again this uh, balance has to be uh, maintained within the project constraint so when i say project constraint you cannot have the unlimited number of people which you can deploy in the project you cannot have all kind of sophisticated tool because they require uh, the uh, acquisition cost and then that may be the higher than the initial cost and which basically impact the overall your profit or the margin of your project itself so there, there are certain boundaries and you need to basically balance these three elements within the project constraint and optimize in a such a way that you meet the project objective this is what exactly it's mean uh, when i say you know the harmony between these three elements so basically what it means that projects do not have infinite resources right so when i say infinite resources that we don't have the infinite budget we don't have the infinite people we don't have the infinite time so we have a limitation of the resources and project has to be performed within those limited resources right and that's what basically the constraints mean and if you see some of the in interesting facts so 70 percent of organization projects fails to deliver on time so if you see overall out out of 100 70 projects are failing to complete on time right and then if you see you know and and during those uh, my experience in project management i try to find what are the major uh, reason for the failure of the project so there could be a number of reasons but several times i found that one out of three projects have no baseline so basically 30 percent of the project 34 percent of your projects have no baseline so we will be you know going in detail and uh, understand what exactly the project baseline is but this is one of the very common thing like baseline means suppose if you want to measure something you need to have some start right a point from where you start and a point from where you finish and then the difference between these two points you are going to basically measure or in terms of uh, magnitude or quantity or whatever but suppose if i say that there is no start itself then how would you measure at any point of time what is the difference and that is what exactly the baseline means that you need to set a baseline for your cost baseline for your timeline and then again the baseline you measure and in case if you don't have those baseline then it's very difficult to measure the project progress well anyway we will be discussing this detail in, in later section but just for uh, uh, facts uh, it, it's interesting to know that 34 percent of the projects they don't have the baselines so in my previous section i was referring the constraint for the projects and these are the basically nothing but the defining boundary for any project to complete so there are basically three constraints in all kind of projects and that is basically your scope cost and time right and also these triple constraints are also known as iron triangle of project management so this is also called pm iron triangle right so when i say scope scope is nothing but what are the work which you have agreed with the client to complete in any project so this is basically what are the activity what are the deliverables which you will be providing to the client is basically nothing but your known as scope then the cost as it's clear from the definition itself so every project has some cost and of course there's no availability of infinite resources as we discussed in previous slides so definitely you have to complete the project in a certain cost right if you go above that cost that will be lost to your company and basically it will erode your project margin then if next one is your time so remember any project has a start and finish date it means that it has to start a certain date and then it has to finish a certain day so there is a limited time it cannot continue forever to the infinity right so project has basically a limited timeline and this is what exactly it's mean by time and so this is when 
this is what actually let's say contractor coming to the client to complete the project in a certain timeline and let's say if the contractor or the team is not able to complete the project on time there could be various consequences so in let's say construction industry this could lead to the ld and you know other complications which basically results into the financial losses so we will be discussing those in detail but in terms of constraint these are the basically triple constraint which we know that is basically nothing but your scope right and then cost and time right and one more thing if you need right the quality is basically a center of all those three uh, constraints so what does mean that whatever you do either do your work or your cost or your time this has to meet the certain quality or standard requirement which you need to meet while you know meeting all this constraint so and one more thing also you will notice that if you change any one of those boundaries so let's say if you reduce some of the activity from your project or let's say you increase some of the activity in the project this will directly impact your cost and time how remember when you increasing your activities basically this means that you will require more cost more resources to complete those work also if you increase the number of activity this may require additional time to complete the project and once additional time is required this will basically overflow your finish date or the completion date so if you change any one of these triple constraint and similarly if you let's say try to reduce the cost of any project this will be done by either reducing the scope or some quality issue or you can you know have the impact on the time if you try to reduce it maybe you will try to optimize the timing of the resource or ideal time so any of this constraint if you are pulling either you are increasing or decreasing this will have subsequent impact on your remaining two constraint right uh, we will discuss this constraint uh, theory and and you know how its impact in various practical example later section uh, but as of now i think it's pretty much clear that what is triple constraint and how it's actually uh, impact overall in terms of uh, you know the boundaries of the project so if you want me to demonstrate the constraint you can take this example from the service industry so this is what i you know found on internet uh suppose if you want to avail some services so you can avail a good services at very cheap price but it won't be fast because then the service provider will try to minimize his cost it may take some time to him to figure out how it will optimize so that he can provide you with cheap and good services but remember time is limited in project management industry so again you know this is the constraint which you may face or let's say you want a good services fast but then it won't be cheap so suppose if you want a good services also you want to do it very fast then of course you need to spend additional money or additional resources so that you can complete those tasks or provide the services fast right or the third sub option would be your you want a fast service but you want to do it in a cheap cost well that would be good right because in that case what will happen the service provider will try to do it fast by skipping several mandatory activity or mandatory part of the scope which may lead to you know uh, basically uh, bad services so it won't be a good services or the actual services which is required and may you end up with uh, problem so why i am basically you know explaining this because this exactly represent the dilemma of every project manager in every project life cycle right so every project manager face this issue because remember every time the management will want their project manager to reduce the cost to maximize the profit and at the same time when the project man manager goes to the execution team execution team will require more time to execute those work they will require more budget to complete those activity and a project manager is always sandwiched between these three situations so very much practical situation and if you ever work in any project 
you will find this problem is always there. So having understood the project constraint and its boundary, let's quickly understand what exactly the project life cycle is. So project life cycle is basically the combination of distinctive phases and every project if you see if you take any kind of project it basically goes to various stages it could be three stages four stages five stages or n number of stages but minimum uh, any project will have at least three stages so that is first stage is your basically initiation or you can say the start of the project then there will be some intermediate step it could be designing planning depending upon the type of industry uh, these phases can increase or decrease this basically the intermediate phases and then you will have the final stage which is basically the completion so we will be defining your, these stages for the uh, various uh, industrial project but in a concept wise a project life cycle is nothing but basically it's a combination of various stages or phases and every project at least minimum they have the three phases at any point of time right so like every project which is unique similarly the project life cycle is also unique for a particular project and remember one thing there is no standard guideline or defined guideline to define a project life cycle this project life cycle will depend from project to project from industry to industry in fact in the same industry the two projects could have a different uh, project life cycle that will depend upon you know the project to project condition and the type of the projects we are dealing right so and remember one thing project life cycle is not same as a project management process so remember we discussed a five project management process that was basically initiation planning execution monitoring and control and then your completion so these are not project life cycle these are basically project management processes and this will basically help you to solve all the problems or do the audio project management activity during the each phase of your project so let's say this is first phase second phase and third phase or let's say fourth phase and so on so at the each phase you need to apply these processes and solve your project problems so we will be discussing in detail earlier but never confuse the project life cycle with project management process they are the two separate thing okay and then the project management process has to be performed as i mentioned earlier that throughout the whole life cycle right it's not just one time activity but you have to continuously perform from the start till the end of the project so the project phase right so project phase is basically gives you the project life cycle so project life cycle is nothing but if you see the project life cycle is basically combination of phase 1 plus phase 2 plus phase 3 and so on so this is basically combination of phase will give you the project life cycle okay and how do you know when particular phase is completed so at the start of the project you define the each phases basically you define the deliverables at each stage right you define the deliverables or basically the list of deliverables which you are supposed to complete or supposed to provide it to the customer at every stage and when you meet all those deliverable at each stages you basically mark it as the phase completion and then you project move to the next phase so if you see from phase one to phase two you will check the deliverable what are the provided or what were the planned deliverable and then based on that you move to the next step so this is how you move from phase to phase and once you complete all the phases which is basically gives you the completion of project life cycle so this is nothing but the combination of all the phases and this is what we call as project life cycle okay so let's take some example of project life cycle depending upon type of industry or type of project so here let's say you know our first example is for the software development project so this is i have taken from an it industry project so let's say we are going to uh, manage a software development project so in general or what is the typical example of project life cycle of any software project so like any activity 
this is basically it will start so your first phase will be basically planning so normally in software project or software industry uh, planning is done depending upon the requirement or what kind of uh, contract specification is there's all those things are done during this phase and then the project move to the next step which is analysis depending upon uh, the requirement that depending on the project plan basically the team has to analyze exactly you know what are the the, the activity the actual detail a uh, working plan and then based on that team move to the design phase design phase basically you know the coding and all those things they need to be basically find out how they will uh, code those they have to basically do the lot of coding with the coding team and then the project move to the implement basically you implement those software at the customer's location or wherever this agreed uh, platform is there and once you implement those then the next phase is basically test and integration so before handing over to customer you need to test and integrate with the other platform and make sure they are meeting the customer specification and requirement right and then project move to the maintenance uh, phase which is basically debugging or solving uh, various technical issues throughout the use of the software and then finally you know based on the obligation of your project in the contract you finish the projects so this is what a typical project life cycle for a software project right so this is how it looks like so the first phase would be planning second phase would be analysis third phase is design fourth phase is implementation then the fifth phase is testing and integration and maintenance and remember this is just a typical example it can be modified depending upon the size or the type of the project now similarly moving to another type of project which is this construction project i have taken for one of the civil construction project so again obviously uh, the projects uh, start with the planning so planning is a key uh, phase and once planning is done it will move to the design basically let's say if you want to design a building you have to design with the help of architecture team uh, and meeting all the criteria rules and regulation and then you come up with the, those drawings and everything and then the project move to the procurement so remember you know the uh, civil construction project they require a lot of material so you need to do a lot of procurement material services all those things and once you have the material uh, basically the procured material and design project will move to the construction which is actual construction of building at site right and once it is constructed this project will basically move into operation where you will hand over the facility to client or customer and then the project will move to the maintenance basically uh, looking after you know all the utility issue or various queries which is uh, pending work or the work which is supposed to finish after the handover those kind of work will be completed at this phase and then finally your project will finish so this is a typical example of civil construction project uh, where this is how it will look like as a project life cycle and these are the typical phases which you can find in a normal construction project so the next example i have taken for project life cycle is from an epc oil and gas project so the EPC, any EPC oil and gas project start with a conceptual phase, then move to the engineering phase where all the detail engineering are done, and then project move to the procurement stage, and then from procurement it move to the construction, from construction lead to the commissioning of the facility, and then finally the startup and handover to the client, and then you know the overall operation starts. So this is what a typical oil and gas project life cycle will look like. Now here, one thing you notice that at every phase, right, at every phase, you need to basically utilize some knowledge areas. So when you talk about a project, a project we have, have scope, a project has time, a project has cost, quality, procurement, then communication, risk, human resource. So these kind of area, this kind of expertise or this kind of uh, uh, you know the elements which need to be managed throughout the project by the project manager by integrating you know all those areas and this is basically you know one of the integration itself is one of the area where project manager need to work on and combine all those in optimized way so that your 
work is completed at each phases right at each phases you need to look into this knowledge area and manage wherever it is applicable and how would you manage that that is basically you're going to do with the help of project management process so if you see these process or these application uh, management of this knowledge area has to be performed by project manager at every phases right by utilizing this project management process so this is what i was mentioning early, earlier slides project life cycle is not equal to the project management process so this is project management process which is separate and project life cycle is nothing but combination of your phases so like we discussed earlier your project life cycle plc is not equal to project management processes right so they are not equal they are different right plc is basically summation of your faces right some of your faces <coughs> Project management process is basically nothing but combination of five process, which is initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control, and then final closer. And remember, this process need to be performed at every phase of the project, right? So if you see, we have five phases, or let's say the four phases. So every phase, you need to perform this project management process so that you complete all the activity right so phase one phase two phase three phase four and each phases has to be performed or completed through this pm process so how does it work well it's pretty simple initiation means basically starting of your project and creating a business case or feasibility study once you complete that process then you basically move to the project plan and then develop their a project management plan then every you know, component has to be discussed how you will be executing in terms of cost risk resource and timeline all those detailed planning has to be done and once you're finished with planning basically we have to do the execution so whatever you have planned you have to perform those activity in the execution phase and while you're performing those activity, you need to always keep eye on those activity, whether the work done or the progress which you're making, is it actually as per the plan or it is deviating from the plan. And then once these activities are completed, you need to formally close all those activity or let's say that all the documentation has to be done in terms of client deliverable or the other responsibility and then move on to the next project or let's say if it's moving from one phase to another phase then you move to the next phase so this is how it's work and it seems pretty simple i think it might have clear and in case if you have any doubt please let us know by having a comment below so quick summary uh first point is market demand again i think it's a pretty simple term you will be knowing that depending upon your know, market what kind of product is required or what kind of product is basically is required by the customer is depend uh, basically means your market demand strategic opportunity depending upon the market scenario and conditions so company decide to strategically position their business and this is what basically means that identify those opportunity and plan your uh, activity or let's say the projects depending upon how you better you can control those market customer request is basically nothing but the requirement which is coming from the customer side which basically dictate uh what's customer want right then the <clears throat> technical advancement again it's related to uh the various technology which is being developed and it's a continuous process so uh depending upon the various technical event or technical advancement in a particular industry that may define your you know the how you will going to take the projects then the legal requirement again this is uh all business activity are bound by the various policy from the government for the various organization and if those policies and legal requirements are changed definitely you know this may lead to require some new projects or new activity or new assignment to meet those obligations so in previous section we have basically learned the projects 
project management, project life cycle, project phases. So having a clear understanding of project management and its elements, now the very next obvious question would be who actually manages the projects, right? And that's what we are going to learn in this section. So if you see the project management team is basically divided into three tiers. First one is top management team. Another one is your project management team, then your project execution team. And if you see the level of working and how they manage the projects. So top mat tier management team, they basically manage at business level. So basically what they do, they coordinate and manage the project organization. They monitor the progress of various projects at the higher level in terms of milestone or toll gate. And they also look after the various number of projects, not just one single project, but portfolio of the projects. They look at very high level and see how the KPIs are performing. But when we go one step down, there comes the project management team, right? So these project management team may be specific to some sets of projects or some specific projects, depending upon how the organization is there. And then if you go further one step down, which is basically your project execution team, they are specific to the particular project, right? So they could be team one for another project, for project two, project three. So this is basically project management team and project execution teams comes under the project level. So they are the people who are directly working on the projects, whereas the top management team are the people who are overviewing those projects. In fact, the number of projects at the same time. So they are not directly involved in a day to day activity of the problem. It is the project management team and the execution team they are the basically you know involved in day-to-day -day activity of any project right so they are the basically actually driver or let's say the actual uh, uh, acting people in a project level and they basically manage the projects they monitor the progress to the milestone they solve the problem and all those things is basically done by your execution team and project management team so this is how a project typically managed in a business organization. So if you talk about the ranking or the job title of these tiers, so this is basically uh, depending upon the various tier level, we can define you know, some of the common job title which comes under those seniors management or middle management or supporting role. So when I say senior management, this is what the top management I was referring in previous slide, right? This is basically the top management and this includes like chief project officer vice president of project management project management office executive portfolio executives project man portfolio managers and project directors so they all basically come under the top management team who is not directly involved in daily to daily activity but they are managing at higher level or you can say the business level then there comes the middle management team which is basically what i mean by project management team right so they are the consist of i mean they can just titles like senior project manager project manager control managers planning managers and associate project man so those kind of roles are basically part of your project management team and they are directly involved with various other functions uh, which is basically nothing but your project execution team right so these are the two teams which are directly involved in your project and in project execution team you will be having roles like project planner project scheduler controller document controller coordinator administrator support officer engineers those are you know the roles are basically coming under supporting role or you can say the project execution team So if you try to map what we discussed in previous slides, so basically your top management is tier one, which is your senior management. Project management team is tier two, which is your middle management. And project execution team is basically tier three, which is supporting roles. So while discussing who manages the projects and the various level of project management, it is very important to know these three terms which is project, program, and portfolio, 
right? So project we have already learned in previous sections and slides. Now, how the project program and portfolio is related that we are going to understand, right? So if you see if any organization, let's say one company, which is uh, the biggest company of the contractors in you know the civil contracts. So this is just an example. So they must be having some different portfolios. So one may be looking after the road projects, another may be looking after dam projects, another may be looking after some commercial buildings and those kind of portfolio they might be having, right? And this is what it means by the portfolio. When I say portfolio is basically getting managed by your senior executive or let's say CEO level of uh, title will be basically holding or managing this portfolio levels uh, or the portfolio. And what exactly the portfolio is? Portfolio is nothing but combination of program or project. So portfolio, suppose if you want to find out what exactly portfolio means. So portfolio is uh, basically, you know, it's a combination of projects, right, plus programs. So it's combination. So if you see this example, right? So in this portfolio A, you have two programs, program A and program B, which is basically being managed by the, uh, some program manager. And then each program has some different kind of projects, project one, project two, project three. So one portfolio, it basically consists of various program and those program basically consists of various projects. And then these each projects are maintained or managed by your project managers. So in an organization, uh, basically what happens that every tier level manage the projects in any organization at their own level. So let's say the top executive, they manage the project at the business level, your middle management team or project management team manage the projects with the execution team at the project level. So this is how the projects being managed. So it is not like no one person which was managing the project that is project manager but it is a chain of management which is basically you know managing a particular project so it's always about the whole chain your top management team your middle management team and then your basically the project execution team or the supporting team right so this is Let's say if any, any project, so project is not managed by one team or one person, it is basically a combination of various level of management who is looking after the overall management of the project. So if you talk about specifics of any project organization, so it's basically structure of any project, right? It's created separately with specialists and workers. So basically, which give you the overall project team. And they have basically three area of competence, right? What we discussed previously, one is a project board, which basically takes the various decision, the key decision. And then there's a the leadership team, which basically drives the project management team to reach the project objective. And then we have the project team or the execution team who basically responsible for the implementation of all those decision and direction given by the upper level of management. So this is how typically any project organization work or how they are leveled in three groups and accordingly they perform their activity. So if you talk about the type of the organization structure, so for a project organization they are basically the three type of uh, organization structures one is your functional another one is your project ties and another one is your matrix so in functional they are basically depend upon the departments and it's basically grouped by the specialization and these normally you know these projects are executed in silo environment so the project will be done by the each function separately and each function will focus on their own project and this is how the projects is performed in their organization. Then the another type of organization structure comes, which is basically a projectized organization where one specific project team is assigned to a particular project. So they, and this is basically, you know, based on each project, which team is working and that particular team is basically devoted to the particular project. 
then comes a matrix organization and this is the most prevalent or kind of you know very effective and efficient uh, uh, organization structure in terms of uh, the EPC contract so here basically the matrix is nothing but it's a hybrid of project ties and function where there is a flexibility between the function manager and the project manager to work on various kind of project at the same time this is basically done to optimize the resource allocation and basically reduce the cost of the project and this basically organizations helps the project team to have the right source available at the right time in a right quantity so uh, further if we discuss about the detail of functional organization so here if we see the functional manager has all authority so they have the full authority of their projects which is done under their function resource will directly report to the function manager not the project manager here the project manager will simply act as a project expeditor or coordinator so if you see this example let's say this organization this is a ceo level or ceo level and then there are various function your engineering marketing it and manufacturing so what will happen in a function organization each function will have some different kind of projects and they will focus uh, efforts in all those projects right and this is not connected to this function or this function this is completely separate this is what we mentioned earlier it's a silo environment right it's nowhere there's no cross-functional communication happening similarly for marketing they may have the different project they focus on their own project similarly it team will focus on their projects and manufacturing focus on their own function project there is no coordination between various functions and this is what mean by functional organization then comes the project organization so projectized organization is basically the project manager have full autonomy or authority here the project manager decides everything so if you see a typical example of Productized organization. So the very top level is basically owned by the PD or PM, or you know, it's the same level as CEO or your CPO or CEO. So they have the same level of authority, right? In any projectized organization. And each project, let's say in each organization, or let's say one organization have a different numbers of projects. So each project will have their own PM and they will have your own authority to manage their project separately. So this is what it's mean by the projectile organization where organization is basically nothing but combination of various project and project manager has full authority and directly responsible uh, uh, for the project team and its project progress and project team actually directly reports to the project manager. So next one is matrix organization and matrix organization has various uh, variation. So this one is your strong and I will tell you know why I'm calling it strong. But here the project manager has full authority or equal authority as functional managers and the resource report to the project manager and then project manager is here actually called as project manager. So let's say if this is a one organization of matrix. Uh, format and here we have the various function that is engineering marketing IT and let's say there's a one project is going on and which is managed by your project manager so what happens that resource from the each function will form this project management team and they will report directly to the project manager so project manager has full authority to reassign to reallocate or to you know provide those tasks or assign some tasks to all these team members and that's why I'm calling it as a strong because PM has full authority here right so here PM has full authority and that's why I'm calling it strong then the next variation of metric organization is the balance right here the functional manager and project manager both shares the authority either through the dor responsibility will be defined who will be uh, dealing with what or they have the same level of authority or equal authority in terms of uh, you know uh, resource allocation and then the resource will report to the project manager but what happens let's say in previous example even though the project team is working the engineering function can decide 
the deployment of these resource depending upon let's say the engine function things there's another project which is being carried out by the organization and this has to be prioritized this function can prioritize the deployment of the resources and once we discuss this with the project manager so this is what means by the balance matrix organization then the next matrix organization is basically the week here again it depends upon the authority uh, of the project manager so in this weak matrix organization functional manager has full authority right resource report to the pm but the project manager basically act as a project coordinator right so here what happens that the function managers they decide which resource has to be deployed and up to how long they have to deploy it and when they need to you know take in from taken out from the, uh, the project team. So here the project manager will simply act as a coordinator without having much uh, you know, power to influence. So uh, key definition. So one thing is we have just learned the project managers. So basically it is a person responsible for managing the project and managing the stakeholder communication and overall project quality. Project sponsor. So basically the person or the group that provides the financial resources or the go ahead to the project manager to start the project. Function manager, as we discussed previously, it's basically assign the personal and receive and evaluate the individual performance review based on their each functions. So that is basically like engineering function, procurement function, IT function, and so on. Then we have the project management team. This is a team which is directly involved in the project management activity and then overlook all the project activity directly and they work with the project execution team project team is basically project execution team they are that responsible for performing all those activity or implementing whatever the project direction or vision or leadership which is coming from the top management so quick summary we already know what's a project sponsor Project manager, I think there's nothing much to explain. Performing organization is basically the organization who is doing the work, who is involved in, you know, implementing various projects. Function manager, we have discussed earlier, this depends upon who is owning which function. Project management team is basically your main execution team who is directly working. Just one question, have you ever wondered how the projects are managed in heaven or how projects managed by the God. Remember, Nuha's Ark was one of the projects which was managed by God itself to save the humanity. Do you have other example? Well, if not, why don't you see this video? Once upon a time, God was evaluating an idea to help children on the earth. The main aim was to make every child's wish come true on the Christmas Eve. With this endeavor, God wanted to bring peace and harmony to every family on the earth. He asked his saints to do a cost-benefit analysis of this idea. After in-depth analysis of the case, they found that idea had a good potential and can be very beneficial for the mankind generations. With this initial assessment, God decided to go ahead with the implementation of the idea. He was looking for a suitable saint to do the complete task. While discussing this idea with Saint, God found that one of his pop has experience in sending gifts. Also, he found that Santa loves and cares for children. And that was a moment when God found the project manager to implement his idea. Soon, God handed over a project charter to Santa with specific goals. Since Christmas was nearing, he asked him to hurry. After all, Christmas is the birthday of his son. Santa was asked to fulfill the wish of every child and give them on the Christmas night. Also, God informed that Heaven's management is running low on budget and want to complete this project at minimum cost. Managing a project has never been an easy task, especially when you're working with kids. Initially, Santa thought this would be a piece of cake. However, soon things become very complex. Considering huge number of children and varying wishes, this turned out to be a very impossible task to complete on such a short notice. With a time period of little over two months and a tight budget, Santa found himself in the middle of Pandora box. He will need to quickly plan out all the activities like identifying the best gift for the different children, right vendors, retailers, faster delivery partner, and team to coordinate the distribution. Santa reached out to his best friend, Pope Planner. 
poked hole Santa that basically it's the same activity that Santa performed for his children. However, now it has to be performed on a large scale for all kids on the earth. Santa would need a team of experts and professionals who can perform the task through well-defined processes and practices. His friend planner helped him to develop a project charter and stakeholder list. With the approval of project charter from the guard, Santa was ready to kick off the project. Santa quickly formed his project management team to do the scope scheduling, work breakdown structure, budget planning, quality and risk management. Santa came up with a perfect project management plan to execute the work. However, at the very next week of execution, Santa's project management journey came to a hard stop. The cost controller informed him that the cost of procuring gift, which they had considered for initial budget, is now increased by 30%. Since there is high inflation and huge demand of gift with supply chain constraints, Santa thought of buying cheap gifts. However, this will defeat the whole purpose of the project. If he doesn't give the gift as expected by children, they won't be happy. Also, God would not be able to achieve his initial object. Santa was scratching his head and couldn't think of any solution. Management has already approved the maximum possible budget and there is no way that management will approve any additional budget. After evaluating the several options over the weekend, Santa came to a conclusion to terminate the project. At least, this will save some money for the haven. Monday morning, while Santa was preparing to report his conclusion to the guard, the sourcing manager Randy came to his desk. Randy informed Santa that he may have a solution for his problem. Randy suggested that if Gibbs orders is placed directly to manufacturer instead of retailer, the project can avail a heavy discount on the price. With the discount, project can be completed under the budget. However, there is one condition with manufacturer. Transportation and handling of shipment has to be managed by the project team. Santa was sure with his sleigh and 12 reindeer, the transportation of shipment can be handled internally. Santa briefed the situation to God and sought his approval for revised plan. Santa communicated the revised plan to his team. The team continued to execute the project work as per the new plan and in fact, the team was able to accelerate the work. After two months of hard work and continuous effort, Santa was able to provide the best gift to all the children on the Christmas Eve. Also, the project was completed within the approved budget. And that's how Santa managed the Christmas project. So, in previous section, we have learned about the project management, who manages the project, and basically all about the professional project management. Now, the question is that there are a number of projects which goes in every project management industry or various business environment. So, the question is that how do you exactly choose a project? You cannot start working on all kind of projects. Remember, like life is full of choices. The point is that you are not going to choose all options. You decide which options to choose and which options do not. And the same basically applies in a project management industry too. So any business organization who is looking after the various type of projects, they need to find out what is the right project for their business. So like people make choices every day. Similarly, Companies also make choices in the same way as you do. So you may be choosing to like have dinner at some place or maybe you are thinking about your career and which career do you want to choose. So in the same way, company also go for choosing the various projects, right? And of course, like some choices are easy, some choices are not so easy, you know, they are serious and they have long term effect in your life and in the same way, for a business, before deciding working on a project, they need to consider what are the long-term impact in terms of business growth and opportunity. So, in business environment, company have the several project opportunities. So at any point of time, they are basically thinking about various number of projects. There could be n number of projects which company is considering at any point of time, which basically supports your business and the growth. Now, the point is that company has a limited resources. They cannot invest on all projects or they cannot carry on all the projects at the same time. So, they need to prioritize their project's objectives as well as the priorities. And depending upon that, 
they basically selects new projects so they are basically selective which projects is going to beneficial for them so what exactly they look for they basically look for the benefits right in terms of company return of investment and other benefits which company may get in a long term so projects are not randomly selected in fact they are evaluated on various criteria various uh, parameters and based on that company decides on projects and also safety is one of the key factor right even though you do the business it's not only just profit it's also take care of safety also remember the project selection is an integral part of transforming any business right so any business if they want to transform from one uh, market position to another market position they need to continuously invest in a project to achieve their growth objective or capture the market opportunity so to be very specific why business select the projects well basically to avoid any poor results right they are basically selecting a wrong project could result to a lot of poor result in terms of company performance and the growth as well as the return of investment to their stakeholders also company may lose focus if we select the wrong project right company has certain objective vision and goal and all those projects need to be aligned in terms of their vision and company's goal then the third thing is the wastage so if you select the wrong project for your company it is simply lead to the wastage of the resources which basically means the cost and basically means if cost this means loss to your company so these are the key reasons why the company has to be very selective when they are selecting any project because it has to be aligned with their overall company objective in terms of profit in terms of results in terms of company vision and optimization of company operations so so far we have talked about the impact of wrong selection of projects on a company level but also if you select the wrong project this will have a cascading impact on the project itself right so if you select the wrong projects definitely it is not going to align with the company's objective and this will lead to a poor performance then also definitely it's going to lead cost overrun and delay which will result to the further financial losses for the company and that's why we avoid selecting wrong projects then the loss of interest definitely if you see a lot of bad outcomes or a lot of negativity in the project itself which will basically lead to the loss of interest among the team member and this will lead to impact their performance then of course you know the if you send the wrong select the wrong project which will definitely lead to rise in high stress level among the team member and again that will impact their productivity then the very common thing the blame game right so if you select the wrong project from the beginning you will see lot of blame game is going on among the team members so that's why it's very important to select the right project and selecting the wrong project has its own impacts on your team on your company and overall objective so how do you select the project how you are going to select the project for yourself well if you talk about the personal project or when you're working in an organization how you select the best project for your company well if you talk about the project selection process it has basically three step first thing is identifying the business need then you do the feasibility study and then you finally select the project so in the step 1 you finally find out what is the market demand what is the company need what is the customer request what is the technology change legal policy you check all those external factors which is basically driving the business case then you need to find out whether these are feasible right in those scenarios whether you have the probability of success is high whether you have have the expertise whether you have the resources or capability all those things are done in step 2 which is basically nothing but call feasibility study and once you are done with feasibility study you move to the step 3 which is basically your project selection and that is done based on the benefit measurement 
comparative approach, constraint optimization. Remember, at step two, you may be having several number of projects, right? You may be having n number of projects. And then when you go to the step three, you basically prioritize these projects. And then based on that, maybe you decide to work on top two projects or top three projects or maybe top five projects. So this is how you do the project selection based on where you have the more benefit, where you have the best uh, approach or best uh, benefits in terms of return of investment or the constraint optimization because in some cases your projects may be selected based on where you have the limited constraint or we have the maximum constraint. So this is what the overall process is. In summary, it's like the three step process. One is business need, another one is feasibility study, and then project selection. So in business environment, based on the feasibility studies, project selection methods, and the committee, they simply, they will select the project. So this is how in professional world, the projects are selected. So let's understand the project selection method itself. So basically, there are the two models. One is based on economic model and then another one is based on mathematics model. So economic model is basically based on the benefit measurement. You basically measure the benefits by choosing those projects. And how do you measure those benefits? Where the first tool is basically a cost benefit analysis. You find out what is your present value, what will be your net present value, and then you will find out what is your internal rate of return and payback period. So basically, you look at all those parameters to decide which project you're going to choose in terms of economic model or economic impact. Also, there are the math models, which is basically based on your constraint optimization. So what is the based on the previous history or the previous data of the projects, these models decide to find out what will be the best suitable projects for the companies right and this with could math this mathematical model could be linear non-linear dynamic integer multi-objective algorithm this is all going to based on your type of historical data or performance of the company for the similar type of projects and based on that you know you can run the mathematics various math models and basically find out or prioritize the various project depending upon you know all those parameters and you can choose which project you can work with then in the business environment once the project is selected what happens after the project selection how actually the project management start operating in a business scenario and supporting the company's objective and i think that may be the question which might be boggling in your mind so the project launch is basically four step process right it basically as we learned in previous section then it's all start with ideas right so step one is basically you find out some idea some business case some business need where you evaluate whether the idea is aligned with company need visions or goal which basically give you some list of some ideas which you can start working on or produce some benefits maybe four or five ideas you are having at this stage this is basically called ideation or identifying the idea which can bring profit or gain to the company and that's what all your step one is. Then you move to the step two. So once you identify those idea, you find out what exactly the feasibility of those idea. Those ideas may result into some projects. Maybe after five ideas, you come up with only two feasible idea which can result into project. So when I say feasible idea means it's confirmed that if company do these projects, they are going to get some benefit in monetary benefit or some other benefit depending upon company business and objective. So once you clarify or once you clear the number of projects which you want to take on, you move to the next step that is called project selection. So here you may be, you know, uh, decide uh, depending upon the various feedback from the various stakeholders, you decide to work on only one project. And this is what all project selection is about step three. You don't work on all projects which you identified in the feasibility stage. You choose the project which is more beneficial to you and that you do in step three, which is basically called your project selection. So once you select that project, this basically means you have the project which you want to work on. And let's say at this stage out of two, you selected on one project. 
and this one project is basically moved to the step four that is launch of the project so what do you mean by launch of the project so let's say your final project is selected this basically means you develop a project charter which will basically authorize you as a project manager to start working on the project and execute it so this is how it works so it's a four step process start with your ideation then goes to the feasibility step then goes to the project selection and once project is selected it simply goes to the project launch and project launch means project charter so once you have the project charter you can say that you are you have launched the project so what is project charter how to define a project charter so let's understand you know those, those those things so project charter basically it's authorize a project or a project phase right a project charter can be developed for a whole project or it can be also developed as a phase wise so it's a basically authorization to launch a project as we learned in the previous section then this document initial requirement need and expectation of stakeholders so what it does it basically lists out all the requirement your initial requirement not maybe detailed requirement but high level requirement what are the needs and expectation of the stakeholders which basically influence the overall project so if we talk in terms of process so this is basically your input so let's say if you want to develop a project charter what will be the inputs which is required for you second thing is that this is a tools right once you get the input or let's say some information you need to utilize some project management tools to develop the document and the document is basically what a outcome and outcome is basically called project charter so idea is that how do you develop the project charter so the first thing what input is required so we've took the input you need the statement of work you need the business case you need the agreements maybe between client and company on some contractor then you need the, all those enterprise environmental factor which can impact those projects then also you need the organization process asset basically each organization has their own way to manage the project to oversee the projects and this is what it means by the organization process asset and while doing those projects you need to make sure you align with projects so these are the input which is required to develop the project charter once you get this input you utilize the tools the tool is that to develop project charter you to take the expert judgment maybe you will form a team of expert and you will discuss with them identify what will be the best what will be good for the company based on utilizing these tools and technique you will basically develop that project charter document right so when I say the expert judgment, expert judgment is nothing but you simply receive input from the subject matter experts who has deep knowledge about those particular type of projects or particular area or you can also utilize a facilitation technique which is solving the problem or having some conflict resolution or brainstorming with the team or with the, some expertise right so utilizing these tools and technique having this input you basically arrive at the project charter so this is what your i will say the outcome and this is how you develop the project charter so the next important thing is to understand why it is critical to develop project charter right so first thing it's a formal document which basically state the project exists and provides a project manager a written authority to begin the work right because remember every project utilize some resource and when you talk about the resource which basically means it will cost to the company and before spending any cost any kind of financial expenditure you need to validate it and make sure it is coming through a proper authorization and the project charter is basically that authorization document which is required by any project managers project charter is your authorization document or a ticket to start the project right also it's provide a common understanding of the goals objectives and resource requirement among the all the stakeholders so it's basically cl clearly state what is your top management expectation so that your project team and the execution team right they all are aligned with these objectives and they know what they are required to do once they know what is 
actually required or desired from the project. Then this project charter should always include some of the important thing like it's an overview, outline of in scope, then the approximate schedule which is as per the stakeholder expectation, what are the budget estimate, not the detailed one but the preliminary estimate, what are the anticipated risk and key stakeholders. So these are the minimum thing which should be required in a project charter. So if you see if this is nothing but a kind of format where you need to have these at least these are the minimum things which you need to have it. It's an overview, outline of the scope, then you have to expect schedule, budget estimate, anticipated risk and key stakeholders. So these are the minimum thing which you should be uh, having or you should be make, uh, make sure those informations are available in any project charter to make it effective and useful for the project. So by now you must have identif identified or you must have realized that company selects multiple projects through the number of list of the projects and remember each projects may require different approach. So multiple methodology to execute the project. Also it's possible that you can utilize various methodology to the same project or you can do the several projects to the similar methodology, right? And remember one thing, the incorrect approach lead to the project failure. As we learned in previous slide, it's very important to identify the right project as well as the right methodology to execute those projects. So key definitions, well, the first one is your project charter. So as you know, project charter is a formal sort of document that states the project exists and provides project manager a written authority to begin the work and that is basically a formal definition of your project charter. Then the benefit measurement method, well, these are based on measuring the benefit in taking the project and comparing the result against the project or a strategy benchmark, right? Then the functional organization, we have learned this in previous section where the employee has a clear manager or superior staff where the functions are responsible for their own projects. Let's say the IT function is responsible for all the IT projects, manufacturing function will be responsible for manufacturing projects and so on. So here the functions have the full authority. Project selection, we have learned this a process of evaluating and choosing the projects which is both aligned with organization objective and maximize performance, let's say cost, time, schedule and all those things, right? Then the life cycle cost. So life cycle cost is nothing but it's a development cost, plus maintenance cost and support cost. We will discuss this in detail when we go into the cost management section. But life cycle is basically considering all the cost element from the start or let's say the start of the project to the finish of the project. So when I say the finish of the project, not just you know handling the product, but util utilization of product and then the providing the service and maintenance and then finally phasing out of the project. In fact, that cost also includes in the life cycle cost. So once we know what is project, what is project management, how professionally we manage the project and how we select the project, right? So once you have selected the project, now the very next obvious question is how do we manage projects? So once you have selected the project, now the very next question comes to how do you manage the projects? How actually projects are managed in a business environment? How do you manage it, right? So starting with the project management, let's understand how the projects are actually managed. What are the things which is required to manage a project in a professional way? So let's start with a small project. So let's say you have a mini project. You have to provide a hundred computer uh, to EBC company. So what happens that you are a project manager of your company, right? And your company, your company has signed a contract with ABC company to provide what? To provide 100 computers, right? This you need to provide to the ABC company and you are the project manager, you are doing that project. So 
in that case, let's say, you know, the total value of the project is around $1 million, right? And you have to complete the project within this given cost. So as a project manager, what are the things you will be doing just, you know, by thinking the scope of work? So let's say if you have to provide a project, what are the things as a project manager you should be doing? So some of the things which may come in your mind is first you need to find the scopes, right? what exactly you have to do so it's just only providing the 100 computer or also you need to provide some software or also install those software or you have to just simply you know provide the hardware and no need to worry about the software thing so you need to clarify all those scope of work so basically you need to clarify all the activities which you will be doing to meet this objective of providing 100 computers to the abc company then you need to also know at what time period you will be providing those computers to the company right maybe the abc company has asked you to provide uh, these computer uh, maybe in one month time period or maybe they have asked you to provide 10 10 computers over the 10 month period of time so those timeline has to be identified by you as a project manager to know what exactly the timeline it is then of course the project budget right so suppose if the project budget is 1 million you may be wondering whether that 1 million is sufficient to do this scope of work or you can do that work even in less budget what will be the profit all those things has to be identified in terms of you know the budget requirement then of course when you fix with scope cost and time then you need to find you know what are the available resources are there and how you can utilize them then you have to come up with a project plan may not be the detailed one may not be the very big and uh, you know a lengthy document but at least you have to have some sort of project plan which can basically tells you what will be the various plans activities scopes and you know uh, various objective which you will be achieving through the various milestones or various timeline those things has to be defined in a project plan and then once you come up with a project plan the point is that then you will simply delegate those tasks to the resources so that they start working on those resources uh, on those activities and then the next thing that's also you need to document everything because this project is over some you know duration over a timeline so it has some start it has some finish your project activity will be starting let's say from these days then there's a possibility that some of the activities are delayed some of the activities are already finished in advance so you need to document everything you need to record all those events so that you come to know which activity is completed which is finished which is pending all those things has to be done and that can be done only if you document them very well then of course once you document it you need to monitor it basically you compare it with your previous plan or initial plan and see if all those activities are aligned or uh, on time with respect to your previous plan then communicate with the team right you need to also communicate this progress with the top management or with your team members and so on so there are so many other things which could be done in a project right so just a small project and you can see there are so many things you as a project manager should be doing that so that you can complete this project successfully so when i say successfully means on time right within budget and of course you need to provide the 100 computers so this is basically nothing but your scope so on time within budget and complete scope right so by seeing this example you can imagine right this so uh, these are the activities which is required to complete this project so if you closely look or try to categorize the activity which we have discussed in a previous section so you can categorize all those activity basically in 10 groups so when i say you can categorize all those activity in terms of scope in terms of time in terms of cost in terms of quality then in terms of resources stakeholders then procurement and then the risk and communication 
So as a project manager, you need to basically look all those 10 areas and integrate all those activity, right? This is what you need to do as a project manager. So as a project manager, your job is to basically integrate this scope, time, cost, quality, resource, stakeholder, procurement, scope, and communication to achieve your project goal right this is what in crux if i talk what project manager should be doing so if you look the project management is all about basically managing the 10 knowledge areas right that is basically your integration management scope management time management quality management resource management and then it's a communication management risk procurement stakeholders and cost so as a project manager you need to basically integrate all those knowledge area and make sure all the activities are aligned to reach the project goal that is what as a project manager you're supposed to do so whenever you are managing those 10 knowledge areas right those 10 knowledge there is always coincide with the project management process group so when you are managing your scope, time, cost, quality, you need to utilize this PM process group to complete all those work related to particular areas successfully. So when I say the project management process group, it is nothing but those five groups which we have already learned in previous section. In brief, we can go into detail later, uh, but this is mainly is initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control, and then closing. Now, knowledge area takes up during any one of this process group, right? So we have, let's say, these 10 uh, knowledge areas, right? And all those 10 knowledge areas, you will be basically interacting with this process group. So initiation, planning, execution, monitoring, and then control. So and then of course you know the uh, monitoring control and then this is closer so during this management of each knowledge area you need to basically take help of all these pm processes to resolve your issues this is what you do while you know managing each area so we will be you know knowing, uh, discussing this in detail later on but this is how it works in terms of professional project management right so knowledge areas are basically your core technical area and project management processes groups are basically your management tools which you utilize to this knowledge area to complete the work so if you basically define the project management process group and how it works so you can say you know it start with initiation then you have to do the planning execution and then monitoring and control and closer so what happens any of the knowledge area when you start managing you need to initiate that right we will detail get, get into the detail of the initiation but basically for management of any knowledge area you have to initiate you have to start and then you have to do the planning right and once you plan it you need to move into the executing right and while doing all those processes initiation planning execution you need to continuously do the monitoring and control so remember monitoring and control is a kind of continuous process which parallelly start with your initiation and completes with your closer right so you start with initiation finish with closer between that you continuously do the monitoring and control of your planning process and execution so what's the initiation process well, it basically determines the project objective, then step of the project charter, it's identify all the stakeholders in detail, it's assign the project manager, and also some places it's known as concept process, right? It will depend upon industry to industry. Many of the places you will find concept process, maybe you can call it initiation process, but the idea is that you will be doing all those activity. And remember, you know, at this stage, project may be approved and terminated. Maybe at the initiation stage, you have find out in detail analysis that project is not visible. You will be simply terminated. 
right and then the initiation is kind of authorization to continue the ongoing project or to move to the next PM process group. So after initiation, once initiation is complete, you can go to the planning, you can go to the execution, you can go to the monitoring, uh, monitoring control parallelly, and then close it. So once you successfully completed the initiation, this will give you a license to move to the next step. The next step is your planning, right? So most of the time you will be spending at this process step. So this is basically formulating the project goal basically telling what are the things you require to do, how you will be doing that and when you have to do it. So basically team creates a management plan for each knowledge area. Remember we have 10 knowledge area and for each knowledge area team decide how you will be basically managing those knowledge areas. So and this overall combined plan is called you know all those 10 areas management plan is nothing but is result in a form of overall project management plan the execution well in execution most of the budget all your costs will be spent in execution phase remember you have to do the procurement you have to bring in the various labors various people deploy all kind of services and those all resources required money right and that's why most of the budget will be spent in this phase also the work plan whatever you have the plans this will be executed then they will be implemented approved changes there is a possibility that when even a project is started after that there is some new changes come from the client from the internal stakeholders all those changes has to be applied before you know you finish the project so this all approved changes has to be applied during this execution phase also there could be repairing of defects from preventive or corrective action you need to take in terms of provide the services or the complete the scope of work team building all those activities will be done in execution then the next step is monitoring control so basically when when you start your project starting from your initiation right when you initiate the project you need to regularly measure and control the project performance against your baseline right that's recommend the changes any defect repair preventive correct action which is required when you find out when you monitor or control those things also you need to continuously verify the scope of the project also see the contracts whether we are aligned with the contract which we have signed with the company and then overall you need to monitor the project scope so this is what is done in the monitor and control so then comes your closer right so goal is formally ended when project activities are completed and you all the project objectives are met that is basically means the closure of the project which involves the contract closures like you need to complete all the project records are having documents closure document lessons all those things has to be completed in a closure phase then of course there will be audit if you are in any organization audit is very common once the project is completed all the payments are audited whether in all the financial settlements are done all those things has to be completed in your closure and finally you conduct a survey with all the stakeholder get the sign off from the project and of course you basically document all the lesson learned so that you can better improve or provide the better efficiency in a next project management cycle so if you see that basically project management is all about managing these five project management process group right and then this is a 10 knowledge area so there's 10 knowledge area and five pertinent process group and you need to basically utilize this project management process group and the knowledge area to manage your work so if you see for scope management you to do you have to do initiation you will be needing to do planning you need to do monitoring control you need to do the execution and then final closure similarly you need to do this these Work management process tool or utilize this work management processes for scope management, time management, quality management, and then resources, uh, communication, risk, procurement, stakeholder integration. So all those 10 area need to be worked upon by utilizing this project management process group. So this process group is basically what your management tool, right? This is what it's called the management tool or I call it this is a soft skill right this is 
soft skill which I was referring earlier and these are your core technical skill right these are your core technical skills so product management is nothing you know I mentioned in very beginning of this course that product management is nothing but art and science right art plus science of getting things done right this is what I mentioned briefly about project management so now you understood why I'm saying that art and science art because you need to manage utilize your soft skill to manage various technical skills like scope management project man, uh, time management cost management and then science because then these are the technical skills they are the defined process they are defined knowledge or you can utilize to do these works very efficiently and when you combine these two these art right plus science you basically utilize it to do your job any kind of job or anything which is need to be done you complete those activity and that's become your project management okay so the another concept of project management is basically project life cycle phase project management process and this knowledge area how the, all those four things are combined together right so in the previous section we have learned that we utilize this project management process group right these are the processes groups and these are the knowledge area these are the 10 knowledge area five project management process group and these all processes these let's say that this whole project management thing has to be performed at every phases remember this is your project let's say this is the start of the project and this is the finish of the project right this is your timeline so here you are starting this is your starting point this is your finishing point now during the from start to finish you will be having several phases let's say this is phase one or this is phase two phase three like this you have let's say your project is divided into five phases now at each and every phase you need to do this project management thing right this project management whole process of getting things done at every phase and then once your phase is complete you will check your each deliverable checklist whether those deliverables or the objectives are met once those are met then you will move to the next phase again you will utilize these processes and then complete your work and then again do the checklist and then like that you will move from one phase to another phase so this is how your project phases project management processes and the knowledge areas are together combined and this whole process right moving from one phase to another phase is called project life cycle so this is your total project life cycle right so this is what your life cycle is so life cycle is combined of phases and then phases is basically combined of your project management and knowledge area so project is basically a journey into unknown future right where you have a blueprint plan in your hand but you don't know what is going to happen so it's required resources there will demand of resources which are scarce and many times these are expensive also the nature of resources will depend upon your type of projects not every project requires same kind of resources you need to plan identify and then organize those resources so that they can do their job and complete and reach the project objective so based on this you know the type of uh, product or type of site or project methodology all projects can be categorized right so these are the three important criteria for any project management industry to categorize their projects one is the product or the final outcome which defines what kind of project someone is taking on or depending upon the site site means where the project activity is going on at what site or what kind of site it is that will also define the type of the projects 
also what kind of methodology we use remember there are several project management methodology we will be going into detail learning those concepts but for the timing just remember there are certain project management methodology which you apply to different projects so these are the three main criteria because remember every industry has different kind of projects and you cannot categorize all projects into the same categories and those will be varying depending upon various parameter and those parameters in fact those are the there, there are other parameters but these are the major parameters for defining the categories of the project that is product site and methodology so project based on product type right so these are like administrative projects civil construction projects software development project design engineering project system installation project, equipment procurement projects, event organization projects, maintenance projects, product development research projects. So these are the projects which basically depend upon the product or the final outcome of the projects, right? Final outcome. So this will basically you know depend upon what kind of product or what kind of outcome we are providing to the projects and these are basically categorized into these categories right next one is based on the type of the sites so type of the sites basically you can categorize into two category one is a greenfield projects another one is a brownfield projects so when you say greenfield greenfield is basically the used to define a new projects right so this basically lacks constraint impose of or any prior work or at the site so development is completed on vacant site let's say common example could be new power plant airport or new school building so let's say you have a vacant place right there is no nothing no infrastructure is available already and you need to basically let's say build a new school building right new school building this is basically called your greenfield right now what is the brownfield brownfield project let's say you have the vacant uh, area right well not vacant area but let's say you have the already a power plant which is operating in up to this area so here you have a power plant which is already you know uh, producing some power and basically transmitting it to household now the government wants that utilize these these areas these vacant area to extend the uh, the facility or the output or the megawatt output for the power plant so they need to put some new buildings new infrastructure here now these kind of projects are basically called brownfield projects right so you understand right earlier there was a vacant space vacant site there is no existing infrastructure and you completely develop it from the scratch whereas here you already have some building old building existing structure and you need to extend it this facility so this is a what major difference between brownfield and greenfield so brownfield basically refer to the expansion or revamping of the existing facility it carries a constraint remember there is already building existing and so it's basically provides a constraint or becomes a constraint while any activity is going on in these areas remember you know this has to be done safely by taking consideration of all the facts and all the constraint which could be imposed due to these already operating buildings so many times what happens the brownfield is supposed to be contaminated or you know depending upon let's say there was a power plant or let's say there's a nuclear power plant and that has to be extended the facility of section it means if you have to do any extension on existing new nuclear power plant your existing site is kind of contaminated right so this is what the difference between brownfield and grand greenfield project so the next methodology is basically uh, you know next the project can be defined based on the methodology or the framework remember there are certain methodology and framework which you can apply to different kind of projects to get the job done so when a methodology is basically a system of practices and techniques or procedure or rules which project man may utilize to do the job done right so basically their projects it provides some kind of guidance to the project manager to our kind of rule book which helps the project manager to complete the task or define you know what are the steps they should be taking 
to complete certain type of project. So this basically aims the project manager to provide a guidance throughout the projects and step taken to complete the task. So complete the task or get the job done, right? This is what it does and how it does, it provides a rule book. Right, it provides a rule book to the project manager to get the job done. So, what are the kind of methodologies? Well, there are several methodologies. Some of them are waterfall methodology, critical chain path method, critical project method, then agile project management method, agile uh, Kanban methodology, Scrum methodology, lean project management, prints to methodology. So, these are the methodology which are suitable to certain type of projects like you know the waterfall methodology is very much uh, famous in epc industry uh, then agile project is famous in software industry right kanban is for manufacturing scrum is uh, again for it projects then for lean is again for manufacturing projects and then for prince 2 is famous on civil and, uh, and construction projects so there are certain uh, uh, specific type of projects which is suitable to certain methodology we will be not going into much detail on those methodology uh, but we can discuss those in later uh, in different course but for the time being you can understand on brief that project can be categorized based on methodology or framework and those methodologies are suitable to certain specific type of projects. So what's the benefit of project management methodology where we have already discussed that but basically it's provide a clear roadmap. So let's say you are going to a trip and if you don't have any roadmap then probably you know you will be having a lot of difficulty to reaching your destination. So it's list all the steps required to deliver a project successfully. It provides a defined governance structure and process guidelines, test activity, processes, deliverables, all those things for the standard or let's say the standard activity, you can say, right, standard activities for certain type of project. So this provides a certain uh, standard activity for certain type of projects which basically helps the project manager to do the, uh, their project management activity. Also, these are well detailed, rigid and repeatable approach to other project management process. So basically what happens, these are well defined, detailed and there is a repeatable process. So it's a repeatable approach. It means that you can continuously apply these same standards or same methodology or let's say the same rule book to different projects and improve your efficiency over the period of time performing same kind of projects. So that's how it helps to improve the efficiency of project management. Remember in previous slide I have mentioned the project management framework also. So there's a subtle difference between project management and project methodology. So I will be not going into much detail we can discuss this later but basically project management framework what happens that it's provide you the structure and direction right it's give you basically define some boundaries so that is basically called your framework right whereas methodology is basically tells you the everything bits and part of you know the whole process so let's say point a to b it will tell you you have to go this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. Whereas framework will tell you you have to go from A to B under this area, right? You cannot go here, 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 here. You have to just be in this area and the project management methodology will specifically tell you you have to go from point A to B. So this is what uh, you know, in short, a difference between project management framework and methodology. We can go into late in detail later, but we, for the timing, this is, I think, sufficient in terms of understanding the concept. So it's neither too detailed nor too rigid, right? It's a flexible to adapt the evolving condition depending upon the condition. Remember, a project is basically activity which is scheduled from A to B or point A to B right start and finish over a long duration so there are several other external factors coming here here which can you know impact the project activity impact the project progress in so many ways so that's why you can depending upon the project condition or environment framework helps to adopt or be flexible so that you can achieve the project you are depending upon 
what is your goal if you compare between the framework and methodology so framework is basically an overview of how guidelines can be implemented whereas methodologies are some rigid rules and practices which will apply to the project for completion it's offer a space for creative adaptation there is no fixed boundaries or there is no fixed limitations it provides some space around under which you can you know apply various methodologies and your creative thinking to do the work whereas this is pretty much fixed and prescriptive and you need to just simply follow those steps that is basically a methodology these are the preferred by expert remember expert uh, can utilize a framework to and and utilize their experience and then accordingly you can do the work efficiently whereas if you are a beginner project manager then you will be more focused on applying the methodology so that you follow some step by step guide right step by step guide and do the work so this is most preferable by the beginners this is basically suitable for the experts make it hard and develop the implementation process matrix so for the complex process or the projects when the pro project start from start and then moves toward the end or the finish things become complex very soon and that's why it then becomes also hard to manage those things whereas if you follow for in as per the methodology if you follow the performance guideline predefined in granular detail this will be much easier for the beginner to implement and get the job done right this also the framework leaves room and other practices and tools so basically frameworks allow you to utilize not only one methodology but several methodology you can utilize so in a single framework right so it's a single framework you can apply several methodology you can supply m1 m2 m2 several methodology to do the job done if you are expert you can take tools and techniques and steps and process from various different methodology and club it together to do the project remember then you have to be expert on that but as a beginner you cannot combine so for the methodology part that's why you cannot combine those practices and tools together that's what the methodology says that methodology is not about combining it's about simply following some checklist or the step and process which is already predefined so example could be a pmi uh, pmbok it's a kind of framework which doesn't define you this fixed structure right it's allow you to utilize several tools methods and techniques to complete the job Whereas Prince 2 is very much a structured methodology which basically most suitable for the construction projects or big software projects uh, to do the job done. So, word of, so the word of caution, right? Methodology and framework are two different things. For practical application, there is no general agreement between methodology and framework. So for example, most experts would consider metal, agile methodology of a framework despite the fact that its name is methodology so again you know there's no very fixed rule also defining the methodology as a framework so this is one of the good example right so when you call agile methodology so there's a name uh, you know the word methodology is already inbuilt in this one but actually it's a framework right so you need to be very cautious when utilizing these two terms and understand in context of the project so no matter how comprehensive your classification is it can be considered arbitrary or there is no fixed uh, you can say right or wrong when you're saying it's a framework or methodology so basically there's nothing black and white so at the end of the day what matters is that not whether the concept is a framework or methodology because project management is not about you you know uh, framework or methodology it's about getting the job done right whatever your project objective you need to achieve that project too and that's why it depending upon what are the specific projects and what is best suitable for the project you simply follow that so methodology and framework are useful only if the practical approach is taken right that is the key here to do any project you need to always consider practical right so always be practical and so i will say simply be practical right to solve any project problem you have to be always practical so always take a practical approach so that you can solve the project's problem also you cannot force 
you know all those methodology and framework and if it's not actually required so never ever force any methodology or framework on a project because if you try to put force or let's say you know forcefully apply some framework or methodology it will usually damage the projects in terms of progress it will basically put more constraint and probably you know uh, you will end up badly then uh, it makes the effort to understand the notions and methodology and framework and tailor it to fit this is also important right tailor it to fit basically means be practical right you need to consider the situations of the projects and depending upon that you need to do the tailoring of your tools method framework and meet the project objective which is basically a success of the project so if when i say the successful project it's nothing but you are meeting the objective of the project so as i mentioned earlier right we can find out several framework and methodology to apply on a project management process and here are some examples which are which can tell you you know which project management methodology framework is suitable for which kind of project so i was discussing this waterfall methodology earlier so these are mainly you know more famous for the epc projects construction industry sometimes it's used for manufacturing industry or the repetitive projects this is the good approach or good methodology right then the critical chain project management this is for traditional construction or the big it projects agile project management this is for software or it projects or sometimes for finance projects also this is used Kanban methodology used for the product development, small size projects, or the manufacturing projects. Scrum methodology again utilized for software projects and IT projects. Lean project management very much famous in manufacturing industry, and then the service industry also utilizes the lean project management methodology. Six Sigma again this is related to the operations related projects and projects targeted to improve the quality and efficiency. So wherever you have to improve your quality efficiency, any project related to that you should follow the Six Sigma methodology. Then the Prince2 methodology, again, it's related to software, so it's IT and software projects, as well as it's pretty much famous in civil construction projects. So project management iceberg, right? Have you heard about what's a project management iceberg? Or can you guess? Can you guess what it is, what I was talking about? Sorry. Uh, D U E S S. Any guess what is project management iceberg? Well, I think we have already discussed, right? So there would be some certain elements which is actually beneath the water, and by from the top you can see a uh, project management is just one field, right? It's just one field, and we call it project management, just managing project, simple, right? But when you look closely. When you look closely, this could be something else, right? So when I say that project management iceberg, and if you see beneath the water level, basically it is combination of various other factors: scope management, time management, cost management, quality, process two, stakeholder management, stuck uh, human resource management, communication, and they basically all those ten knowledge areas plus there are other tools and techniques right there are several other techniques processes which you need to utilize to do the project management and this is what I mean by the project management iceberg so project management is nothing what it sees from the top but it is basically a combination of various other things and that's why it's make the project management difficult. And also if the project is big and complex, then definitely it's become more difficult to manage a project successfully. So for our purpose, for the timing, project management is basically means you may manage a 10 knowledge area. So if you're able to successfully manage this 10 knowledge area, you are basically managing the project successfully right so the next question okay then how do we manage a knowledge area so we learned previously that 
First management is nothing but managing your 10 knowledge areas, right? Then the question is that how do we manage those knowledge areas? And that's what we are going to learn in next sections. So in previous section, we have learned basically project management is all about managing your knowledge area. So very first knowledge area is your scope, right? This is our first knowledge area. So now let's understand how we manage the scope of a project. So before going into the scope management, let's first understand what is scope right so what do you mean by scope what exactly you mean you mean by scope right i mean from the english point of view you may be knowing this word scope but what exactly does it mean when you are going to manage a project what exactly does it mean in terms of professional management, right? Or let's say the project management term. So that's what we are going to learn about it. So let's first understand what do you mean by scope. So let's first understand what is the scope, right? Now, in terms of the scope, there are three key terms. One is scope itself. Then another is what is the project scope? And then what is the scope creep? So we will be discussing all those three key terms while discussing about the scope. So coming to the first point, what exactly your scope is. Now, if you go by definition, so it's basically the extent of area or the subject matter that some things deals with, with or which is relevant to. Now here, the relevancy is a key point here, right? So let's say you have the project. So project could be, you know, any kind of, it could be civil structure or it could be, you know, the management project, IT project. So project is basically uh, a word, but you, when you further uh, categorize it or further drill down, this basically pinpoints to our, the key or the specific related objectives which you need to uh, perform or you need to, you know, basically work on. So. Scope is kind of, you can say the boundary or the general terms. But when we move to the specific word project scope, so this basically tells you what is the scope of the project, right? I mean, up to what extent you need to work on. So let's say you have a project called school building, right? So let's say you have a project named school building. Okay, so now when you say you have the project of school building, now school building's extent scope could be different. So when I say the project of school building as a contractor, I would like to know what is my scope. Do I need to just provide a building? Remember, a building is just a civil infrastructure, or I need to provide all the accessories, right? Accessories means I need to provide the benches, I need to provide the, all the projectors in the classroom, all the facilities. Do I need to provide also all those things in the school building or just I need to or do I need to just provide the structure? So this is what exactly it's mean by scope. Project scope is basically tells you what exactly the extent of the scope because school building consists of so many other things. It's consists of building. Plus, it consists, you know, all the accessories, benchmark, then it could be offices for the teachers, principals, all those things, and then the uh, accessories, and all kind of, you know, the related stuff can be included. But when I say the project scope, it could be different, right? Because if, let's say, some government wants to, you know, uh, develop a school, now, there could be several parts for that. Maybe one contractor is just working on civil part. Another contractor will come and do the, all the outfitting and benches and classroom fittings. And another contractor will come and do the training for the teachers, how to utilize those equipments, you know, those kind of things. So that's what exactly it's mean by the project scope. The project scope basically tells you out of that bigger scope or bigger framework, what exactly you are supposed to do in terms of project, right? So if you go by definition, 
So project scope refers to basically the combined objective and requirement needed to complete a project, right? So it basically outlines the time, cost, and business of, of a business project. So when you see the project scope, right? So project scope basically gives you the three element. One is your time, right? One is it will tell you what will be the cost. And then of course, you need what will be your scope for this scope means basically up to what extent or to what area you need to cover while working on the project. So this is what exactly it's mean by project scope, right? Even though you say your project is school building, it doesn't define exactly what is the scope on that school building because a school building is a vast area, right? It's, it's a big building, it consists of various element and you need to pin down with respect to your project, what exactly you need to work when you're saying, you know, school building project. Then coming to the another critical element, there is scope script very common in any projects what happens you know the project is basically work on a timeline so let's say this is your a point which is basically your start point right and let's say this is your finish point so when you start your project you have your scope defined right at this point of time you know what is your scope you have fixed scope line you know fixed budget right and you know fixed timeline and you know what exactly you're supposed to do but as soon as you move forward as time passes you do some activity you realize some of the scope which you are doing which may not be required to do as per the contract remember you sign a contract here you sign a contract at the start of the project and this basically defines what is the scope fixed scope which is your initial scope or we call it scope baseline but you then move on from start point to the finish point or the finish timeline during this period there are several changes happens by mistake or you added some activity by mistake or you miss some activity during the mistake and then you say there's something you can do additional you know all those things so basically what happened this lead to change in the initial baseline right any addition or any change or is something which is not required you added or you thought that you will make the client happy so you added it and you didn't consider other things so those are the things basically known as scope creep right and this is one of the major reason for you know the project failure in terms of scope so if you go by definition scope creep is basically uncontrollable changes extend the project deadlines and require the effective project management so what happens when you add some additional activity as a scope script it will basically impact your expected timeline because what happens you added new activity this means it's require more resources right more resources more time more cost or more budget to complete those additional activity okay and this will basically push your deadline dates require more cost and that's what you know we don't want in any project so that's what exactly scope script means and in short you should always try to minimize the scope script right you should not allow any scope script while managing any project so let's understand other elements of the scope right so we are still discussing the scope part but there are some other factors in terms of you know terminology which you will be uh, reading throughout the project management literature so when you see the scope there are other four elements for a scope right in terms of project management so one is your product scope product scope is basically it's exactly defined the functions and features uh, or, or of the product or services or result so let's say in previous example we were discussing the building now in the building it will define exactly what do you mean by building does it building means only the columns and beams or does it require all kind of you know uh, the fittings and everything plus then there's accessories is also included in this building or plus there is a training or ser other services is also included in bu building so those things is basically you know all those will be defined in your product scope then the next thing is your acceptable deliverable so remember all projects are bound by some sort of contract right so contract between let's say a and b so a, a is basically nothing 
client we call it client and b could be like your company or another contractor and they basically come together and sign a contract now in this contract it is clearly defined what is acceptable deliverable so let's say we have taken the example of school building now in this product scope it will tell you what is actually mean by the product or what is mean by the school building right now when any contractor will do the work there will be certain guidelines or certain condition in which the con uh, client will accept the product or accept the let's say the school building so it has to be good quality it has to be best standard there has to be some standard applies by the local government or the overall management so those thing has to be mentioned in your acceptable deliverable section so this is what basically tells that if you provide me the school building under this condition then only i will accept this is what the client says and this is what it's meaning of the acceptable deliverable so if we go by formal basically what happens is that it's a formal documentation all right this is received from the customer which is basically nothing but mentioning the contract uh, to acknowledge the formal stakeholder acceptance of the project deliverables so this basically tells you all the stakeholders now stakeholders could be many you know other so either client or maybe the contractor or the project team what they say that what they mean by the acceptable deliverables so all those accept deliverable stakeholders has to be come uh, come together and basically find out what are those acceptable conditions and accordingly all the work has to be done as per the acceptable deliverable list and this is what exactly the meaning of acceptable deliverable which is basically tied to the contract now the another thing is that project objective well i think this is already we have discussed in detail it is uh, basically the detailed description or the expected desired outcome of the project so whatever is overall expected from the project this is basically called your objective so it can be one or it can be many objectives in a single project right so this will be listed by the pro uh, in the contract by the uh, client or you need to go and ask that uh, client that in case if it is not available but that won't be the case in practical uh, situation then coming to the another element this is your scope baseline now what happens when you sign a contract right that's the let's say initial uh, phase you sign a contract and this is a start so here you will go through the contract and find out all the list of scopes what are you supposed to do right this is your basically scope at the time of the start of the project now this is what is called your scope baseline right remember we discussed previously uh, uh, the scope creep so this is what related to that so when the your first uh, scope definition which is agreed by the client is your call baseline and then as you move towards the con completion of the project right so at the completion or let's say the finish of the project this scope may change increase decrease depending upon the type of situation so your first sign contract definition of scope is basically your scope baseline so which includes all the approved project scope statement wbs and wbs directory we will be you know uh, discussing what exactly wbs and wbs at later uh, section but this is what it's mean by the scope and this these are the four key element of your scope part so visualizing a project scope is very important while you are defining your project scope right so project managers has variety of tools and processes we will be discussing those tools and process to do the project scope management right i mean every project will have different scope as it will have the unique you know unique scope now how to do how to manage those scope how to break up those scope those things we will be learning in next sections right so some of the key factor related to you know the scope so if you see the 12% of all the resources were wasted due to the bad project management so if you are not doing efficient project management so 12% of resource it may be in terms of cost in maybe in terms of let's say man hours 
is basically wasted on an average due to the bad project management practices. Another key example, 25% of organization only use a software for scope management. So remember, there are several tools and processes. Now to do them effectively, there are several softwares and tools or let's say you know the computer softwares are available in the market to do this efficiently but the matter of fact that we see only 25 percent of organization use a professional or standard scope management software and of course i'm not saying that you know software is always helpful but they do improve the efficiency of the project management in many of the cases right so you should whenever you're looking for the efficient scope management you can always look into you know what is a suitable scope management software so the key question how do we manage the scope what is your scope management process so remember scope management process is one of the first key process because scope is first key knowledge area of our 10 knowledge area right which we have discussed previously so how do we manage this scope man uh, process basically this process is divided into further sub process and these are the, those five sub processes right this is divided into five sub processes right sub processes and so these are what process, sub process number one which is your plan scope management so process two is your collect requirement, define scope, create WBS, validate and control. So remember, these process sub process has to be done in same sequence, right? You cannot skip them or you cannot, you know, do the randomly do do this and maybe do this first and then like this. What will happen? This will basically impact the efficiency, right? So that's why it is defined in a particular set so that you do this overall project management overall scope management process efficiently and that's right efficiently and this has to be done only when you do these sub process in particular sequence right so let's understand these each sub process in detail so sub process number one that is plan scope management so what is this, this process is all about this process is basically creating a scope management plan that documents that how the project scope will be defined validated and controlled so basically remember we had the several other four sub process for overall scope management plan now how you will be doing that where you will be looking which information where you will be looking for you know the support from which team what kind of document you will be referring all those things has to be planned before you even start doing those activity and this is what it's mean by plan scope management right this is what is mean by plan scope management so before even going into you know those sub processes right we have those sub processes so you need to plan at this step that how you will be overall doing this scope management process before doing all those activity right we have several activities here each sub process how you will be doing those activity where you will be looking for which information those thing has to be planned at this step and this is what is all about plan scope management so in terms of process how does it look like i mean what kind of information you will require how what the tools you will require and what will be the output so every processes every sub process we will be basically looking in terms of input and output system so let's say for plan scope management this is your input section input section means what is actually information is required you will need some sort of information so that you can work on so this is what is mean by the input and then this is your output section so basically what will be the output uh, you will get once you do this sub process right and then this section is about tools and techniques right so what kind of techniques and tools you will be utilizing 
to utilize this input and come at or arrive at this output so for the plan scope management you have several inputs required so one is your you will need the statement of work for the project you will need the business case you will need the various agreements and contract document and then you will also need the various enterprise environmental factor then organization process asset right so these are the things as an input you will be required so that you can make project charter remember this is your output objective is and how you will be doing that so you will be basically utilizing the expert judgment and facilitation techniques so expert judgment is basically refers to the input received from the knowledge or the experienced party or let's say the subject matter experts you take the uh, opinion from those people and understand what is uh, the issue or what are the things you need to be considering while planning your scope management and then another one is facilitation technique this is such as a problem solving conflict resolution brainstorming this these are the things which you will be utilizing to understand these input to analyze this input and then based on those analysis understanding you will develop a project charter so this is what the plan scope management process is remember so for overall scope management we have these five sub process and very first step this is your first step and first step is what about plan scope management and the plan scope management require this input this input consists of project statement business case enterprise environmental organization uh, environmental factors organization process asset and once you take this input you will utilize these tools and techniques and then you will arrive at project charter this is your output objective or let's say the outcome of this whole process so let's understand what is project charter many times you have heard this term but what exactly it is project charter in terms of project management term so project charter is basically you know provides you the purpose and objective of the projects in clear concise language right like we discussed earlier you know for the school building project it could be a vast definition of a project now project charter will tell you very clearly what exactly required in a very simple language right then it will give you the very high level requirement of the projects right it will not give you very detail in everything every aspect of the project but it will give you a overall high level requirement and that without going to much detail of the uh, projects then also it will give you a project description in a paragraph or a short paragraph maybe two or three uh, paragraph is sufficient to explain what project is and then this will basically give the idea to how to develop your project activity and plan right it is will also provide you the major category of the risk for the projects remember every project comes with some sort of risk and assumption and you need to know from very beginning of the project what are those risks and there could be additional risks, you know, which you can identify during the project uh, execution process itself. Then there are the key schedule of event, which project charter will be mentioning, let's say the start and end date. If there is certain milestone in between, let's say, you know, start and finish, there are certain milestone in between this M1, M2, M3, like this, there will be some milestone. So also, you know, project charter defines this, what are the key milestones? okay and of course it will give you the state start date and finish date requirement right and then also it will give you the budget or the summary what is your expected remember every project every project is bound by the triple constraint so one is your scope right one is your timeline and one is your cost cost is nothing but your budget right basically you will need money to do the work right this is required to do the any kind of work so it will give you the project charter will tell you what is your overall start and finish date right and then it will also give you the brief paragraph or project description what is required right and also it will give you the budget indications okay then also it will give you you know overall the process requirement so project uh, charter requirement from organization for you know approval so remember in any business environment whenever you're doing any project 
or in any company it's required some sort of approval because any project to perform any activity this require resources sorry okay these resources basically means it will cost some money to you okay so this is why in any business environment approvals required and how you will get the approval project charter is a document which is basically authorizing you or giving you the approval to go ahead with the project right this is a go ahead of the project then also the project charter will mention the key stakeholder decision makers or key players for any project remember for any project there are some key uh, stakeholders or decision maker which can influence the project which can certainly decide to shut down the project or which can give you the go ahead you need to identify those key stakeholders from the beginning very very important right this is very very important to identify those are the key stakeholders and make sure you are meeting the requirement of those key st stakeholders when you are managing the projects right so also the project charter is basically giving you the authority to you know go ahead so in a standard the standard format if you try to find what will be the standard format of a project charter what kind of things should be included at minimum in a project charter so basically these are the things you can look for in a project charter one is a project title maybe you know one line or two line um, maybe one line is sufficient uh, you know, and then the purpose maybe a couple of lines and justification then a high level description maybe one or two paragraph is sufficient which tells you the goals objective then the requirement and then the key stakeholders and there's roles what are the key stakeholders and their role that's important high risk levels again the risk levels could be related to constraint assumption market condition other things again you don't need to go into much detail but you need to understand or you will be getting this you know project charter then of course the summary of your budget right and the summary of the milestone schedule of course then you will need you know the approval requirement or the approval cycle who is approved that who is approval authority you need to need the name of the authority who is a sponsor and then in that project charter one thing project manager will be assigned right this will basically gives the authority to the particular project manager so authority is basically coming through this project charter because in project charter it is identified who will be the project manager and then roles and responsibility right so these are the minimum thing you should be looking in a project charter next important thing which i wanted to discuss that project scope statement right so why i'm discussing project scope statement because many time i found that people are confused between project charter on project statement right so these are not the two same thing right they are not the project statement is not equal to project charter keep this in mind right your projects project charter we have already discussed in the previous section now what exactly your project statement is so project statement is basically you know kind of the document which basically states the projects in a very brief and some of the key things that involves a project statement uh, you know or the document or let's say the project statement i will say the paragraph or the piece of paper so what it includes that it has basically eight section right even though it's eight but don't confuse that it's a very big document it's, it's a very short document and uh, which basically touch all those eight key areas and what are those one is your product scope definition it has to be brief which tells you basically what is your product or let's say the product scope definition then it will tell you what is your acceptance criteria under which condition what are the key parameter which clients will be looking after and which is must for accepting the criteria remember ulti unless your customer accept the criteria the project will not going to finish or otherwise there will be this dispute between the contractor and the client right then you have the project deliverable of course uh, you know there will be list of the deliverable which you need to provide in every project you make sure at every uh, you know the phase not only start from the finish but in between there are several phases and in each phases you need to check all those deliverables and meet those deliverables with the client right so this is very key important then 
the project exclusion also the project will tell you what is not included in the scope is also important right because scope is remember a statements right scopes is nothing but statement now statement is depending upon how someone interpret it right it will depend upon the interpretation of various parties so various party will interpret this uh, statements and there could be separate interpretation for same statement or same uh, you know the lines so it's very important to include what are this excluded and to tell the people what is excluded in this uh, you know particular project then you have the project constraint this is mentioned again you know uh, what are the project constraint which is you're supposed to be uh, working on like we mentioned earlier the scope time cost there could be other constraints in terms of you know government policy which can impact your project these are the basically need to be included in your project scope statement then the project assumptions there are certain assumptions which are made well you know working on a project you need to take care of those then milestones of course you need to check what are the milestones key milestone which you will be working on and then the agreement the agreement is basically some of the key agreement in terms of quality benefits cost risk those all has to be mentioned in your project scope statement so even though it looks very you know uh, big section when we call it you know the eighth section but basically in any project statement you need to provide these uh, these key elements so this is basically the product scope description project deliverables user acceptance criteria project boundaries assumptions and constraints so after you make a plan how you will plan your scope management then the very next step is collect requirement right so it is basically uh, you need to find out what are the requirements which is you need to be met or which has to be met when you complete the project so basically it's a process of defining documenting managing stakeholders needs remember you know need is a keyword here and the requirement to meet the project objective right so project objective is a final goal right final you can say milestone or end but to reach this end you need to do several things you need to meet the several requirements you need to provide maybe several services in terms of uh, face manner or in terms of you know, particular step by step so the finding out all those requirements all those elements which is required to be met by the stakeholders expectation is basically this is what step about is so this is what it's called actually the collect the requirement so collect the requirement from the stakeholders what is actually you are required to do to attain the objective so now having understood the definition of collect requirement now let's understand from the process point of view what are the inputs output and tools right so remember we have previously discussed for any process there has to be some input right and then there has to be some tools and techniques which you will be using to achieve this output right so this is a sub process of overall you know uh, scope management plan right remember uh, we discussed previously that these are the sub process of the scope management which is plan scope management we previously discussed now we are discussing collect requirement and then there are other sub process so in the, for the collect requirement this is the input this is the input information or the document which you will need uh, to arrive this output so what are those documents first thing is project charter then the scope management plan which you developed in the previous step then the requirement management plan basically you need to understand what are those requirements how you will be managing those stakeholder management plan stakeholder register so we will be discussing those uh, you know in detail later in a stakeholder management plan but these are the kind of input which you will be required or you will be needing it to arrive at this output and what are the output you are expecting that is requirement documentation requirement traceability metric these are the key document which you will be doing so requirement documentation basically you document all the requirement list on all the requirement and then how you will trace those requirement 
right at which stage at what what step of the project you will basically trace it and say when these requirements are met so to arrive from here to basically you know uh, complete this process you will need some kind of tools and techniques to do that right so this is basically there is key techniques or i can say the movement uh, the basis of identifying the requirement from the uh, various stakeholders so these are the tools and techniques which you will be using which is basically known as expert judgment and then facilitation techniques right so what are the things you will be doing when i say the tools what exactly it means so you will be taking interview you will be having focus group sessions you will be in facilitated workshop group activity technique group decision making techniques maybe you can utilize uh, the benefit of questionnaires or survey you can send to the stakeholder and get their feedback observation so you will be getting so many inputs right so you can go through this document analyze those document and observe what are the requirement which is mentioned by the various stakeholders also prototype you can so always see the historical products or historical projects from where you can get those requirement there are several industry benchmarks or there are several benchmarks said in fact said by the internal uh, process of the company's uh, management process so you can refer to those document then of course there are some diagram and documentation analysis which you can do and understand what exactly the requirement is so it's basically all about analyzing you know analyzing the requirement so you need to find the requirement requirement basically you need of the client right this is what you are looking for and once you get all point out or listed all those requirements those then this is basically will lead you to this output okay so this is all about the collect requirement sub process so after you collected the requirement now the next sub process is to define this scope so once you collect all the requirement you know what are the list of the requirement from the various stakeholders right once you get this definitely then based on this list you will decide what is actually the scope is what are the boundaries or what are the things which you are supposed to do based on this requirement so that you will meet the project objective right this is what you need to so you need to basically first list it down which you done in previous section then based on that you will define the full scope okay so to meet this requirement what are the things which you will be doing what is exactly scope which is covering so that once you complete this scope you will meet the project objective so which is basically you know meeting all the requirements plus deliverables right so if you go by definition it's basically process of developing a detailed description of the project and product remember right so you need to pro provide the full detailed description of the project so when i say project so any project is based on this timeline so let's say this is the start of the project and this is the finish of the project now during this finish you will need to do certain activity certain list of activity during this timeline so idea is that you identify all those activities plus what is will be the final outcome right so this is what you need to document everything and this is what is all about defining the scope okay so uh, if we try to define this sub process i mean we have already understood what exactly the concept behind the defining scope now in terms of process in terms of input and output what exactly your uh, situation would be so now we are at this define scope remember we started from this step right this was step number 1 then this is step number 2 or i could show it uh, sub process number 2 now we are at step number 3 right the step number 3 is define the scope and again it is requires certain inputs so these are the input for this step right this section is your input and then you will be utilizing some techniques these are the basically tools and techniques which you will be utilizing to arrive this output okay and output is basically this so in terms of input you will be needing project charter 
scope management plan, requirement documentation, organization process setup. This is very important. Remember, every company, right? Every company has it their own way of doing business. So it means that they have a own way of doing business is basically what it means that they have their own set processes, right? They have their own set processes, define some principles, some rules, which need to be followed to complete the project. Remember, you know, project is done by the company and company has to meet those project objective along with their processes, which is defined internally. Okay, and this is what exactly it's mean by organization process asset. So once you've got this input, right, then basically you will utilize certain tools and techniques. Those are nothing but expert judgment, product analysis, alternate regeneration, facilitation workflow. These kind of techniques you're going to use to arrive at output. And the output is basically your project scope statement. You will get a defined project scope statement, which is agreed, accepted by all these stakeholders, right? All these stakeholders means including your PM team, including your management, including clients. Everyone is aligned with this project scope statement. And then you need to update your document. So there are certain documents we have created earlier, your project charter, there's other document, requirement document, and so all those things need to be updated based on this you know analysis or this uh, input or you can say you and this you can found something which is new which is not updated you need to update those things so this is what the two uh, key output right those outputs are basically your statement okay and your project document update So once you develop your project statement, project scope statement, now the very next step is to basically create your WBS. So what do you mean by WBS? What does this WBS mean? Well, WBS means work breakdown structure, right? This is what it means. Uh, so let me write it down clearly for you guys. So this is work breakdown structure. Okay. So what do you mean work breakdown structure? Basically, it's nothing but in simple term, you are subdividing the deliverables and project work into smaller and more manageable components. So suppose you need to, you know, your project is basically a uh, um, construct a power plant, right? You need the construction of power plant, right? Now, power plant is a very big, uh, you know, uh, facility. So it is like billion dollar projects. Now, this $1 billion project, you cannot do everything at once. You need to break down these projects into several phases, right? You need to maybe do some engineering first, then you need to do some, well, you know, primary analysis, then engineering, then you need to do the design, then you will go for procurement, and then you will do construction, then after construction, you need to commission it, test it, and then finally you deliver it to the uh, client, right? You cannot simply jump from this step to this step directly without doing all those steps. So basically what you're doing, you are breaking this bigger project into smaller chunks, right? Now let's say uh, this engineering, let's say this first step is engineering phase. Now engineering has to further break down because engineering is, you know, there are so many systems. So you have to engineering do for buildings, you have to engineering do for mechanical, do, there's equipment, there's a compressor, there are uh, you know, many lot of technical components are in a power plant which need to be designed engineer now you cannot do engineering at once so if further you will break it down let's say your piping right then you will say mechanical then you will say electrical right then you will have a civil so like this you are breaking down 
your engineering work in several component right so this is what is mean by the wbs so you are what you are doing you are taking a bigger scope of work breaking it down into smaller chunks and then break down these chunks into smaller components so this is basically called your WBS. So you are basically creating this structure, right? So if we talk about the project, it has a project has several faces, right? Or let's say several components. Then these faces have further breakdown. The P1, this is P2 level, let's say P1 level, let's say P0 level. So this is basically your WBS package. You can further break down this WBS into work packages, right? We will discuss in detail. So from the concept point of view, from the concept point of view, WBS is basically subdividing the deliverables and project work and into the smaller and more manageable component. This is what it's mean by. And WBS means, as I mentioned earlier, it's nothing but your work breakdown. Right. So for the time being, just remember this, this work breakdown structure, it is nothing but simply division of your work into smaller component. And we will get into further detail what exactly WBS is, what the structure looks like and how it helps the project. So once you understand what is your scope statement, once you define your scope, right, then the very next step is your create WBS. Remember, we are still working on scope management right we have discussed already previously and then the scope management has this processes one is your plan scope management another is the collect requirement then the third step was define scope and then you have this create wbs which we are going to discuss right so create wbs by definition we have already discussed is basically uh, dividing the major scope or the bigger scope one single statement into the various smaller manageable scope and so that you can plan it efficiently or manage it efficiently now in terms of process right when we talk in terms of process for the create wbs so again as we discussed for the previous sub processes this process also includes some input and output so this is the word the input is for create wbs process this is your output for the create wbs process and if we talk in terms of so these are the input for the create wbs and this is your output for scope based uh, uh, create wbs this is the output and then you will be utilizing some tools right tools and techniques to complete this sub process now what are those tools and techniques these are the two tools which will be going to utilize one decomposition and then expert judgment so coming to the input part so in terms of input you will be basically required scope management plan project scope statement requirement document enterprise environment factor organization process asset so these are the document which will be required and most of the document we have already you know discussed in uh, the previous uh, steps so i'm not going to discuss in detail about these inputs but here yeah, to complete this process to complete this sub process you will need these inputs right now once you get the input you will need to apply some tools and techniques so there are the two tools one is decomposition another is expert judgment so expert judgment is nothing but basically taking the uh, input or taking the advice from subject matter we call it sme right the SME is basically subject matter experts. You need to connect with them and get their opinion about, you know, or what would be your WBS, let's say. Then there's another key technique that is your decomposition. Now decomposition is nothing, but this is basically breaking down in WBS. So let's say this is your bigger project P. Then you break down this project to small sub projects P1, right? Then maybe a P2 uh, and then maybe P3. Then you further break down these sub uh, projects into several categories. So you can just break down into further uh, projects, maybe other level P4, P4, P4. So then you can further you know, break down this project into various activities. So the process of breaking down this from this main project, right, 
to main project to smaller chunks of scope of work is basically called decomposition. This is what it's mean by. Okay. So once we understood these tools and techniques, you got your input, then definitely you will be getting some output. Now for the create WBS process, the key output is your scope baseline and then the project document update. So let's say while analyzing those document, understanding and applying the tools technique, you come to know that there is an updation of document is required. You will need to do this update, update on this document. Then the main key output of this process is scope baseline. Remember scope baseline is the main output. So what exactly scope baseline is? Right. So scope baseline, let me explain this uh, on a timeline. So let's say you have a project. This is a starting point or let's say it's a starting point and then it is supposed to finish for uh, let's say one year. Right. This is a finishing point. Now projects will have certain phase, right? Certain phase will be there. So at this point of time, let's say at this point of time, this is a start point right what happens actually there is a client right and there is a contractor let's say you are the contractor or your company is a contractor so there will be an agreement between these two uh, stakeholders and that will basically your contract document right so based on contract document what happens this contract document will list down all those statement and scope requirement as per this point at this point of time when the contract is signed right so there will be a fixed scope defined when you start a project whenever you're starting a project you will be fixed scope which is defined this basically defined by your contract document which will tell you what exactly the scope is now once a project start and it's moved toward the finish what happens is that there's some addition or deletion of scope or activity which is basically you know different than the initial scope requirement so this document the scope baseline will basically help us to track what are those changes either there's increase or decrease or addition or deletion of new activity so this scope baseline is going to help you and make you understand and help the other stakeholders to understand what are the changes with respect to scope baseline and that's why scope baseline is one of the key document one of the key document which dictate your project success right and this is what this document which you're going to get through the process of create wbs right this will basically give you this scope baseline document so we have learned about the process of create wbs right so there are the two things which we have learned one is wbs and then there's another important thing that is ws directory and i will be discussing that you know uh, what exactly it is so wbs is basically hierarchical breakdown of the project deliverables right then it's an actual structure we use for seeing and using to organize the project right it allows us to break down the scope into more manageable pieces and it's provide a reporting structure that we use for planning and capturing performance and actual so remember we will be using this wbs structure later on for the planning and the cost management so this becomes a very critical input for our next processes. Then this structure basically allow us to drill down and look at the project at the lowest level and then roll up to look at the whole. So we do, by utilizing the WBS structure, you can basically go to the more granular detail and also you can go upward and have uh, overall summary view. So at the meantime, you can have the both overall summary view as well as very detailed and granular structures then wbs work is basically relates the statement of work so this is one of the very key so let's say we have started with project charter in the project charter you will be having this uh, statement of work that is sow we call it sow now these sow is basically for the breakdown to detail wbs structure so let's say this is the main wbs this will break it down into another wbs and then let's say wbs1 wbs2 wbs3 like this you will basically break down this scope and then this let's say this wbs structure is further breaking down to small you know work packages one work packages two 
and work packages 3. So like this you basically grant, provide a granular structure of the detail at the same time you can go to the each level and find the summary at each level right so this is what the benefit of work breakdown structure and this is how it is utilized to manage the overall scope of the project now there's another important thing that is what is used as wbs directory right remember each project is unique right so each project is uh, unique and it means that it has unique wbs right so each project will be having its unique wbs now this wbs has to have follow the standard index or so standard codings this is basically a set of directory which utilized by the time management or for cost management for other activity this basically helps us it provides a standard list or standard structure which is further utilized to manage other uh, portion of this project maybe scope um, the cost or timeline or quality and uh, uh, other other knowledge areas right so basically what in my wbs dictionary wbs is nothing but it's a kind of excel sheet right in excel sheet like we have so many rows right so there are several rows let's say this is your excel sheet uh, or let's say word and then the, each row will define some wbs1 wbs2 wbs3 like this you will have you know all those wbs are listed here and define with the definition what will be your scope what do you mean by wbs1 what is the definition and then what is exactly scope is covering so this is how you know each wbs and your scope is connected by utilizing your wbs dictionary and that's why it's become very important very key it's work as an index where you can always go back and see for against this wbs what are the scope of work you are supposed to do right like this you can go through this document and find out so this basically is a list of wbs which basically names a description it's a, a name and description of the each element and this provide basically dis designate which scope of work paragraph is related to which wbs like we discussed right so this provides some kind of mapping between your scope of work and wbs so let's say you have the wbs and then this ws correspond to this this scope of work so if you at any point of time project do you want to find for this scope of work which is covered through which wbs you can go through the ws directory and check how uh, you know what is the wbs number ws code for this and also by seeing the wbs directory you can always go back and see which part of the scope of work is basically covered through which wbs so it provides some kind of mapping between scope of work and wbs so basically what it ensures that all the scope of work which is mentioned in your contract document right all the scope of work which is mentioned in your contract document is properly covered and indexed in wbs so that you have one-to-one -one mapping with scope contract document and the WBS structure and then this WBS structure will be utilized for your time management for cost management for quality management on all the other purposes also this helps you to track you know if any changes happens in your WS you will immediately know which WBS is impacted and where you have increase in the scope or decrease in the scope right so this is all about your WBS and WBS directory and how this is provides some kind of mapping between your contract document, scope of work, and the WS itself. So here's one example. So let's say this is your project, right? This is an example of your work breakdown structure. This is WBS structure, right? So let's say this is your project, and let's say divided into various phases, or let's say deliverables, right? Let's say it has the two phases. So this is phase number one this is phase number two now phase number two will be further divided into several packages so let's say this package number one package number two package number three now under this each packages there will be several activities right a b c d e like this there will be many n numbers of activities will be here in 
each work package and like this for work package too you will be having some different activities you will be having some different activities like this so basically what you're doing you are breaking your projects into smaller chunk first you do on faces then you do work package then you do activity so by doing this what happens that you are basically broken down your bigger scope of work or the project into activity level and make it more easily manageable trackable and you know you can easily find out if there is an issue in any of the activity then where it will be impact which work package will be impacting which phase will be impacted like this you can easily manage and track so that's why you know how uh, this this is how the work work breakdown structure helps the project to manage it or control the cost time and scope so next step so once you have basically created a WBS you have the WBS directory you have the structure so it means that you have basically mapped down all your scope of work you know very exactly what activities required to done how many phases are there you have already uh, broken down those activity you know up to the very lowest level of the detail what are the scope of work is there and what are those activities now once the project start you need to make sure you have validated that scope right so validate scope means what basically in this process you're going to do is that it is a formalized acceptance of completed project deliverables so once you break down once you develop your wbs basically what you are trying to do here identifying activities right and why you identifying those activities for what purpose to provide what provide deliverables right so you need to provide deliverables to clients right or to other stakeholders so that you can meet the objective so this is what it means you make sure all the wbs all the activities are basically in terms of formal acceptance which is basically meeting your deliverables so uh, like other process we have discussed right this is your remember we are in the scope management okay and under the scope management we have further sub process of plan scope management collect requirement define scope create wbs and then validate and control right this is our last sub uh, process of our overall project management process now in this process again as we discussed previously every process has some input output system so this is the input for this process there will be some tools right and techniques and then of course there will be some output okay so there will be input there will be output and we'll be utilizing some tools and techniques to complete this sub process now what are the input for this process so again these are the inputs one is project management plan requirement documentation requirement traceability metrics and then verified deliverables and work performance data remember so we need all those input to understand to what is actually your performance data is required what are the list of deliverables what are the exact requirements what is your management plan so by inputting those information by utilizing this information and then utilizing these tools and technique so when you say tools basically it has two one is your inspection inspection basically a deep analysis of all those documents and the various activity throughout your project right from start to finish you need to do a continuous inspection or analysis of those in work performance data various matrices and then you know have the group decision making basically discussing with the various stakeholders and identify you know what are things need to be done or is any issue so this is the tools and techniques which you will be utilizing so by utilizing tools and techniques this is the output you are supposed to get now in terms of output what you're supposed to get you will supposed to get the list of acceptable deliverables acceptable deliver remember right acceptable means what is acceptable by the client what actually client will accept those list of deliverables then the change work request basically if there's any request in the work or in the change throughout the from the start to the finish then you need to document all those things 
then the work performance information basically you know how the project is performing so when you start a project right, this is to start and this is finish and then how the project is performing is it on time is it uh, over budget under budget those kind of information has to be mentioned in the work performance information and then of course based on those inputs based on those uh, key uh, information you basically do the project document updation okay so this is all about your validate step process so the next step is basically your control scope right so once you have basically plan your scope management collect the requirement define the scope created a wbs validated the scope right remember you have validated the scope now the last part is controlling the scope so controlling the scope means basically let's say this is your start okay and this is your timeline for your project okay and here you have validated your scope right so this is your scope baseline let me write it clearly sorry about my handwriting okay so this is your scope baseline okay here you have scope baseline and then you validated it which basically fulfilled the requirement of your contract now as a project start you need to continuously measure those information and understand whether the project is on time or delayed or overrun all those kind of information has to be done in terms of scope so whether there is any additional activities added new activities added or reduce or remove so those kind of thing you need to do so like we discussed on other previous process same way we have input for this processes also right and as well as some output okay and then again you know there's tools and some techniques which you will be utilizing to complete this process so in terms of input you're going to get project management plan requirement document requirement testability metrics work performance data and uh, you know organization process asset based on this input you are basically trying to find how the project's scope is moving is it aligned with the baseline or is it deviating from the baseline if it's deviating then whether it's increasing or decreasing and then trying to find out what is the impact of those increase or decrease okay so if you come back and see basically you will be utilizing tools of variance analysis so variance analysis is nothing but basically let's say you have uh, information or let's say uh, a quantity at uh, let me write this quantity quantity at start has some let's say x amount or let's say you know x kg or x and then when you move and then do the same work then maybe you will require x plus some delta right so this x plus delta kg is basically what it's a variance you are supposed to let's say you have you, you are you're supposed to make a bridge and initially you estimated that the bridge was of let's say uh, 200 ton it's required 200 ton of steels right but when you started doing the work then later on you realize it's required 300 ton steels so the 200 minus 300 that 100 ton of additional steel is your variance right so this variance analysis is basically you need to perform while controlling the scope and this has to be done from start to finish this has to be continuous process from start to finish to continuously measure what is your variance is and how you're going to do it basically you have to do base analysis at regular interval so what are the output you are supposed to get one is performance from member measurement and depending upon that if then change request is required then you then you need to provide then that output will be there then there will be pro project document updates will be there and then also there could be update in your organization process as asset based on new lesson learned from these projects quick recap so the project so this is basically your overall you know the scope uh, management process right 
and this is basically consists of your plan scope management this is basically first step second step is a collect requirement and then third step is a define the scope right and then fourth step is your create wbs and then validate and control right validate and control are the fifth step which is kind of continuous process and you need to perform throughout this overall scope management process right so these are the five processes which you need to perform under the scope management to have a successful uh, scope management without any deviation or to meet the project objective right so this is what you require to do and if you have any question any additional query any additional help please leave a comment below and we will get back to you so key summary project scope we have already you know no so basically by definition is that work must be done to achieve the project scope Product scope, it's a basically a word feature and function or characteristics of the product or services results, which is basically a product scope. Project objective is basically referred to detailed description of the expected or desired outcome of the project. Then the WS dictionary, it's a detailed content of the components of containing WBS work package and control accounts. Basically, it's an Excel sheet which provides a list of all the WBS. And then the scope baseline, which basically includes the approved project scope statement, basically your initial scope statement, and then WBS and WBS dictionary, right? So once you manage, once you manage your scope, right? What is the next thing you are going to do? So you know scope. Scope means basically what is the activity you are going to do how many you know what is your wbs what are the activities you will be doing right that information you will get through scope management so once you know what you're supposed to do what are those activity the next step would be how much time right how much time will it take to complete those activity this is the key question now. So you know what activity you're supposed to do. Now the next step is to find out how much time it is going to take. And this is what we are going to learn in next section. So in previous section, we have learned about the scope. We have learned about the, how the scope management done for the professional projects. Now the next question is about the time. Right. Remember, we have the three constraints for any project. That's scope, time, and cost. Scope management, we have already discussed in the previous chapter. Now, we are going to learn about time management. And it's kind of a very general topic, right? So, it's very easy to uh, feel, I mean, you don't have enough time in any given day, right? So, and most often we all feel like that we don't have the enough time, right, uh, for any of the day. So, and, and most of the time you may have the same opinion as, as I'm, I'm having. So, time management, right, so when I say the time management, time management is kind of common issue, not only on but personal level, right, but also project level and this time management becomes the key to let's say success of any of the activity whether you're doing it your personal life or your project so let's understand the time management well so we all get 24 hours right in a day so it's limited time for everyone right limited time for every one right so when you have the limited time so basically it's all come down to your efficiency right how efficient you can do a particular activity and that's why you will see right some of the people who achieve more in a given time in a given time of 24 hours than many other people 
because the, the activities or the task are done efficiently right so the question is that how efficiently you can do the task how efficiently you manage your time and then perform those activity on the given time constraint and achieve your objective so it's a no-brainer well answer is basically good time management remember not just time management but good or I would say even better efficient right efficient time management this is what you are required to do to succeed so when we discuss about the time management right so if we talk in terms of definition so in terms of definition it's nothing but the process of organizing and planning how you divide your time between different activity so during the 24 hours of your duration you may have several kind of activities over the various uh, you know duration let's say 24 hours so you have the several activities you will be doing at certain hours now the thing is that how efficiently how well you manage those activity during those hours that's the key here and that's what exactly about the time management so it's a basically organizing and planning so you plan all your activity before it starts and so that you can focus on execution of the activity or completing the activity instead of wondering about what you should be doing so the same philosophy lies for the project also right the way you manage your daily activity in your life the same way you need to manage the activity throughout the project so remember the project has a start date and end date so it means it has a definite timeline so let's say this is the start of the project and you need to do certain activity and then let's say this is the finish of the project right so you have a fixed uh, timeline right so this timeline is fixed and you need to do certain activity within this timeline so this is what you know the project management is one of the key responsibility which include the processes which require to manage the timely completion of the project remember a project has triple constraint one is your time another one is your cost and another one is scope right so you need to complete this scope all the required work within given time frame right so you need to do this work by meeting this criteria if you do more than or time what is mentioned here or what is stipulated here it's kind of failure because then one of the objective of the project is that you need to do the work but work has to be done within the particular time frame and this is what about the time management for a pro in a, if you talk in terms of a project right so we will be going to detail how actually do we manage the time management or let's say in project management term it's called schedule management because every project has some schedule right so even though we have fixed timeline in this fixed timeline you need to do certain activity which basically forms the schedule which defines that which activity will take how much time from which day to uh, another date and in terms of start and finish day okay so this is what we are going to learn in detail in terms of project management so time management process right so what it is actually well like the other processes we have uh, we had scope management processes we have seen overall the project management uh, process group so same way that to manage a time in a project it also has some certain set step processes which we need to do so it is again like seven step processes for managing the time or let's say managing the schedule of project and so i'll start with your step one that is your plan the schedule management you need to plan before start working on the planning itself how you will be actually planning your schedule for the project what are the things you will be looking at it where you will be taking information then once you get those information how you arrange those information how you organize those information utilize those information to develop various activities various uh, estimation 
duration schedule development and all those things so the, all those things you need to plan before actually start working on the step so your first step is basically planning right planning how you will perform those steps how you will do those uh, processes so once you planned it then the very next step is basically your define the activity right remember we earlier we had the scope right we have learned about scope now to complete that scope you need to have certain list of activity which you will be doing right or which you should be doing so that you need this scope or objective right this is what it means so you need to define all those activities which basically meets your scope requirement which basically leads to the reach the project objective then once you complete with defining your activities we will move to the third step that is sequence activity right so once you list down the activities which you should be doing or which you are supposed to do to complete the scope then you need to also know which activity has to be done right there could be possibility that some activity has to be done together right some activity has to be done you know after some another activity is completed and then maybe some activity has to be done before another activity can start right so uh, let's let, let's take an example that you want to buy a mobile right now to buy a mobile you need to place order right you need to place an order at some retailer now to complete this activity placing the order you need to have budget right or you need to have money in your bank balance or uh, you know in your credit card or whatever now to get the money probably you need to ask someone right or maybe you are need to wait for your salary to your monthly salary or depending on somewhere some source you need to get those salary right or maybe maybe another source of income so once you that income is arrived then you will have the money in your account or balance and then once you have that money then you can move to this activity remember so these activities are dependent upon these so until unless this is complete until unless you got the money you cannot go and place a mobile order right and then once you place the order you will get the mobile in your hand right or you will get delivered mobile but to have the mobile or delivered you need to first place order right without placing order you cannot get the delivery of mobile so this is a simple example let's say if you want to get a mobile then these are the activity which you are supposed to do and you can see right these activities are logically sequenced they depends upon the previous activity and the same thing the same philosophy works on every project right every project has certain list of activities right and these activities are logically tied with one and another so that you have the overall objectives achieved so this is what is all about sequence we will be going in detail and understanding this but from the basic concept this is what is mean by sequencing your activity so once you define your activity sequence them next thing is estimate the resource activity so remember right to do any activity you will require resource maybe in terms of labor in terms of additional budget maybe in terms of tools and softwares those kind of all things right whatever the additional resources either in terms of labor money uh, you know additional tools those has to be estimated right for again each activity what will be required to complete those activity and once you estimated that once you estimated that uh, activity resource which is your step 4 right this is step 4 then you move to the step 5 step 5 is what estimate the activity duration so once for any activity let's say uh, you want to let's say the previous example that you want to place the order of mobile 
right, or hand set. So once you know what is the cost required, plus maybe you will require some internet connection or some uh, you know uh, transportation to go to the retail shop, those kind of things will be required. And maybe you will need some friend's help or some advice from your friend who can guide you, you know, what are the best features of the phone. Once you collected all those information, once you have this money, once you have the money for the transportation or maybe other things, it means that these are all resources which is required to complete this activity, right? This is a single mobile. So once you do this, then you need to go to and estimate how much time this all those activity will take. How much time will it take to place an order, right? And this is what is all about your estimation duration activity. Maybe suppose if you want to go and place an order online, right? Then it will immediately take maybe 5 to 15 minutes, right? And suppose if you have to go to the retail shop and then place the order, probably it will take your whole day, right? You need to maybe go to several retail shop and then find out which is the best one and then um, you place your order, then come back to your home and uh, probably it's going to take you know whole of the day to complete this activity. And this is what it's mean by estimating the activity duration, right? So we have step one, step two, step three, step four, step five is estimating the duration act of the each activity and then you move to the step six which is your developing the schedule so once you know what is your activity right what is the sequence of your activity then when you know what is the estimated duration of the each activity then you know also what is the resource of the each activity you will basically combine all those four elements together or let's say five elements together to develop your schedule so schedule is what basically it is combination of your estimation of duty activity duration resources plus sequence and activity itself right so once you develop the schedule then again last step is control the schedule or let's say control and monitor the schedule Right. So we will go each step in detail, but from the overall time management point of process, this is basically seven step process, right? And this includes the seven sub processes, right? And these are basically plan schedule management, define activities, sequence activities, then, uh, you know, uh, estimate the source and estimate activity duration and develop the schedule and control the schedule. So step one, what is your plan schedule management? So what do you mean by plan schedule management? So remember, this is your step one, right? Or let me call it sub processes, sub process of time management process and this is sub process number one now what is it what exactly does it say in terms of you know definition so it's a process of establishing policies procedures and documentation for planning right this is basically a process which tells you what policy what kind of process what do you documentation you're going to do to the do the planning developing managing and executing right so it includes all how you will plan how you will develop how you will manage how you will execute and then how you will control right all those five activities about project schedule so basically it tells how you will plan develop manage execute and control the project schedule this is the keyword here the project schedule how you will manage the project schedule in terms of planning, developing, all those aspects. So this is what it means in terms of definition and we will learn in further detail in it. So like we discussed in previous processes, right? Uh, so similarly, the time management also uh, follows the same, uh, the process, the same format that every sub process has requires some sort of input. And then we will be utilizing some sort of tool and then we will be having goal or let's say we have some outcomes 
right or let's say outputs so for plan schedule management what are the things what are the inputs you require so one is your project management plan project charter enterprise environmental factors and organization processes so these are the key input which you will be required to do the plan schedule management and once you've got this input what are the techniques you will be applying so one is your analytical techniques meetings expert judgment so basically you need to do analysis of all the information which you have received and then discuss it with the stakeholders right stakeholders or let's say the experts i would call it sme or we call it subject matter experts all right so this is what we need to do in terms of tools and techniques to arrive at this output the output is basically what schedule management plan so you will come up with a plan which will tell you basically how you will be doing all those you know these all those sub process this is basically provides an outline right you know we know the sequence and all the phases you can say all this process have to be done in this sub process but what are the things you will be doing in this each sub process this is what it's mean by schedule management plan and this is what we do in this step so the output of this uh, sub process is basically nothing but schedule management plan right this is what it is and remember this is your first step of the overall time management process so in the previous step we have already discussed that how we will be planning the schedule right uh, basically this we have got as an output of schedule management plan right so this was our uh, the first step so once you get this schedule management plan very next activity is you defining the activities right and this is what this process is all about so you need to define all your activities right so remember when we disc we were discussing the scope management plans so let's say you have the big project here okay and now this project can be broken into various wbs so let's say this is wbs1 this is wbs2 and this is your wbs three right now this wbs can be further broken down into let's say the work package one and then work package two or maybe work package three right so against each work package you need to define the various activity what are the activity you will be doing let's say this is activity one then you will be having the activity two activity three and so on so basically you will come up with the list of activities right so list of activities to complete this each work package so against each work package you will be getting list of activity or you can directly develop the list of activity against each wbs depending upon uh, you know uh, the size of your project or what is the size of the each wbs so this all step is about all about defining this list of activity so in this step you are going to get what are the activities you have what are the total list of activity which you should be doing to complete this work package or wbs so that you can meet the overall objective of the project right so in terms of definition in terms of definition what exactly define activity process is it's a process to identify clarify and define the key schedule activities right activities you need to understand and then which need to be performed to produce a deliverable so we have the deliverable defined at each phase let's say this is phase one phase two phase three like this we have several phases for each project so this is let's say the start and this is the finish right and in phases let's say there are several phases so against each phases you will be marking some deliverables you need to provide some deliverables and which is defined by the client right so 
basically what are the activity you should be doing to meet this deliverable so that client is happy is all about this process and this is what all about this process is to define those activity so when i say define activity so it basically means connecting the dots of your project schedule right so what do you mean by dots when i say connecting the dots so connecting the dots means we have this scope right and now from utilizing this scope we need to arrive at the schedule okay and this schedule is basically nothing but list of the activities right this is the list of activities which we need to identify sequence it and then estimate and then analyze and then bring it in a schedule format so to connect this project schedule with the scope you need to utilize a work breakdown structure that is called a wbs which basically you know connects these two element your scope and the schedule right and basically it's help you to coordinate the work and assign it to team member once you know a separate wbs you can assign to a separate member and then track it so always use a work breakdown structure to let's say this is your project scope okay overall and then this project is divided into various uh, level of wbs so let's say this is wbs1 wbs2 and then level 3 let's say this is work breakdown structure is break up into the work packages let's say work package is one work package two similarly work package one and work package two like this so what you are doing you are basically breaking down your activities in a more manage manageable or more control label way so that you can easily control assign these activities to the various resources and accordingly you can schedule it to the granular level and control or manage or track those changes or those oh, uh, the activities throughout your project life cycle so always use wba structure basically it's help you to coordinate the work and it's help you to assign to a team member then also it will give you the visual hierarchy you can visually see your overall project scope at level at various levels so level one level two level three and the same way you know you can uh, break down those activity and develop the schedule at various level uh, from you know very high level to a uh, very detailed or granular level schedule so first level usually called the parent task or the parent project places in this case the project and then accordingly you depending upon uh, you know the various level you can break it down and depending upon your requirement uh, you can bring it down to the activity as per your project requirement. So this is what it means by connecting the dots. So connecting the dot means you're connecting your project scope with the schedule and aligning with them, defining, breaking down the activity so that you can easily define the each resources, assign each resources, manage those resources over the timeline or those activities over the timeline and easily find out if there's any variation, any changes, any deviation or any data which requires some corrective action to bring back the schedule uh, as it is initially planned. So remember we are at the process second or the second step. We are at this step, right? Uh, and then previously we have covered the plan schedule management and like we discussed for other previous sub process like in terms of every process requires some input then requires some tool and then goal or basically your what is your output right this is what is mean so in terms of input for this process which is your defined activity is these are the inputs you will be needing so you will need school so you will need the schedule management plan you will need the scope baseline then you will need the enterprise uh, environmental factor organization processes so these are the input which you will be required or you will be needing it to to complete the process so once you get this information in your in your hand then what else you will do then the very first techniques you will be doing in deploying or utilizing is decomposition which we discussed earlier rolling wave planning we will be discussing what exactly is mean by rolling wave planning later on and then the expert judgment right so these tools and techniques you will be utilizing to get what to get these output what is output activity list activity output and milestone list remember right so these are the things you will be getting 
pen you know uh, as an output for this process right and we can discuss in detail so activity attribute is basically the different definition so what act, what does it mean by those activities you need to provide and then milestone so there are certain milestones you know the projects are basically covered through let's say this milestone one two milestones are basically the key achievement which is done throughout the uh, the project so let's say this is the start of the project right right and then this is a finish date of the project now from start to finish there are certain key milestones will be achieved to arrive at this point right this is and let's say for example if you have to develop a building let's say right let's say you have to develop a school building or a power plant so you cannot get the school building within one day or this is you know uh, in one moment so it will be done or you will be achieving this complete school building in several steps several big steps so let's say first you develop the whole building structure the structures of the so structure means you don't have the fittings you don't have uh, you know all the furniture and everything but you get the overall structures maybe steel, steel structure or utilize uh, you know building other building materials so once your structure is ready then your outfitting will be done once your outfitting is done then you will be require some other additional equipment which is added and then finally you have a complete school building which can be utilized right now to get this school building you have to achieve or you have to go through several milestones so one milestone could be your structural completion then another milestone will be your another uh, you know uh, the fitting all accessories then another will be your adding others uh, you know the furniture and other decoration items so those kind of milestones uh, I mean just an example for this one this is what milestones means right and you need to get the list of all those milestones this is one of your output for this process okay so once you identify the activity or once you get the list of the activities right next thing is that to sequence those activities right you need to know which activity has to be done first and then the later on at the ne next step right this is what it's mean by it. so this is basically nothing uh, it's as simple as it is it's basically arranging those activities in a logical order depending upon their dependencies right so we have seen previously the example of school building right now to school building to make a school building you need to have the first structures means you have to column you need to have the beams right you have to walls and then based on those you will be basically developing your building structures right so without having these developing uh, these foundations or the base of the building you cannot develop uh, building right you cannot develop the building here until unless your base or foundation is ready right so the first activity is not to develop the walls or you know the construct the walls or the rooms but before constructing this you need to basically do this activity which is your base or foundation and this is what is mean by so logically you need to define those activities or sequence those activities and this is what is mean by sequencing of activity so like this you need to logically think which activity has to be done before and which activity has to be done at the later stage then like every sub process have some inputs and then we utilize some tools and techniques and then this will result in some output so for sequence activity remember this is a third sub process right we are here now and in the third sub process you need to have these input six that is your schedule management plan which we got it from the step number one right and then we have the activity list and attribute milestone list project scope statement then one factor and the organization process as such. so you need to get these information from the previous steps or previous sub process plus uh, from the in initial project documents 
and then utilize these tools right so what is your pdm we will learn you know what exactly the pdm is then we will be having this tool of leads and lag then dependency determination right so leads and lags in terms of like basically means some activities let's say this activity one okay and then there's activity two so idea is that the to complete the job these activities has to be done now this activity can be done in some cases maybe after one after once this is finished right then this will start or maybe both activity can start parallelly right i mean there could be situation where activity one and activity two both are both can start parallelly or the there could be possibility that after only you know uh, the activity two is finished right then only your activity one will start right they could be i mean such scenario or it's possible that both activity activity one right or activity two both are finishing at same time right let's say this way so both activity are finishing at same time so there could be several dependency or several uh, uh, relationship based on that you define the leads and lags leads means one activity how much you know uh, it can be uh, done before the, the finish of the other one or lag means how much uh, by how many days or how many duration one activity can be delayed so this we will be learning in detail in terms of the concept PDM we will learn you later on what exactly this concept is and then the dependency determination is basically nothing but how logically one activities are sequenced or connected so by utilizing utilizing this input and utilizing this utilizing these tools and techniques right tools and techniques you will be eyeing at these outputs right now what are those outputs one is your scheduled network diagram right we will see example what is this scheduled network diagram and then based on this you need to update your documents it could be your schedule a list of activity you may identify the this process that you need to do some additional activity or maybe you know uh, you need to sequence them in different way or maybe you need to update your plan or scope depending upon you know what kind of output you get it so basically this will lead to updation of various other project document depending upon your new learning uh, throughout the process right so this is in terms of uh, well you know the process and we will learn you know these critical things at the later stage so the next sub process is estimate activity duration so remember we have identified the list of the activities right then we have basically sequenced sequence those activity right now you need to estimate you need to estimate what estimate the resources right remember to do the work to complete the any job you need to have some resources either in terms of labor manpower maybe some tools or uh, some kind of uh, material is required all those things need to be estimated right so this estimate activity resource is nothing but basically you need to estimate how much uh, maybe what what type of resources require and what's the quantity of those resources so maybe you require what kind of people or what expertise you require then what kind of material will be needing equipment tools and other bulk material supplies to complete those activity and this is what basically your this sub process tells you need to estimate the activity resources so once you basically you know uh, define your activities you've got the list of uh, you know the sequence of those activities you need to estimate the activity resources right so like we discussed in other previous previous sub process so we need to define the resources right basically to do <coughs> to do the 
to do all those activity what are the resource required right when i say the resource resource uh, we had discussed right in terms of material manpower labor uh, those things you need to you know understand this and then in terms of sub process so again this follows the same format so it requires some sort of input then we will be using some tools and techniques and then goal is basically what will be output so in terms of input you will be needing activity list attributes of those activity resource calendar we will discuss you know what exactly mean by resource calendar but uh, basically uh, the timetable of applying these resources risk register again this is one of key critical input for risk management we can discuss in detail but in brief it is basically the list of all the risk you have identified in that point of time then of course you need the cost detail for each activity to estimate those and then uh, you know you need the schedule management plan enterprise environment factor organization processes so this kind of input this kind of input you will be needing to complete this sub process now once you get this input in your hand you need to apply some tools right or let's say you need to apply some techniques now what are those tools and techniques so one is a bottom up estimation right remember we have several type of estimation one is a top down also right and another one is a bottom up so we will be utilizing this bottom up not the top down right and why because the bottom up estimation right this estimation is basically utilize all your detailed granulables right estimate those and then arrive at higher level of estimates right what does mean this higher level of estimates is basically it's give you high accuracy right and that's why we utilize this remember we are at the detail planning or detail schedule management not at the uh, some lump sum or preliminary estimation so we need to have the accurate estimation for each activity and that's why we utilize bottom up estimating timing we will be going in detail about this later on but for the timing you can understand we will be utilizing other key tool right just to be have accurate estimates of the resources then of course we will need the expert judgment or subject matter expert opinion then we have the further analysis you know you can do we can analyze several analysis in terms of options and find out which is more resource efficient or which is more utilizing the optimized resource then you have to you know utilize the published data or lesson learned from the previous projects or maybe from your process point of view and then of course you will need the project management software right so remember estimation is not a simple process right estimation is complex right and it's required additional resources in fact to do the estimation you will require some resources or let's say efforts right uh, it's require some serious efforts to have the accurate estimation and that's why you will need support from the project management so there are some uh, tools available uh, some softwares which can do you uh, or help you to do the efficient estimation and effective estimation and that's why you know uh, we will need uh, those estimation softwares or tools to do uh, accurate estimation right so once you utilize these tools and technique and you know taken care of this information which you got and apply those tools and techniques you will be arriving at some output and when we talk in terms of output for this process the very first output is your rbs rbs is basically resource breakdown structure so remember previously we have discussed wbs in scope management which is your work breakdown structure right is your work breakdown structure so similarly you will need rbs which is your resource breakdown structure and then you will need the activity resource requirement right which is basically tells you for each activity right what is your resource resource means labor material tools and all other things you know whatever is required to complete those activities your resource and this is what you're going to mention here you know our activity resource requirement and then of course the project documents update so during this sub process you may identify some new learning some new activities some new score which was missed previously accordingly uh, you know you need to update all your process document 
and this so that all the you know uh, document all all the other knowledge areas are updated up to the latest finding right so this is all about the estimate activity resource step and remember this is your fourth step okay so we have seven step for schedule management and this is your fourth step right so then the next activity is your duration we will be learning this in our next uh, session so the next uh, process is your estimate activity duration right so remember we have the list of activity then we have basically sequenced them right and once you sequence them you basically estimated the resource right once you estimated the resource the next step is your estimate the activity durations so once you know what is your resource what are the things you require to do how you require to do very next step is that how do you how much time that will take to complete so right so each activity you need to find out how much time maybe in terms of days or hours or you know uh, depending upon that some activity for research project in this could be in years okay so we need to uh, basically think uh, what are the duration basically each activity from start when it will start and when it will finish this is what you need to find out against each activity right so this is what is mean by estimate activity duration and again here estimation is a key so you need to estimate those duration by utilizing various estimation tools and technique uh, let's discuss it in our next session. So talking is a process in terms of activity duration, right? So this is Again, like we estimated resource you need to estimate now activity duration itself, right? Duration is the key here and This is again. We are going to do it with same format Require some 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 sort of input. We will take some information, right? This is basically nothing but information gathering process or in the information gathering steps which is comes in terms of input then we will utilize some tools and techniques to uh, you know analyze or to work on these inputs and then arrive at some outputs right which is your goal or let's say the outcome uh, of this small process so what are the inputs we will be requiring schedule management plan activity list and attributes activity resource requirement resource calendar project scope statement risk register rbs resource breakdown structure which we discussed previously and then this is environmental factors for from enterprise point of view and organization process assets so these are the information these are the key input which you will be required and then you will apply some certain tools so one is your analogous estimation parametric estimations three point estimates group making decision reserves analysis and then you know the expert judgment so we will be discussing these tools and technique details in details later on but it's kind of you know the estimation techniques and some of this again group decision making nothing but you know some group of SMEs or subject matter experts they make decision based on the uh, uh, furnished the information to them and then reserve analysis is again uh, one of the tools and techniques to identify what could be the duration in terms of uh, the particular activity and then expert judgment so these are the tools and techniques which you will be utilizing or which you should utilize and work on this information to arrive at this output right now output what should be output output would be basically the activity duration estimate so remember we have the list of the activity right we have the activity list so there is several number of activity will be listed down right now you need to against each activity tells how many days or how many hours it will take right against each activity so basically you need to define when it will start and when it will finish so you need to do for each activity the same thing right so this is basically what lead to you the activity duration estimates and then of course uh, project document update this is based on the new learnings which you found during this whole process well, once we have this uh, information previously, right, we have the information of the list of the activities, then we have the sequence of the activities, right, and then we have uh, 
basically uh, estimated the resources and then we have estimated the durations right so once you got the information list of activities sequence of activity resources and duration the next step is you need to develop those schedules right so when I say W schedule, basically what happened that let's say there's a uh, project timeline, right? This is a start, right? And this is a finish. So what you did earlier, you basically identify various activities which is required to do at various step, right? You need to find out what are those activities. So each activity has a start and finish date, right? You need to identify those durations. What we had uh, earlier identified this against so you need, you have basically find out what is uh, you know what is this activity means so it's a definition right and then you find out what is the duration right and then also you found out what is the resource required against each activity so the same thing you did for each activity previously so now you have the list of activity its definition of each activity what will be the duration of this each activity and then the resource so once you get all those detailed information for each activity very next step is to place them over the project timeline remember this is a project start and this is a project finish so you need to uh, basically you know put this over the timeline and understand what exactly your schedule is right and this is basically overall combining various activity to arrive this and this is what is mean by this phase developed schedule so this is <coughs> what this process is so if we try to define uh, this process in terms of definition so it is the process of analyzing activity sequence duration resource requirement and schedule constraints right remember schedule constraints uh, there could be several constraints. So one constraint is it has fixed start date and fixed finish date, right? Which is mm, normally put by your client. Client will tell you I need this date or I need this deliverable by this. So this is one of the constraints. There could be another constraints. Uh, we can discuss those in detail. But basically, you need to do those activity uh, sequences, duration, in analyze the source requirement and schedule constraint to create the schedule right to find out what is your best schedule to meet those activity and then when you see this schedule constraint so one constraint is your project deadline basically start and finish date there could be other constraint let's say your project uh, is uh, spread over this timeline it's a start and it's a finish and our project is basically divided into various phases right so this is let's say phase one phase two right phase three so there could be several phases now client could define in fact start and finish date for each phases also right that is to say that uh, this phase should start at this date and should finish this date and you know like this so basically these become again constraints schedule constraint to develop the schedule right and you need to analyze all those constraints by keeping in mind those sequence of activity resource requirements and then arrive at a best schedule to achieve those objective or target so in terms of process let's uh, you know uh, like we discussed earlier so remember now we had the developed schedule step which is your sixth step right on the uh, schedule management process and like every process we have discussed previously so it's follow the same uh, 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 format it requires some sort of input when in some information we will need then some tools and techniques you will be utilizing and then you will be right uh, you know arriving at some outcomes right or uh, let's say some outputs so if we talk in terms of the input for this uh, the sub process so again activity list and attributes this is one of the uh, first input which we we'll need then you will need the schedule network diagram Activity resource requirement, project scope statement, resource calendar, RBS, resource breakdown structure, risk register, and then you know project staff assignment and schedule management. Right. So these are the input, these are the information which you will need right to perform this or to complete this sub process. And then you need to utilize some tools or let's say some techniques, right? So what are those techniques? It's basically the schedule network analysis, 
scheduled compression techniques we will be discussing you know what exactly this means then uh, modeling techniques critical path method right then critical chain method then scheduling tools and again leads and lags so these are all the scheduling tools and techniques to basically arrive at optimized schedule right you need to basically arrive at optimized schedule which uh, basically meets your all constraints so when i say constraint then mainly your schedule constraints right so they meet all schedule constraint and that's why you need to do the optimizations right so by utilizing this information and applying these tools and techniques you will be having a some output right those outputs are basically a schedule baseline remember right when you start a project you commit some dates to the client and make sure you meet all those deadlines and commitment and then accordingly you commit or uh, basically you define you know each activities durations start and finish date and that first commitment becomes your baseline basically this is at the start of the project right so that's the first thing schedule data right basically the, all the schedule information calendars project plan and documents update and then finally you know you need a schedule maybe at various levels so there could be several levels so you need summary level schedule level one level two then you have detailed schedule then you have further very detailed breakdown schedule level four like this so there are several levels of schedule i'm not going into detail of the schedule but this in this all those input you will be or let's say all those output you will be getting or you need to produce those output during this sub process of developing schedule right and remember this is a six step process so before that you have already defined those activities sequence those activity estimated the resources and estimated duration and then you arrived at your schedule right the overall schedule of the project from start to finish right over the project timeline so this is what you need to do in this step so once you develop a schedule now the very next step is to deploy the schedule right so once you have developed you got a schedule in your hand right and then let's say project is started so you need to deploy the schedule right basically you need to share the schedule with each stakeholder and make sure they are following the schedule so once a project start you need to start you know control or let's say monitor your schedule so that basically what you're trying to do here is to find out whatever the activity which you have assumed or what are the activity which you have planned for those start and finish date are those activities are starting or finishing as planned or they are getting delayed or they are ahead of time basically those all things are called controlling schedule right so it basically means that you control the changes any changes either you know it's getting delayed or basically you know some uh, activities are finished earlier so those changes all need to be managed or monitored and then accordingly you need to take some action depending upon the requirement so this is what this step is all about now how to do it that we are going to learn in so for control and monitor the schedule we will be using one of the key technique right and that key technique is nothing but your variance analysis so variance analysis is basically performed to determine the degree of variance of the schedule from the baseline data or let's say baseline schedule so what it does is compare the target schedule to baseline schedule with your actual start right and then see if it's start as planned or delayed or it is basically you know started or finished earlier so depending upon the actual uh, start and finish you can identify those or compare those basically the idea is to find out the variations variations in terms of start date or finish date and then this will lead to some corrective action so depending upon that if some activities are getting delayed then you need to take some corrective action to either you know start those activity parallelly or uh, deploy some resources so those kind of things 
you need to take as a corrective action or maybe you don't need to do anything right depending upon discussion uh, with the various stakeholders or kind of risk management you are have a discussion that uh, there for the particular time there is no corrections required so all those thing analysis as well as detecting variation and then implementing the corrective action is the part of your control and monitor uh, schedule right so if you take in one example this is one of your software development example right this is for you know, software project so these are the activity let's say you have to design something then you have to provide the training then you have to provide the IT issue then you will again uh, do those uh, initial uh, architects and then you need to provide the data migration so these are let's say these are the steps or these are the major activities which you need to do on this activity and the gray portion which you see this is basically your start and finish initially plan start and finish start and finish this is start and finish start and finish for this activity remember these each activities are planned up to this timeline okay now if you see the green bar green bar is basically showing your actual so you can see these activities started here and finished as well expected you can see these activities started but still not finished and the work is progress still uh, still pending right so this green bar is showing your current status now comparison between this green bar and the gray bar will basically give you the data so if you see the green versus gray then this will give you some delta that delta is nothing but your variance right and this is how you identify the variance or do the variance analysis for the schedule so this is a very basic tool and one of the you know the most used tool in any form of control and monitoring schedule process so this will lead to some key uh, output so one is like you know doing the various analysis you will find the control table which basically track how the schedule is performance so this basically tracks how many activities are on time how many activities are delayed how many activities are ahead of time those kind of things you will be getting under the schedule control table and then based on that you can see you know various corrective actions are taken and then accordingly you can project uh, whether you know uh, the project will be as estimated and if its uh, duration is delayed then how much it will be delayed and accordingly you can recommend some corrective actions so in terms of process how to deploy this process well uh, like we discussed previously every process has some input then some tools and techniques and then of course goals or let's say the outcome or let's say the outputs right so in terms of input which require the project management plan project schedule work performance data calendar schedule data and then organizational process assets so these are the inputs you will be needing right to do this step and then you have this tools and techniques right this is the what you have this and you need to deploy these tools and techniques to arrive at some output right so this is what your maybe you know performance review project management software resource optimization technique modeling techniques leads and lags schedule compression and scheduling tools so these are the tools you need to apply to arrive at this controlling schedule now what kind of output you will be getting well if you talk in terms of you know output one is your work performance information which is basically you need to know what kind of how the schedule is performing then you need to have some focus then the change request based on your analysis based on your findings of variance you need to do some changes or you need to request some changes then of course you need to update your project management plan and documents update and then of course this may need you know to update your organization process also you may find some new lessons right maybe some some lesson learns here which you would like to apply to your overall company process right and this will basically lead to updation of your organization process so these are the key output which you will be getting for this control schedule uh, sub process and remember this control schedule sub process is your 
final uh, sub process and this is for your overall you know schedule management process so this is how we actually do this so now we have covered all the seven step and let's see some other key element of the schedule management process so for monitoring and controlling the schedule is basically related to you know determining the status of the project right it's all about determining the current status of the project based on what based on some information which you gather based on some factors which have influenced the changes or which can bring the changes in your schedule and this could be you know the internal external factors so you need to identify all those factors which will basically impact the status of your project or let's say progress of your project and then which will basically results uh, or impact to your schedule right so you need to determine the impact on the schedule and then determine the various action which bring the schedule to the baseline so you need to see what is the impact on the schedule then various actions uh, which bring the schedule to the baseline and then accept the changes right so this is what it means by you know the impact on schedule then various actions bring the schedule and accept changes progress report progress report are used to evaluate basically the impact to the schedule and then determine the project if project is still on the track or will be delayed right so this is what is the purpose of the progress report this is one of the key i would say the output or the key tools for the monitoring and control uh, you know the purpose of the monitoring and control of the schedule itself now for example let's say you have some of the activities and which have losses more than the days which actually it was planned so let's say some of the activities were there which are supposed to finish at date start and this finish date but when you actually the project progress they actually started let's say at this date right at this timeline so when the project started they were delayed by let's say this duration so let's say this is like five days duration it was delayed so now based on this you need to identify whether this delay of five days has impacted your critical path right or whether it's not and then based on that impact on critical path do you actually require to take some actions for this right this is what is all about your wanting and control of the schedule and this is what we are you know uh, doing in monitoring control uh, schedule process so the next step is what to do when you find a variance right so let's say you do the variance analysis right and then once you do the variance analysis you basically you basically trying to find out what are the mitigation action right what are the corrective action which you are supposed to take or which you should take to bring back the schedule to the original baseline right so let's say this is your start and finish date we have planned some activity right this is the initial baseline or let's say this is a baseline plan and then you have some activity let's say this is activity one right let's say this is activity one and then actually this activity started like this so it was planned to start here but then it planned start actually start here so there is a there is a difference right let's say this is five days delay now you need to find what corrective actions or what are the things you're supposed to do to bring back the or to basically reduce the impact impact to zero when i say reduce impact mean basically is an impact on critical path and then if so then how you bring that impact of critical path to zero what are the remedies to the variations right what are the things which you are supposed to do as a solution to the problem you identify through the variance analysis right first thing you propose a schedule changes suppose some changes are required you need to you know do some activity or some parallel activity that you need to propose but before proposing you need to you know, evaluate all those available option right to bring back the schedule on track or when i say schedule on track I mean basically 
bring back it to baseline right now this additional action or this recommendation may lead to use of additional resources and then that may lead to the impact to your project budget so you need to be very careful when you're proposing some changes make sure you know it is uh, the cost is minimized or minimum impact in terms of budget and then accordingly you propose those solutions so you need to evaluate several options in terms of corrective actions so there are the two techniques which normally utilize uh, in terms of schedule management or schedule correction which we will be discussing later on so this is basically one is your fast tracking and another one is a crashing technique so we will discuss about these two techniques right one is a fast tracking and then another one is your crashing so we'll discuss these two techniques in next slides so corrective actions well corrective actions technique one first one is crashing so crashing is a technique of making budget and schedule trade-off right so you need to trade off between the budget and the schedule to obtain the greatest schedule compression right for the least amount of cost increase okay so well in terms of crashing i will tell you very uh, simple examples so crashing basically suppose you have some activity let's say this is your start and this is your finish this is your timeline right so you have planned some activity now when you started monitoring so this is your baseline right this is your baseline when you started the actual actual let's say for this activity it started like this so it started at this date and then finished at this date right so there's a gap from here there's a gap between these days now to cover this will basically now you have this fix this baseline is fixed right <coughs> basically means this date is not changed yet so it's still the same now to cover all those activities right to complete this activity on time let's say this time what you will do you will add more resources right more resources or more people here so that what we'll do it will basically help this activity to finish faster so then let's say this is activity two so this will if you add more resources here they will come you know more resources will do the job work faster and they will try to meet this initial plan finish so this is what it basically means by crashing so you deploy more people to complete the work faster which was supposed to done earlier right then and you know i mean this is again associated with your cost so if you try to achieve some extra uh, activity in within time to cover the delay of course this is going to you know increase uh, uh, your cost and you need to basically identify the possible impact of this cost and then accordingly you need to uh, make sure you know several options uh, which are effective in terms of overall project budget so in terms of uh, the concept this is what crashing means so this is one of the corrective action techniques for the schedule control or let's say the schedule um, monitor and control and this is one of the very common technique you will find people use in the project right and don't follow this this is just for joke right <laughs> okay so uh, technique number two correct action that is a fast tracking right so fast tracking involved basically doing the activity parallel right which was supposed to plan to be doing sequence so that when you identify some dates uh, some delays some happens and then you know you accordingly decide to do some activity in parallel and again you know there has to be it must be determined based on the dependency whether it's a critical path or not so let's say uh, let's let's take this example so you have the initial baseline let's say conventional project or let's say the initially assume this is let's say the initial baseline 
So initially you thought that you will be doing this activity A, B, C, D, E in this sequence. You will first finish activity A, activity B, activity C, activity A like this, right? So let's say this is your start, okay? And this is your finish. And then you thought that you will be doing this activity in this, this sequence. Now what happens when actuals is happen, then you notice some delay. So you what, what you will be trying to do here? Then you will start this activity parallelly. So maybe instead of waiting for this point, you start this activity at this point itself, right? Similarly, for the activity C, you again start this activity instead of this point, you start in this activity at this point. So what you're doing, you're doing starting this activity parallelly. So what happens at the end of the day, because the finished date is same, you will be able to make some savings some time savings and this will basically help you to cover up any possible delay right this is what means by fast tracking this is what the fast tracking concept is basically starting some activity which was planned in certain sequence in parallel now this could bring some other you know uh, the impact so you need to uh, carefully analyze the sequence, the logic of the activity, whether this is applicable or not, and assess uh, what are the overall impact of the schedule. And then, you know, uh, before proposing this, you need to do all those analysis, right? So let's compare these two techniques, pros and cons of these two techniques, so you will be understand better and you will be in better position to choose, uh, you know, the various techniques depending upon the situation you face throughout your project. Okay, so, well, in this slide, so let's have a quick recap. So, this is, let's say, the normal scenario where you have the initial baseline. You, uh, This is your activity, right, activity A, and then this is activity B, and you are supposed to spend one resource here, and then one resource for activity B. This is how you plan. Now, what happened during this variance analysis, you notice some delay right and you propose some corrective action so let's say you utilize a fast track technique so in the fast track technique what you did you basically instead of you know these are the start and finish date for the activity a and b what you did that the less this is start and finish date uh, for activity a remains same but for activity b you started earlier right so you're supposed to start here but then you started at this date right so you basically prepone those activity or basically start those activity in parallel so by this you are actually trying to achieve your time savings right you're trying to save some time which basically cover up the delay which you recognize but by doing this activity in parallel you have basically increased the risk to the project and that we will discuss in the next slide that how actually you increase the risk but this is what the you know uh, the drawbacks of fast tracking now for the crashing technique crashing technique is what you initially plan activity a and b and there you propose that one resource will be working and two resource uh, uh, for activity b one resource now for the crashing you added more resources so instead of one now you see here the two resources working now for activity b instead of one now three resources I so you basically added more and more resources to activity to finish them faster, right? To finish them faster. So now you have the more people, so they will work more and finish those activity faster from the initial start and finish date. So by doing this, so you haven't changed any logic, you haven't changed any sequencing, but you basically increase your cost because you added more resources, right? So this is one of the drawback for your crash technique and we'll discuss in detail we come, let's let's compare these two techniques and see how better you can utilize those techniques depending upon the your situation in your project because in some cases you may prefer to have fast tracking in some cases you may have preferred to do the crashing technique depending upon uh, what is your project requirement or project goal or support from the management team as well as the project team so fast tracking techniques and crashing technique so in fast tracking techniques basically what it does it basically the activities are performing parallel right they we start doing activity in parallel there's no additional resources employed remember right for the fast tracking we just change the sequence 
and with all those activities the you know with the work in a schedule diagram and we have already seen that right this sequence uh, basically if this was initial plan this basically changed to something like this so we brought this activity at here somewhere start and finish date and this is what basically about your sequence diagram right so this can be done only and only if two activity can be overlap right what it's mean by that it is not possible that all the activity can start in parallel there may be some activities let's say you have to design a car or let's say you know you have to manufacture a prototype for a car now to develop the prototype car you need to have design first right you cannot develop a car right or develop a prototype car and then after that you will develop a design you must have design you must have engineering input and then only this will go to your procurement or manufacturing setup and then you will develop this i know your dream car let's say sorry about that it's not a car it seems like truck <laughs> but anyway <laughs> you got the concept right so uh to apply the fast tracking you need to make sure the activities which you are considering for fast tracking are actually possible to overlap if it's not then you can't do this right and this is one of the restriction now while overlapping these two activities let's say this is activity 1 and this is activity 2 now by overlapping you are making several assumptions here you are assuming that at this point of time they will not require any resources you will not require any additional people and this activity can start in parallel but this may be wrong in actual scenario in actual scenarios it could be wrong right because this to start this activity maybe you need some additional support from the engineering team or some additional vendors or there's some material all those thing need to be analyzed so basically what by assuming this activity as a parallel you are making lot of assumptions a lot of assumptions basically leading to your increasing your risk because your risk is related to your assumption and then again this may lead to a rework and this is what i was mentioning that it, it basically increase the risk to projects because you make several assumptions here while showing this activity starting pal right and mostly the cost remains same at least for the previous assumption if uh, you know the, the assumption we are making that they will be not cost uh, if executed properly but again then it adds risk and then again the risk may get converted into some financial impact which you need to analyze right so this is what about the fast tracking and when you talk about the crashing now crashing is basically sequence activity is not changed so the sequence of let's say a to b which is initially we have this remains same start and finish there is no change there is no parallel uh, starting for the sequencing now what change is that it's require the <coughs> additional resource so you need to add more resources to this activity right and this works only on the critical path so let's say let's say some activity are there which is delayed but they are not on a critical path so even though you add more resources this will not add benefit to you because it is not improving your schedule overall critical path so this is only applied those activity which are on critical path there only you add more resources to improve the overall project schedule right and also this may be you know uh, this may increase the risk again it's a less less compared to the fast tracking but again this has a possibility of risk at least maybe you know uh, one risk is very obvious that it's cost risk right it can increase cost disproportionately or maybe high cost uh, risk is associated with this so that we need to you know uh, consider while uh, utilizing this fast tracking and crashing techniques so some cautions with the corrective actions right so whenever we are proposing any corrective action you must investigate the cause of the delay right so so that basically it will tell you uh you know the what will be the right solution if you are not focusing on the right root cause 
right this is very important to identify the root cause and then work on the right solution if the root cause is not right definitely you know that will lead to I, I, of course you know the incorrect solution and then this incorrect solution will have further cascading impacts on your schedule or maybe an overall project right so it's not just about you know changing the schedule it's all about making the correct uh, action and many cases sometimes you don't need to take any action right you may find that depending on what your analysis even though some activities are delayed maybe it's not on critical path or maybe you have already mitigation plan in action which will basically uh, you know help you to reduce the impact so those things those all things need to be analyzed need to be understood before you recommend any corrective action that is very important right remember the purpose of corrective action to solve the problem not create another new problem uh, and, and then again that will be the worst uh, uh, impact or the bad impact for your project right so none of the uh, very common thing you assume some wrong assumptions while working on the project you didn't consider the project environment which is changed by internal factor external factors those kind of things maybe some uh, you know the political or some geotechnical situation or geographical situation which is uh, playing in especially on you know multinational projects uh, you need to consider all those uh, things while you know working on a project so make sure you consider all those key factors and by you know recommending those corrective solutions and and there is no harm you know uh, when you realize that there is no point or there is no need of having any uh, corrective action to put in place well i think it's it's very obvious the benefit of project scheduling but just for the sake of completion of this project so let me discuss key benefit of you know project scheduling and project management so first thing it's assess with tracking reporting and communicating the progress this is very important about the schedule so you need to continuously track it right and then report it and then make sure all the key stakeholders are aware and you need to communicate this information then make sure everyone is ensures the schedule basically ensures that all the stakeholders remember when we are working on a project there are several functions involved right and each function should know what are the activities which is going on in your project what are the activity on time which activities are related to their function which is related to their respect to other functions and what are their obligations and where they are lying in current status this is what basically helps you the project scheduling helps you to do it in a better way in efficient way in terms of you know the all the tasks dependency and deadlines right everyone every functions know what are their deadline what is what up to which day they are supposed to finish their work and then it's also highlight the issues and concerns so when you do the project scheduling overall from start to the finish of any project it's basically give you the overall overview of the project schedule and then you can easily find out what are the issues and concerns like lack of resources tools everything then you can find out and highlight it to the concern management or the stakeholders then it's help you to identify the relationship relationship basically means logics of the each activity basically which activity when should start and before starting this activity what are the other activity which should be finished so all those activities relationships are basically easily identified in this schedule and that's why the project scheduling is important for project management and of course then it's monitor the progress and identify i know issues early right it has possibility of early warning that's the key word right so early warning is very important in any project management organization because it's give you the indication what could go wrong and the project team the project management team can prepare in advance right and that's why it's very important to have these early indications of issues so as you seen earlier right the schedule management of a project right schedule management of a project is basically involves 
seven steps right so it's a very complex and time taking right it's not very uh, you know easy process and it's really required a lot of time effort and of course you know it's definitely will need lots of resources to do this to do this the schedule uh, management of a project so definitely in this process the role of your scheduling tool and software has become very critical because these tools and software basically drive your efficiency right efficiency in terms of defining activity identifying activity sequencing them estimating those durations and then resource management so those all things can be you know done very efficiently through the softwares and tools right there are a lot of tools are available in the market for scheduling depending upon the size of the project type of the project you can choose uh, you know uh, those tools and software to deploy on your project and basically drive the efficiency uh, of your schedule management process so if you talk about the uh, you know the schedules and tools so now in terms of digital era the online scheduling tools are getting more and more famous or more and more you know the efficient or well known or well accepted among uh, all the project management community and there are several specific reasons for that you know having online scheduling tool first thing is provide the project manager to make a data driven time management decision and resource management and it is available online so what it happens at any point of time project management can go and have the access of this data and make decision quickly right so basically it helps the project manager to see where is the bottleneck right and also it helps other team member at the same time not only project manager but all the team member in fact all the stakeholders all the stakeholders know at the same time what is your problem where is the problem lying and so that they can quickly decide or relocation of resources or deploying some corrective actions those kind of things can be done very quickly and efficiently right this is the key here or the key benefit of having uh, okay efficiently sorry about my handwriting so basically it's uh, quickly and efficiently give you the solutions having an online uh, scheduling tool then also you know remember when you have the data we have the tool online scheduling software it basically includes both team and manager so it's basically break the silo and it, it's bring uh, it's bring a platform it's, it's basically brings a platform where team and manager collaboratively work together at the same platform right and again it helps you to manage the resource and budget at the same place also it help you to build the detailed plan of your project online in a real time basis also you can view all the work and project calendar at the same time you know an online while team is working on the project schedule you can see what are the task lists what is your progress what are those calendar what are the key details and also it's very easy to update to the stakeholder because stakeholders can also see what are the current status of the project at any point of time or whenever they want right and then again you know it's provide a collaborative work environment and again you can manage all those start and end date not only you but as your project manager team every team member can do that of course you know you manage the workload and relocation of the work performance in real time very key here so having online tool right online tool basically basically gives you a performance a real time view of the performance or let's say the project progress right okay and then of course you know drag and drop scheduling you can do that in uh, of course online as well as you know the offsite uh, 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 tool also but again having it on online tool or real time tool uh, this really helps or uh, basically add to the efficiency uh, of your working So the key thing for schedule 
management is achieving deadline is directly related to the success or let's say the project success right and it has basically the three component one is your planning and then management management and basically organizing and executing as it is planned and then control right so if you focus on this three element this will basically help you to achieve all your deadlines whether it's final right start and finish or phase wise uh, you know uh, dates so idea is that to meet those deadlines and this basically means the project success which means that you are delivering the deliverable as you expect it on time to the client right so this is a summary or you can say the gist of your schedule management so quick summary plan schedule management that we have discussed is a defined as a process of establishing the policy procedure documentation planning developing all those things you know managing executing uh, to basically look after your project schedule define activity it's a process of identifying clarifying defining the key schedule activity which need to be performed which need to be performed to produce deliverables right and then you have the sequence activities right which are in the activities in a logical order based on their dependency and then you have the estimate activity resources this estimate the how much or how many type of resources basically the people material equipment and supplies which you need to identify for the estimates of those activity resources then the activity durations right the process of estimating the schedule activity durations you need to you know, identify what are those durations of the activities So once you identify your scope, right, you know what's your time, then the very obvious question is what will be your cost, right? So remember, you know, any project which has triple constraint, which is your scope, then your time, and then your cost. So these are, I will say, the three pillar of any project. So we have learned about the scope management. We have learned about the time management. Now let's learn about the cost. And this is one of the most critical element, right? Because at the end of the day, everything comes down to dollar, right? And this is what is being managed through the cost management. So let's discuss this cost management process in detail and understand how we actually manage the cost of a project in a professional way. So, so far we have learned about uh, scope, right? And then we have learned about the time. And then there is another critical important step which we are going to learn in this chapter, right? So, we have learned about the PM trend, right? or also we call it iron triangle so a pm triangle is basically nothing but it's consists of scope right another one is time and the next key critical factor is your cost right and this is the third pillar of uh, you can say the project management so basically what happens anything whatever happens on your project it's all boils down to this thing the dollar value so everything boils down to money right so remember projects are done to make business or to grow the business or to be talking a very plain term to make uh, profit for the company right and to ensure the projects are making profit right to ensure the projects are making profit, you need to utilize cost management process, right? This is what the main purpose of this whole uh, knowledge area is to make or to basically, you know, create a profit for the company, right? And this is what we are going to learn in this chapter and understand how the costs are managed throughout the project, what are the full life cycle of the cost management and what are the key things which we should be keeping in mind and so that you can perform better or you can have the better management of your overall project in all aspects, including your cost.
So coming to the cost management, the cost management process. So basically, if you talk in terms of definition, right? So it's a process of estimating, budgeting, and controlling. Remember, these are the three key elements. So you have to estimate the cost according to cost. You need to provide the budget to the project, and then make sure you know those budgets are met. And if there's any change on budget, you need to continuously monitor throughout the project life cycle. So with this objective, keeping in mind, you know, cost actually lead to the approval of budget. So first you have the cost est estimation. Based on that estimation, you basically approve the budget, which further utilized by the project team, right? Project team utilizes this budget to complete the project work and try to, you know, minimize that uh, budget requirement or let's say minimize the cost. Right. And this is what the whole, uh, uh, the one of the key target of any cost management process is, right? So remember, any project, the success of any project will depend upon whether they deliver the requirement or scope. This basically means what are the exact requirement, or what was the exact expectation from the client, whether that is met or not in terms of deliverable, whether what was defined deliverable as completed by the project or not that's the first criteria for the success second one is whatever you have delivered whatever scope you have completed whether those scope has met the quality standard right remember it's not just about delivering the product to the client you need to deliver the product with certain quality requirement right there is a called quality requirement attached to the each deliverable and you need to make sure you are meeting that quality standard. That is your second criteria. Third criteria, of course, all those things has to be completed within the schedule because if not completed on the schedule, that will lead to you know further implications. So remember, any delay is basically terms or uh, turn out to be a cost impact, right? Or in financial loss to the client. So that's why it has to be be on time within schedule and then completed within the budget remember it means basically whatever cost you have started right whatever cost you have planned initially you aim is to your aim is to complete the project in the same cost or less than that cost by doing so then only you can ensure the company's profit while doing that project right so these are the three criteria one is we meeting the scope Another one is your the scope has to be completed as per required quality. And then, of course, this all has to be done in the given timeline with minimum cost or at least not more than the cost, which is initially assumed for the budget allocation. So cost management is one of the key criteria. Remember, profit is nothing but completing the project right completing the project within estimated cost or let's say estimated budget right so we will be learning about all those you know the whole process customization and uh, the budgeting and then what are those elements area so in terms this is what exactly it's mean by the project cost management and to define the success of any project these are the criteria out of which cost is a one of the key factor which will decide the success of your project i think in in terms of uh, the basic concept it is clear what exactly the cost management is uh, we have already discussed in the previous slide so it is basically if we uh, want me to you know define in another simple term or maybe very broad term you can say which uh, basically encompass whatever we have learned in previous slide so it's a process of planning and controlling the cost, right? It's simply you plan the cost. There are uh, several steps we'll be discussing later. What exactly this mean by plan? And then controlling there are certain attribute to the control the cost. What are the things we need to look while we controlling the cost? So in very you know uh, brief term, it is basically planning and controlling of the cost associated with let's say running a business or let's say for your project in case you were you know just talking about the project so whatever cost is involved in a project how you are planning that cost and then how you are controlling to ensure the cost is minimized right this is what your main objective is to minimize 
the cost and how you're doing it you're doing it through controlling so this is basically nothing but planning and controlling of the cost with I know all the costs related to your project okay so how you do that actually you basically collect some information right information related to the cost or the factor which impact those costs you collect those kind of information you analyze those information then you report those information it's very important right you need to collect it analyze it and report it so these all these are the critical chain or critical step of the cost management process and this is how you control the overall cost management we will uh, discuss this in detail but this basically includes three critical you know uh, activity collecting analyzing and reporting what cost information from the various functions various uh, you know sources and accordingly you forecast the budget requirement whether it is under budget or over budget and uh, you know it's become a part of your monitoring so this is how uh, you know you are basically doing the cost management through collection analyzing and then reporting so overall if you talk about the overall uh, cost management process so it's not easy it's it's yes it's a complex process right and there are certain elements you need to understand to have a fully control or fully uh, full knowledge of the cost management but it's very much critical area in fact i would say in business environment this is the most critical right most critical uh, factor for any business right in fact this cost management will decide the fate of the project so based on you know uh, uh, let's say the based on your cost or the estimated loss or let's say you are making some your project is over budget or under budget this will basically decide the fate of your project right basis on this project process management you can decide whether you continue with project or not so that's why it's become the most critical area of any project management process right and then it can be broken down into you know, several areas so cost management is not just one single uh, i will say the process it's a basically summation of sub process and one of the areas is like resource planning how you plan your resource which include your labor costs material costs other utility costs fixed and overhead all those things costing you to plan it then of course there has to be some good or let's say the accurate estimation which basically tells that what will be your cost then according based on cost you need to make your budget estimation what should budget you allow and then once the project start right then you basically allocate the budget let's say this is your timeline start uh, and then finish right then during this timeline you allocate the budget here this is the point you allocate the budget then you need to continuously monitor throughout the start and finish so make sure you know you're controlling it monitoring it and making sure the budget you have allocated or the budget the cost you have planned throughout the project is aligned with your initial plan and if there's any variation you need to identify it and think how to mitigate that so this is what exactly cost management means. There are certain critical element of the cost management we will be discussing in later slides. So uh, before going deep into the cost management, right? Before going into deep cost management, let's first understand what is a cost, right? What is the key element of a cost? What do you mean by cost? right so let, let's understand those part uh, so cost is basically nothing but all spendings right all spendings which you are supposed to do on project all spending on projects is nothing but your cost right in very simple term but when we discuss about the professional project management or professional let's say cost management there are certain type of defined cost which we should be doing that right so this include you know various kind of costs like direct indirect but from the project management point of view the project manager need to basically you know track the cost and ensure there is no budget overrun he need to look at these five type of costs right so one is your direct cost another one is indirect cost this one is fixed cost variable cost and sunk cost so at any point of time Project manager need to 
understand what are these cost elements and you know maybe in some cases not all of them are present in depending upon type of project and situation of the project but of course project manager need to continuously monitor and understand which of these elements are actually impacting the overall cost or let's say the overall budget of your project right this is what project manager has to do by looking at the different you know cost categories right so let's understand what are these different cost categories and then we will uh, jump back to the overall cost management process okay so first type of cost direct cost right so as it says it's a direct cost and uh, it should be clear right so it's basically linked to all the work which we are doing on the project which is directly related to the project activity right i would say the project activities all the uh, cost related to the project activity is called as a direct cost right what are the type of the cost so these are the you know well this is one of the very common and majority of the cost if you see on your any organization usually come through direct cost right and this is basically associated with let's say you are doing some production our production project is nothing but you know the production of a product or unique services so when you are doing or producing those product or rendering those services what is your direct cost involved associated by that project is basically you know uh, derive or tell you that this number what is your direct cost right if you want to find out at any point of time what is my direct cost you need to basically look into those elements which is directly contributing to our the, uh, you know the spending so what are those examples first example let's say some raw material right let's say you're developing a prototype of car and you need some raw material in terms of steel tire you know so many things could be there this is all becomes your direct cost right then the labor cost directly you know you you will be required labor uh, several kind of labor including engineers technicians those kind of things they become the part of your direct labor cost right then of course there will be uh, um, situation where you need to deliver the product or you need to transport the product to a several location or different location that's become your direct cost right so these are the type of costs or so similar costs are basically included in your direct cost section and this is what we call in a direct cost category now let's say some specific example let's say you are a manufacturer of a car company right uh, and then so your raw material cost will be basically your metals right or let's say the steel which is required to do the body of uh, to you know create the body of the car or the materials like wages of the employee technician engineers who make those cars this kind of cost will be directly you know this will be the direct cost for producing this car by the way this is wonderful car i don't know what company it is but it's awesome car if you guys if any anyone knows you know what was the name of this car please let me know in the comment section okay uh, so and also you know direct cost is basically going to include hiring a specialized contractor maybe you need to buy some software commissioning all those things you know testing is becomes a part of direct cost so direct cost is simply all those uh, material labor so, or let's say any other uh, important elements which is required to directly produce the product the final product is basically you know lead to your direct material or that's a direct cost right hope that's clear uh let's move to the next type of cost so the very next cost is your indirect cost right so these costs are not directly related to the production of your uh, the product but without those costs you cannot produce the you know the final product right so they are not directly linked to the project let's say if you're doing some project and uh, they are not directly linked to uh, your project but to overall complete a project you will need you know uh, to do the overall business you will need those kind of costs 
So indirect costs are expenses that company still has to pay that are directly related to your production or that you know directly related to your project, even though company has to pay, right? Like let's say the heating, lighting, or office space area. So suppose you have the office here, office building, and from where you are managing the project. And if you don't have the office, right, then definitely you know uh, you won't be able to manage the project efficiently and uh, probably you know that will lead or uh, that will basically lead to delay or any kind of uh, hindrance which will not let you to produce that services or render that services or pro render uh, produce that product so even though you know for producing this product this is not directly this building is not directly being a part of this product or contributing anything but since the project is managed by its building so this building is indirectly actually uh, helping them or ensuring this project is complete or the product is delivered as per the project. So this is what it means by the indirect cost, right? So indirect cost, let's say for manufacturing car would be including electricity, right? So let's say you have to manufacture this car. Now to manufacture this car, you will need several tools which runs on electricity, okay? Maybe you will need some, uh, you know, uh, jackhammer or some different kind of tools there could be you know, several tools which can utilize to make this car but that tool will not become the part of this car right but even though without that tool you cannot make this car so this kind of costs are basically known as indirect costs right that's why they, they call it indirect costs because they don't get form or get part of or uh, become the part of your final product but without those, uh, you know, the cost, without those services, you cannot complete the product, right? Or complete the project. So those kind of costs are basically known as indirect costs. Okay. Now, these, mm, you know, costs, again, you cannot completely remove this kind of cost. So you need to identify as a project manager, you need to completely, you know, be aware of what are those indirect costs are there and how they are impacting your overall project budget, right? And you need to basically to uh, control it, you need to identify it, to identify it, you need to know what kind of cost element your total project budget or total project cost is having, right? Next cost category is your fixed cost, right? So we have previously learned your direct cost, right? And then indirect cost, okay? So these are the two cost categories we have already learned. Now the third category is your fixed cost. Now fixed cost is those kind of costs. They are charged at once, right? They are not repetitive in nature, but they are charged at once and they don't vary all over the project duration, right? They are not linked to the progress of the project. They are not at the variable rate, let's say per hour or per unit, uh, per unit or based on some specific rate they are the fixed one the fixed cost so either you do a project for one hour two hour one year or three year they will be always there the fixed cost will be you know for this uh, this duration or this duration or for years it's gonna be same so those kind of costs are basically called as fixed costs right and they do not vary with over the time they do not change on our output, so it doesn't depend upon, you know, uh, the output itself, the final outcome. So whether you have the output or no output, the fixed cost will be fixed and it is still there, whether you are able to produce output or not, or some different kind of output. So this is, uh, you know, one of the easiest costs to work out, or uh, like say, whenever you're doing the estimation, you can easily estimate this fixed cost. So let's say company has to spend on renting a building, right? So even though company is like, you know, uh, produce like 10 times over the product it usually does, it cost of rent won't change, right? Because let's say you have, you have the company uh, car manufacturing or com car uh, product company. So if you're um, producing 100 car, maybe let's say one month, maybe in next month you're producing 200 car or let's say the three third month you're having 500 car so even though you produce different number of car in different month 
you rent for the facility let's say you have rented a facility to store these uh, product or th those cars so the rent will be constant throughout the year so this rent is basically nothing but your fixed cars right so it doesn't depend upon the number of cars or maybe if you have produced different type of car it won't affect uh, your rent and that's become one of the type of the cost which is fixed cost fixed cost and which is again one of the critical element of your overall project cost next cost type is your variable cost right so we have learned about direct cost right indirect cost and then we have learned about the fixed cost and now we are going to learn variable cost right now variable cost is opposite to the fix the change because you know over the duration uh, let's say you have the project duration is four years then throughout the four years your variable cost will be keep on changing you know they will keep on changing depending upon the duration so these type of business expense are actually difficult to estimate because they varies over the production there are several factors those uh, factors impact those kind of cost and you need to have a very closer look on this kind of cost category right so let's say you have the production or let's say your scope project scope is increased right which will basically directly to increase in your variable cost or let's say you have reduced your project scope or let's say client has decreased uh, some of the scope from the project which will directly lead to the decrease of your project cost so this is directly depending upon the scope or let's say the production you are having and depending upon the situation you need to monitor what is the impact on your variable cost is right and these variable cost could be a direct cost I mean, like you know the labor cost it could be material cost also depending upon you know uh, the sc if scope is decreased probably you need to acquire less material less uh, quantity of material from uh, to do, do the work and that will lead to decrease in your cost right so and and it's very easy to understand right let's say you have uh, you know you have to pay the salary to the staff so if you want to pay the salary uh, you know uh, over the 12 month or a six month so the always paying the salary over six month is easier than the 12 month remember because there is a longer duration and in longer duration there is lot of other factors like inflation company's profit market situation all those things will come into factor which will directly put pressure right and you will definitely find a difficulty to pay uh, your staff salary uh, over a long duration rather than the shorter duration right and similarly happens for your you know let's say if you want to hire some machine so if you hire a machine over eight weeks right uh, which will be obviously more costly than if you hire a machine for three weeks okay and that's one more you know example if we take uh, we you know sales commission is also kind of variable cost so remember let's say you have hired a salesperson who is basically working on based on the sales commission so if there is increase in number of sales by the salesperson that will basically lead to increase in your commission right this will lead to the increase in commission of the particular uh, salesperson and depending upon the sale increase you need to pay the commission but if there is a drop in the sales this will basically lead to drop in your commission cost right so this is how what we you know define a variable cost and this is what the concept behind the variable cost and the main uh, element here is that variability over period of time so there's a variation uh, over the it's not like fixed cost which is fixed throughout the time independent of the change in time this cost will vary over the time and you need to continuously or closely monitor this kind of cost right because they depend upon external factors which varies over the period of time and sometimes this can bring a very big change or sudden change in your project cost and that can you know jeopardize your whole project itself so your fifth cost type is your sunk cost right and this cost is something which is already incurred you need to you know uh, worried about or uh, you need to understand this cost well not in much detail but you should be not much worried about in terms of you know, making decisions so what happens that any type of cost right 
any part of cause which is already previously incurred or happened right uh, this is basically known as sunk cost so basically cost incurred in history you can call it you know cost incurred in past cost incurred in past or let me put another term is historical cost right historical cost are basically your sunk cost right and why this is important because usually they are forgetting business case so let's say whenever you're making some business decision you need to you know you won't make the design deciding factor some cost when while making any decision for any business case you should be always aware of how much cost is already uh, you know uh, sunk or let's say already spent for a particular business case or business idea right so these kind of costs are historic like we discussed this is in the past and cannot be reclaimed they cannot you cannot go and again reclaim back this cost because this is some cost already spent there is no way you can recover it right so in making the business decision you don't take directly this sunk cost but always keep in mind right you know uh, what kind of cost is actually incurred to for making any future business decision right you don't have to consider in your numbers but of course you need to be aware of what is your sunk cost right remember because this business cannot make this decision but you need to make sure that the decision you are making for future also you know uh, should be uh, you, you should you utilize those lesson learned from the sunk cost and make sure you're making you know better uh, decision to have profitable uh, business instead of you know making loss right so let's take an example of the sunk cost the sunk cost let's say a manufacturing company has spent 10,000 euro on a new equipment right let's say they need some new kind of robotic arm some machine they need and they spent on this on their manufacturing line now this is new equipment is kind of sunk cost right because it is not directly being part of the particular product being manufactured but it is already utilized right and then this will not uh, you know directly help or directly become the part of the product cost but what it will do by utilizing this new equipment company is able to make better equipment or improve their efficiency let's say it's increase their profit so by spending this money even though this is a sunk cost you can you know your business is making profit because now you are able to make more cars sell more cars which is basically giving you profit right so that's why you know when you make a decision for future you don't consider the sunk cost but you should be aware of you know uh, how that sunk cost could benefit for the future decision right but when just on base of some cost you don't make any uh, reason right because it doesn't mean that you know some idea which is already where you have spent uh, some money that will not lead to profit or may not lead to you know or may not turn out positive in future okay then you know now what are the cost uh, or what is a cost and its type so you know very well type of the cost right and what is cost or I mean, what do you exactly mean by cost so now let's understand the overall cost management process when we are doing a project how do we actually manage the project cost what are the previous processes where we need to look into it and in case if you run into trouble how to manage those costs how to control this cost and try to reduce the negative impact or the increase of the budget so in terms of process if you ask me you know overall cost management process so basically it's a four step uh, four steps or we'll say the four sub processes are there in a cost management and those are basically these one one is your plan cost management like for others uh, you know uh, the management process 
all maintenance process start with your planning so you need to first plan your cost management right and then you need to do the estimation you need to estimate all your costs based upon the scope of your work you need to determine what will be the cost of each scope of work or the let's say the wbs or work packages then based on that estimated cost you need to determine what will be the budget requirement remember you know your cost is not equal to budget right there is a, a difference between these two terms you will be uh, understanding what is those cost uh, but in briefly if you say cost is the total spending right the cost is a total uh, because cost is an estimation of spending right and this estimation is basically based on what your available information let's say the material information or uh, boq information is there then your design information is there so those kind of information is available which is basically giving you the estimate and based on the estimate you arrive at what each wbs what will be the cost for the wbs right now the problem is that the estimations are estimations they are not something the fixed line they may change over the period so there you need to do some adjustment you know some some buffer you need to add some kind of uh, you know uh, assessment you do in terms of the risk or some escalation could be there so by adding all those factor in the cost you arrive at some budget right it's not directly the cost this is cost plus some adjustment which will give you the budget and this is what it's mean by determining the budget so once we have the cost you do some adjustment based on the you know various knowledge market factor or experience then you basically allocate the budget for each wbs right and there may be cases right where uh, your estimation is very good you have very detailed information and in those cases your cost will be simply whatever is your budget uh, your budget will be simply equal to your cost but there are cases where you don't have the that much of detail and you need to require uh, you know some buffering or some adjustment so that you don't need additional budget when the project is getting executed so that what process is called your determined budget so once you determine your budget you basically allocate this budget to the project right and then start controlling the cost so once your project is started you allocate this budget at this point this is the start point right and then this is the finish point so you start monitoring this process monitor and control of the cost right this is what is mean and this is what we are going to learn over all the process but if we talk in terms of summary so it is four step process right the cost management is four step process which include your plan cost management estimate cost determine the budget then control the cost this is what four step is so let's understand this each sub process each sub step in detail so the very first process is your plan cost management so any process you start you need to do the planning right before starting any process and this is what is all about so it's basically establish the policies procedure documentation for planning managing and expanding and then controlling the cost this is basically tells you how you will plan everything in terms of you know from where you gather the information what are your policies what is your company processes what are the procedure which is set already by the company to follow while managing those project how what are the cost element which your company wants to focus on so all those kind of thing what kind of a report or documentation will be needed this all thing you need to plan initially even before you know starting all those details steps and this is what is all about your plan cost management so like every process uh, it has some kind of input some kind of you know uh, the processing internal processing in terms of tools and techniques and then there are some goals or output you will be having so similarly for plan cost management this is your input output system in input you will be need these kind of uh, the documents then there is some tools and techniques which you will be utilized to analyze those information and then you arrive at some kind of output right and remember this is four step process 
this four step process and we are discussing first step that is your plan cost management right so if we talk in terms of input output so what kind of input this process require so this process basically require your project management plan your project charter enterprise environment factor and their organization processes so these are the four key inf information which uh, this step will require and you need to basically provide this information or gather this information from the various sources or the project uh, team and then utilize some tools and techniques right some tools and techniques you need to utilize what are those tools and techniques one is expert judgment analytical technique there are several and uh, analytical techniques we will be discussing later on what are those things have a meeting with stakeholders basically to discuss how you will be basically doing the overall cost management of any project from start to finish right this is what we are going to do and this is what exactly it's mean uh, when you say uh, you know the plan cost management so by taking this information utilizing this tool you basically arrive at some sort of output and the output for this process is basically cost management plan this is what the document we name it as this is basically a document name or let's say uh, some sort of guide which tells you how you will be managing your overall cost and this is what it's mean by that cost management plan right this is the output for this process so once you plan that your overall cost management now the very next step is your estimate the cost right this is where you start estimating your cost remember you have the project you break down the project into various wbs right and these wbs are further break it down into let's say work packages and you need to you know these work packages are basically broken down into activities right and these activities you know you can calculate based on various uh, the estimate the cost of these activities. So this is how you need to break it down and then estimate the, uh, each cost. So this is what is, this process is all about. So this is process mm, is basically related to your cost estimation of each activity or work package. And if you talk in terms of process, this is a process of developing, you know, the approximation of the cost of resources. So what you will do when you say, you know, you estimate the activity cost you have to basically find out what is the total resource required right the total resource resource required for the activity right this is what you need to find out and then this resource could be your labor right could be material it could be some uh, you know the services right and those kind of everything every resource which needs money has to be identified and then accordingly you need to calculate those uh, estimate the cost of those resources so uh, estimating the cost again it's a uh, one of the sub process of the overall cost management remember we have four step one is plan cost management Another one is estimate cost, which is what we are going to discuss now. Then we have these two determined by the total cost. So coming back to the sub process, estimate cost. Again, like we discussed in previous uh, sub process, it is also requires some sort of input, or uh, let's say some information, right? And then again, by taking this information, we will utilize some tools and let's say some techniques. Right, and then by utilizing this information plus these tools and techniques, we will be arriving at some goal or some output. Right. So, what are the information or what are the input for this process? Well, one is your scope baseline. What will be total scope baseline as per your contract? Right. What is we have signed or agreed with the client? We need to find out that scope. We need to know the what is your schedule. We need to do the risk raiser, what are the risk estimated, what are, what kind of risk uh, the project team sees while doing those projects. Then you need to have the cost management plan, which we discussed in previous section. Then you need to have the human resource. Remember, you know, one of the key factor because every project require people, require process, they require tool, and the human resource is the thing through which you manage those uh, 
the people right and then of course you will need the uh, environmental factors uh, for the enterprise and then you will need you know uh, the organization process asset so these are the information which you need to gather which you need to you know take from the documents from the various project stakeholder and then utilize some tools and techniques now estimation tools and techniques there are a lot of techniques are available and these are the very key uh, you know uh, the tools I'm mentioning here it's a vast area there are a lot of uh, tools and softwares are available thousands of techniques are available to do the estimation that will depend upon the type of projects type of the industry I'm not going to you know that much detail but from the project point of view and the majority of projects you will find these are the tools utilized so one is expert judgment of course you always reach out to the subject matter expert and understand you know what would be the cause because they have better experience or more experience uh, um, on the particular project they are the experienced personal and they must be knowing you know what should be the cost may not be the exact one but may, but they must know what will be the range of those cost then we have the analogous estimating technique we will discuss in detail we have parametric estimating techniques then we have the bottom-up estimation then three-point estimation then of course uh, we will have the other technique like reserve analysis uh, cost of quality is one of the techniques which we will be utilizing and then uh, you know bid analysis then of course group discussion so we will be discussing you know, some of these uh, key techniques which is mostly used in majority of the project uh, and then we'll explain later on but from this point of the process point of view for this step the estimation cost step is like this so these are the input which you will be taking in or the information which you will be gathering in and then utilizing these kind of estimation tools and then you will arrive at some sort of output and uh, we talk in terms of output so these are the output is expected through this process so one is your activity cost estimate you need to find out each activity's cost or let's say the WBS cost what will be the cost of each WBS basis of estimates very important so whenever you are estimating a cost you make some assumption right you make some rates assumption you make some labor availability you make some time assumption those assumption has to be noted down against each cost estimate so that at later point of time if any of this assumption is changed you can find out where the change happened and how to mitigate that right and then of course depending upon these uh, the analysis or this study or this estimation process there may be requirement of updating your project document which you previously created and then you go and update those document right so remember those are the two key output one is your cost of the activity itself estimates and then the basis of estimate these are the key output which you need to produce in this sub process right so let's understand the cost estimation right so we have discussed several techniques in previous uh, slide right so what exactly the cost estimation is right so when you say the estimation it's very obvious right you estimate something you don't need to be 100% accurate right but there may be some plus minus uh, uh, you know uh, uh, plus minus delta or let's say some variations uh, with this you can you know uh, do the estimation right uh, your estimation are not 100 percent always not 100 percent there is some plus minus uh, variation in this estimation and that's why we call it estimate right so what are the various estimation methods are available so if you see there are you know expert judgment three-point estimate comparative estimate parametric estimate bottom estimate now why we are pointing it in an increasing upward direction so there's a reason for that so when you do any estimation right an estimation can be done on various basis it could be based on your some assumption you could be based on the previous knowledge which you have some sort of perception or some experience or some fact itself right you can make those estimation now depending upon the information you have the type of information you have in your hand your estimates accuracy will vary right so let's say some some perception you are having and you try to do some estimations of course it will be very quick but then it will be dirty dirty means it will not be accurate it will be very le or less accurate 
or may be inaccurate also. Even though you estimate it based on some perception or some assumption, but that may be wrong, right? And this is what, you know, that's why we, you, remember, you know, we have the expert judgment as one of the technique, tool technique for estimation, but this is very, uh, you know, crude form of estimation or very initial estimate or very primary estimate, which gives you some sort of rough idea whenever you are, you know, uh, discussing any idea for implementation. Uh, for those purpose and that's why it is mentioned as expert judgment first one because it will be have low accuracy it will be like dirty you can say that dirty basically means here low accuracy okay low accuracy and of course it will be based on some perception or let's say some experience or some assumptions right which may not be correct and that's why we call the expert judgment as low accuracy and based on this one. Now, if you move up, right, so first come in three point estimate. So next most accurate after expert judgment is a three point estimate. So it, even though it will be have accuracy, it will be based on some fact or some you know previous historical data, but it will be more accurate than your this method. Then if you further move up, we have the comparative cost estimate. This will be further, you know, more accurate with higher accuracy and higher detail. And again, you know, it will be utilizing more factual information rather than just perception. Then we move to the next method. This is a parametric estimation. Again, this will require more further detailed information in terms of fact, in terms of details of your scope. And of course, once you have the more detailed information, this will basically lead to higher accuracy, right? This will lead to higher accuracy of your uh, estimate. And then bottom of estimate, these are the most accurate estimate you can ever get. But these are the most time consuming and also this resource consuming. So bottom is if you want to do the highest, most accurate estimate, you always go for bottom of estimate, right? But depending upon the, how much time you have, how much accuracy you want, you can decide, you know, which uh, technique is suitable uh, to you. But if you want more accurate, then you have to go for bottom estimate. Or if you want very quick and just and rough an idea, you can go for expert judgment technique, right? So this is what the philosophy behind, you know, the choosing the technique, right? You cannot always, uh, you know, go choosing the, and let's say the techniques. Or let's say the estimation technique, right? This is the philosophy behind the choosing the right estimation techniques. So, and and of course, you know we it's not like that we never use expert judgment or we never use the bottom of, uh, of estimate. It depends upon what kind of situation you are. Let's say you quickly want to find some rough idea, you will immediately go to some expert and you know get some idea of the cost indication. But let's say you are planning a project, your project is approved and you need to do the budgeting, then of course you need to go to the bottom est up estimate so that you have a very accurate understanding of the cost. Or let's say you're signing a contract with uh, some client and you cannot you know, go on rough estimation. You have to have the very accurate estimation probably then you will utilize this technique to arrive at your project cost, right? and then based on that you can sign your contract or start working so depending upon the type of situation you can decide which technique is suitable for your condition so now coming back to the techniques itself right so we have discussed we have expert judgment analogous estimating parametric estimation bottom up estimation three point estimation then of course you can do the direct data analysis. There are some project management information systems are there. Some direct decision making, you know, AI is actually taking lead here based on a certain information. They can provide very good, uh, you know, uh, I would not say 100% accurate, but they can assist you here. Well, we can discuss in detail later on, maybe in some other slide. But if you talk in terms of major estimation techniques, so these are the techniques which are majorly used. Right, and let's understand these techniques in detail in next slides. So, in project management, basically, we utilize these four kind of uh, techniques, like estimation techniques: one is analogous, parametric, bottom-up, and three-point estimation. 
these are the estimation technique which utilize which is utilized mainly for project management and we will be discussing about these uh, four major cost estimation technique right and remember any cost estimate that depend upon number of factors right uh, it depends upon the number you know type of organization you are what kind of organization expectations are there whether this project is actually approved or uh, is organization serious about doing the project or is it just you know they are evaluating or weighing up some options there you need to you know understand all those factors while doing any cost estimate right also there will be certain specific policies uh, which is you know gu or guideline is given by any organization or any company how under which condition what kind of cost estimate you are supposed to do right and of course you know it will depend upon the expertise of the project team so in, in any case if you do have a bottom of estimation you need your expertise uh, who can you know work out those costs and in case if you want some rough estimation you can always go for you know the subject matter expert opinion but again if you want to do a detailed cost let's say for the project execution purpose uh, probably you will you know go and ask this whole uh, the project team the responsible team to have a bottom of estimation to do the accurate costing right then like i mentioned right it it depends upon your uh, company's environment or organization's environment what kind of expectation they have in terms of cost estimation right sometimes uh, you know um, organization don't want detail uh, cost or detail estimate they will they are okay with the rough estimate so probably you know they will ask you to provide the rough estimate instead of going into the detail estimates because remember doing a detail right doing a detailed cost estimation is not easy task right it's require a lot of efforts a lot of efforts so when i say lot of effort it means it's require money right is require money to do the accurate costing and that will depend upon the organization how much money or you know organization how much money they want to spend on this right so that's why i was saying that it will depend upon your organization policy some people are okay with rough estimate depending upon and some people will already ask you for exact estimate so coming to our first technique that is analogous estimation technique right and this calculate the expected cost of the project based on the known associated cost with a similar project so what they will do they will find out what kind of project it is right it depend upon the kind of projects right and whether the similar project is done in past right so they will take the information for those past project utilize the information and then try to you know compare it with the current uh, project and understand what will be the cost right so this matter is mainly uh, you know depend upon what kind of historical data or the expert judgment you have that will be this this will be the two critical factors your historical information right historical project information of similar type of project right that's very important you cannot utilize some different uh, you know the project information and um, do the estimation for different others so those has to be the similar projects it is very important and second thing you need to have the good expertise good expertise of project manager or maybe some another you know the expertise who can actually provide you that information right so make sure you know you have these two critical information available whenever you are following this analogous estimation technique right and these kind of techniques these kind of you know, techniques or analogous estimation are used when at which stage normally at the very early stage where you need some rough estimation or some kind of rough idea uh, to even you know think about pursue the project seriously normally you know this is utilized at the early stage of early stage of projects 
size. So this is this technique is utilized for at uh, very beginning of the project, right? And also this can be utilized where you have the very little information about the current project. So like I mentioned at the very start of the project, let's say the project is start or let's say before you start, you are just evaluating or maybe bidding or tendering, right? Or even thinking uh, to do a project. This is the time where you are utilizing analogous. Right, this is the time you utilizing analogous technique because at this point of time you have the less information or the less detail of your project, right? And that's why you utilize analogous techniques to have a quick uh, estimation. It may not be 100% correct, but it will give you some sort of idea what to do with the project, right? So the next technique is your parametric estimation technique. Now again, this will be depend. This will depend upon historical data plus some statistical model, right? So what this method do? It takes some previous data, right? Uh, whatever you have, or let's say the historical data. Whatever the historical data you are having, it utilize that data plus it makes a model, right? It utilize that model. It key in those information in some mathematical model right and run those model to arrive at cost estimates right this is how it work uh, the parametric cost estimation so it depends upon you know the unit cost of a particular component it will take the unit cost from the historical uh, historical data and utilize those and then key into the project new project and do approximation of the cost right and remember it is more accurate than analogous because it's a kind of simulation which takes on the various external factors and historical data so that's why it's tendency to have the more accurate estimation and and of course you know it's required the initial data to have the accurately cost estimation right so initial data means nothing but your historical data so it will depend upon the quality of your historical data so if historical data are accurate this more likely you will get the more accurate estimation through this model right and these kind of models are mainly used in construction or let's say very often they are used in construction but because remember you know constructions are first thing long duration projects and in previously if we take the all the construction project they have the historical uh, you know data is available and which basically get factored or which get uh, basically impacted through the various uh, environmental factor market factors so all those things are recorded and so this uh, construction project provide a good set of data good set of historical data which can be feed back in the new project right and we can do the estimation, accurate estimation by utilizing some parametric or mathematical models, right? So let's say you have uh, to build, you have to build a new home. So you know, you know, certain number of dollars per square foot, which was uh, utilized or which was, you know, uh, based on the previous uh, construction project, you can find out, then you can factor in various, uh, you know, the current fa uh, um, factor or maybe in terms of error or some other, uh, you know, the, uh, the factors which can drive the cost and then key in those factors in your uh, in mathematical model and arrive those uh, parametric estimations, right? So usually, you know, they provide a very uh, accurate range uh they don't provide a very pinpoint cost but they will tell you what will be the range of those costs and based on your experience uh you can find you know what will be the, you know, the optimum cost which is lying between those two range of costs right so let's say uh it can if a project is let's say 100 million uh maybe you know the parametric uh, estimation model will say you know, the cost the total project cost may lie somewhere between 90 to uh, 110 million dollar right so like that it will be value you some color sort of range and now depending upon your experience you can take hundred dollar or maybe hundred and five dollar or maybe ninety eight dollar as a total cost depending upon 
uh, your situation, your decision, your experience uh, in a particular construction, particular type of project or particular industry. So the next technique of estimation is your bottom of estimation, right? And this is the most accurate. So this is one of the most accurate uh, technique. So whenever you require the highest accuracy of estimates, you always utilize this technique to get uh, you know, uh, the accurate estimation for your project or at uh, you know, any activity also you can follow the same uh, techniques, right? So the, basically what it does, it basically uh, break down the larger project scope into the smaller components. So what happens, let's say this is your project, you break down the project into various WBS, right? So let's say it's a breakdown to WBS, right? And then this WS are further break down to work packages. So by breaking this into various work packages, it is basically giving you the more granular detail, right? And these details are basically helping you to have the more detailed uh, detailed estimates of the activities right uh, basically when I say the detailed estimates of the activity it means detailed uh, estimation of resources this is what it means so what it does it basically break down the projects right project into various Component WBS, W is break down to work packages, work package is break down to detail activity. Detail activity basically to the detailed estimation of your resources, more accurate resource, uh, resources which basically tells you the more accurate cost of your project, right? This is how the bottom of estimation estimation uh, technique works, right? So, first point it basically break down the larger project into a smaller number of component which is your WBS or WBS packages or work packages. So basically it's break down the work into small work package which we discussed earlier. These are the work packages broken down and then because of granularity it's provide the accurate estimate. Remember so by breaking this project into a smaller chunks or smaller packages you are basically increasing the granularity of the detail which is in turn giving you the more granular or accurate estimates, right? So, and, and remember, you know, once we are able to break down the cost into several work packages, you can easily approach the multiple department within the organization and get their you know, cost split from those uh, department depending upon, you know, the work package. So you can easily assign those work packages to each department, understand what is your cost, take their help or input from those uh, department and have a more accurate or more tailored uh, cost estimate for your project, right? So this is why whenever you need a more accurate estimation of your project cost, always follow the bottom of estimation cost. So this will always give you the high accuracy of your cost estimates, right? So whenever you need highest accuracy, just follow this technique. So the next key technique is your three-point estimation technique, right? This technique is again, uh, you know, utilized for estimation when you have we don't have very much data and of course it's not that accurate as uh, your bottom up estimation technique is that but of course it can give you the very quick uh, almost you know uh, some good estimation of your project or let's say uh, activity so as name suggests three point estimation it basically utilizes three point right so and it takes those three point data and then do its calculation, which is basically called third, right? And when I say this three data, so this three data is basically nothing but one is your optimistic, one is your optimistic data, another one is your pessimistic data, or let's say pessimistic data, 
data and then another one is your most likely data right so this is data o this is denoted as p and this is denoted as m right now when i say optimistic what does it mean by optimistic right so optimistic is, uh, optimistic is your first point first data point which basically means where the work is done and funds spent most efficiently so you need to go back in your history or historical data and find out the that project cost which was done very efficiently and the situation where the, the you have the minimum cost spent to do the similar kind of work that is what is mean by the optimistic so you need to find that data point or those kind of project where you spend the cost or spend the money less money to do the same project work or same same kind of work so this is what become your optimistic data point then you need to go back again to the same historical data point or set and find the pessimistic data point the pessimistic data point is the point or this let's say uh, you know you make a guess where you have the work is done and fund spent is a least efficient manner means you do the same work but you spend lot of money in fact most cost or maximum cost you spent for doing the same work whereas in optimistic you utilize minimum cost to do the same activity right so you uh, chosen a project selected a data point where you have the minimum cost you selected a pessimistic data point where you have the maximum cost <coughs> sorry <coughs> maximum cost okay then you choose your third point that is your most likely point the most likely point is based on the scenario based on the current scenario type of the project external factor you may be having your own opinion which you may see if the cost may lie between somewhere your optimistic data point and the pessimistic data point this is basically called m most likely or in middle point or wherever it could be here it could be here depending upon you know your best guess so now you have the three data point right one is your optimistic another one is pessimistic and another one is your most likely so you take this three data point add it and then multiply the most likely with four and divide it by six right and that's what actually called your three point estimation now why we utilizing this six and four and this is basically coming with beta distribution so this formula is basically getting derived by assuming that these data points are actually following some kind of you know the beta distribution so again this is a part of uh, the data analytics i'm not going to the detail and explain what is beta distribution is uh, but uh, you can go even on web and search in detail about the beta distribution but overall from the project management point of view this is what is the technique is it's main three point estimate and this is what formula which we utilize to do this three point estimation type so estimation is not the fortune telling exercise right remember estimations are estimations so when i say estimations are estimations means they are not 100% they are not 100% accurate right they are not 100% so there will be some plus minus delta or plus minus variations in the uh, estimation right so estimations are not 100% accurate they have some deviations now what are those variation or what are those inaccuracy right so estimations are estimated with some degree of inaccuracy right that's why they are not 100% accurate they will be some plus minus inaccuracy now what are those accuracies and how do we define those accuracy so remember uh, those estimates whatever estimation we do as per the american association of cost engineer they have classified the estimation the type of estimation in various classes so class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 class 5 like this you can basically uh, categorize those estimate which you get now what is mean by the 
class estimation. So that will depend upon you know the maturity level of the project definition of variability which we have. So let's say when you start a project at that point of time your project is not mature means you don't have much um, much detail when you're starting a project but when you progress the detail slowly you will gather a lot of information because of engineering other input from the various function you may have better understanding of the project and project details right so as you move to the finish you basically understand the project much better right and this is what is mean by the maturity level of the project definition then the what is the end use of the estimate what is the purpose of the estimate so depending upon its maturity level and methodology and the expected accuracy range you can decide you know which estimation technique is suitable for you okay so let's say you doing the class 5 estimate so class 5 estimate means was the project is very crude form you don't have much detail only 0 to 2 percent detail are sure it's a very at concept screening stage at this stage what kind of technique you can use so basically you can use parametric model judgment or expert judgment or analogy or you can do some capacity factor uh, method to do this estimation and what could be the accuracy for those estimations so it can be as low as you know uh, less than 50% your budget is under underestimated or it may be overestimated by 100% so it could be double or it could be you know uh, underestimated by 50% this is what it's mean your range of accuracy then next class is class 4 in case where you have the definition or maturity of the project is somewhere on 1 to 15% right uh, where 100% means your uh, finish right and then 0% is your start of the project. So if it's like between 1 to 15%, it means you can utilize this as for the feasibility study or initial study. In these kind of cases, you are basically utilizing equipment fact, uh, factored or parametric model. And at this stage, with this granularity, it is available information. It could be, you know, 30% uh, under budget or maybe 50% overestimated oh, sorry uh, under 30% underestimated and 50% over uh, overestimated so it could lie between this range then you have class 3 then again you know your majority level is 10 to 40% this is like you know utilized for budget authorization or control uh, and then you know you have the same detail you need cost level basically the semi breakup or let's uh, some granularity in terms of WBS where you have the accuracy is like it could be under uh, under budgeted or let's say the underestimated by 20% or overestimated by 30% then you have the class 2 which is again more accuracy than class 3 and it means that you have the 30 to 75% of information detail, detail information available these kind of uh, you know estimates are used for your control or tendering purpose and there you need to basically you know detail you need to break up and this is basically done through the bottom up uh, you know, uh, technique uh, you need to break, break down all those activity and these basically lies between uh, you know this range so it could be underestimated by 15 percent or overestimated by 20 percent then you have the class one estimate which means you have 65 to 100 percent information available for the project right and this is basically utilized for tendering or signing a contract and in this case you know you knew the detail unit cost you knew the what is material takeoff you know the full information of boq and then based on those estimation uh, these estimate could be you know underestimated or by 10 percent or overestimated by 15 14 uh, 15 percent so depending upon uh, the information which you have project you can choose what kind of estimate do you, we need and what kind of technique we should be utilizing and then based on those technique and information you can find out what could be the accuracy of your estimate within this range right so like this you can find out and then based on that you can do some of those adjustment in your uh, you know the estimates 
and then you can utilize that amount for the budget allocation or maybe discussing it further with your management so the four principle of cost estimation one is accuracy of cost estimation will depend upon what kind of project detail or definition is available with you right that is directly that will impact your accuracy depending upon you know what kind of uh, definition or what kind of uh, information available for your project then cost estimation you know provides the decision maker a means to make decision it is not the final thing remember but this will form the basis to make the final decision cost estimation are just estimate so they will give you some kind of indication or they will help you to make some decision but they will not directly decide anything uh, in terms of you know, making decisions now estimating is done by the breaking of the total sc uh, scope in a manageable part this is one of the key aspect so that's what we were discussing you know the breaking of the, uh, the project scope in the wbs or cost based on structure this will basically you know give you the more accurate uh, costing and then cost estimate is more than a list of costs so when you do an estimation every estimation is based on some assumption right and this assumption is called basically basis of estimate so whenever you are doing any estimate make sure you also record what are your BOE the basis of estimate because that will basically directly related to your estimate and in case in future if any assumption changes from the start of the project to finish of the project you would know where the variation happened and how to mitigate those costs so the accurate estimation method or the let's say the method which you choose to do the estimation can be the difference between your success plan and the failure plan right so it's very important to choose the right estimation method we have discussed those methods earlier so please make sure whenever you're choosing those estimation method it has to be right in terms of the project type availability of information those factors you need to check in whenever you're choosing because if you choose the wrong method that will directly lead to, lead to you know the failure of your project or at least this will increase the chances of failure a lot so you need to make sure you minimize all those risks so advantage of cost estimation well it's a no-brainer but you know first thing first it provides accurate planning so you can better do the planning of your cost how you will spend the cost how you manage those costs of course it will help you to increase your profit margin once you know what will be your cost then you can better manage it and also you will be knowing you know what is the profit expected profit margin for each project then the efficient and improved resource management so the best or the or the best cost estimate will basically lead you to the better resource uh, estimation or resource management and accordingly you know you can easily optimize the resource uh, utilization as well as efficiency once you know the accurate resource estimation through this cost estimation techniques the second thing is build a reputation in business remember the projects is are nothing but reflection of your company's operation right so companies do operation or let's say do their business through taking several projects right they take several projects from the various clients and they perform those projects and make the benefit now while taking these projects from various clients right there's a relationship between company and uh, the client and that relationship is basically linked through your projects so if you're doing good project if you're managing better project then that is basically helpful for your client good for a company this basically brings a good reputation a good bonding between company and the client right and if the projects are failing then definitely that is basically hampering 
to your reputation in the business, your company's image, as well as your relationship with the client. So that's why it's very important to manage the project successfully. And if you talk in terms of cost, of course, financial are most important part, not only for your company as well as for your client. So make sure you are doing efficient cost management of your project whenever you are taking any project. So once you once you complete with your cost estimates, right? Then the next step is you determine the budget. So based on those estimates, you do some adjustment, right? You do some adjustments and arrive at the budget. So budget is basically, you know, determine the budget is nothing but allocating the money to the work package and aggregate the total cost of the work package. So you need to allocate the money uh, by taking some adjustments, right? Uh, this is very important this adjustment and then once you do this adjustment you allocate this money and that's become your budget for the each work package and this is what is all about determining the budget so how you determine the budget right before allocating it so determining the budget well like we discussed earlier sub process so this is the next sub process in a cost management <coughs> overall process so if you see we have taken the first step there is a plan cost management second one is estimate cost now we are talking about determined budget this is the third step of the cost management process and like we discussed all previously every cost uh, every steps basically have several inputs right this input is basically nothing but the information which you will require to do this or complete this process you will need some tool and techniques okay and then some goals basically your final outputs okay so in terms of input you will need these information at minimum so when your cost management plan your scope baseline activity cost estimate project schedule resource calendar register agreements of the contract contract which is signed basis of estimate and then uh, you know uh, the organization process as well so this all information you will be needed or you will be required requiring to complete this sub process so once you have this information you basically utilize some tools or some techniques what are those tools one is a cost segregation reserve analysis you have some funding limitation the consolation expert judgment then historical relationship so you basically utilize these kind of tools or techniques to arrive at this output so what are the output when you say you determine budget is basically the cost baseline you arrive at the cost baseline which you will be basically allocating to the project giving it to the various function that this is your cost uh, allocated cost and this is the baseline cost and you are supposed to spend this cost to complete all the scope of work project funding requirement now remember once you decide the cost baseline <coughs> you need to know your management would like to know what is the total fund which management need to secure remember you know management have to secure funds right funds mean basically money maybe from company maybe they will take loan from the very financial institution the thing is that this fund is getting decided by the management right management decided and management need this cost information to decide what is the fund requirement or at least this funding calculation so that they can approach to the sponsors or to the you know uh, the financial institution to arrange that fund right and then of course you know if something new come up <laughs> you need to basically you know update your project documents so this is your determined budget uh, process and remember you know after that you need to basically work on a control cost but from the determined budget process point of view, this is what your input outputs are and the key output is your cost baseline and project funding requirement. So once you determine your budget, then the next step is control the step cost, right? So let's say this is your timeline, right? This is start of the project and this is your finish time of the project. So what happened at the start of the project, you decide cost baseline or let's say baseline budget or let's say budget baseline 
by a baseline. So this is basically a sign here at this point of time and when projects start you need to continuously monitor. So you must have plan you know some cost may be incurred here then after some time you will need some this cost like this you have something planned. Now against you this plan budget or this baseline or budget baseline you need to monitor what actually spent right at these phases whether this is equal to this it is less than this or more than this what is the variation what is the delta between the plan and the actual so like this you need to monitor and control and if some variation is there then you need to monitor and control it and develop the mitigation plan so that you can control the cost within the limits so cost control well like we discussed a, a previous process it is like same so we has input then some tools and techniques and some goals so goals is basically nothing with some outputs so what are the inputs required for this process you need project management plan project funding requirement work performance data and then the organization processes so, so these are the information these are the inputs you will be needing in terms of you know the information right and then this information you will utilize some tools so one is your earn value management one of the famous tool for project controls or controlling the cost let's say we will be discussing this in a separate, separate chapter but this is one of the tool which you will be utilizing to control then forecasting is another tool we have forecast what will be expected cost whether it's savings or increase then tcpi performance based review reserve analysis this kind of tools and techniques you are supposed to use right and then by utilizing these tools and techniques and this information you arrive at this output right and what are those output is first thing is work performance information cost forecast change request suppose if some change is required based on this uh, you know a process then the project management document right you need to update those documents organize the process as it and then update your documents previous document which you have developed so these are the output we are expected or let's say these are the things which you are supposed to do as an output to complete this process and remember you know project control is continuous process which happens from start till finish Right. It's a continuous process. It's keep on going overall I mean, at every phase of the project. So uh, previously we have discussed uh, about the cost control process. Now, in cost control, there are the two key things. One is your cost performance data, the measurement criteria, and the report itself. So whenever you are doing any cost control or let's say any normal project control activity. The measuring the performance key indicator is a key here. Basically, it tells that how you will be measuring that. What are the things you will be measuring? What are the data you will be considering to consider as a performance, right? So this basically, what is your specific goals which you want to meet? What kind of productivity you want to measure? Uh, which will basically call it as a performance and then you how you will monitor those things and obtain those value and compare it with your plan or actual value this is what it's mean by measuring the performance now it is very much vital very much important right because you need to continuously measure the progress of each work and if you don't know from the start or from the initial what you are supposed to do or what was planned it's very difficult to compare it with the current status and see whether this is improved or condition has uh, worsened or it is uh, you know as per the plan so that's why it's very important to measure the progress with respect to the baseline to maintain the baseline and then compare with the actual progress and then this is how you're going to do that you need to define the performance measurement criteria which will basically help you to compare uh, your progress versus plan so this is what is mean by measuring the performance next thing is the reporting so once you measure once you analyze something you found something next thing is that to communicate it to the team right reporting is nothing but your communicate it to the team 
Now communicator routine means basically there may be some frequency, some protocol, some kind of operating rhythm which you will be following in terms of sharing the report with the team and then discussing with the team. All those kind of things is basically become a part of the reporting, right? Where you uh, report those information or share those document or the critical input to your team and help the management to take the decision or detect any issue before you know the issues become bigger or it's impact the project in larger way so by doing the cost control you know you need to understand what are the factors which you will be looking in or what are the factors which really affect the cost control process right so what are the thing you will be looking when you do the cost control so one is your cost of the material remember for any project material is like 50 to 60 percent of your cost Major to the project, so it's very important to have a key eye or have a continuous monitoring on the cost variation or the cost movement of your material, right? So when I say material, it's include all kind of supply, you know, all the equipments which is necessary or maybe bulk material required to complete all the work of your project. This is basically forms your cost of material. Next thing is that your cost variance. So when you monitor the cost, you need to continuously monitor your cost variance. So let's say this is your baseline cost, right? You have planned this cost that you will be spending one dollar here, ten dollar here, twenty dollar here, sixty dollar here. Like this, you have spent in a plan initially, right? This is the, let's say the start of the project, and this is the finish of the project. But when you actually started the project, you realize that you have spent at this point of time, you have spent $20. Remember, you have planned less than $10, but you have spent already $20. So there is a difference, right, between plan versus actual, right? So there is a delta, there is a variation. So you need to continuously monitor this variation between actual and plan and understand how to control that variance. What are the factor which is impacting those variance? How you can you know, mitigate those costs? This is what is mean by identifying those cost variance and mitigating those, okay? Then the third thing is your return of investment, that's ROI. So that's also the important factor while you're working in cost control part. So return of investment, basically the project, every project, requires some investment right when we say investment in terms of money is invested in terms of cost and on based of uh, you know in return of that money invested management want that it will give some you know positive return or some revenue more than the cost so that we have the revenue minus cost is your positive or let's say it's a profit or margin right this is what it means. So if your revenue is high, so even though you spend some cost, you will be making some profit. And this is what it's mean by return of investment. So at any given point of time, uh, the, your project or the management would want to know whether your revenue, revenue is greater than cost or not, right? And that's what basically tells the position of your ROI. Then Another fa uh, factor is your labor cost. So after material, the labor cost is a major chunk or the major cost chunk which comes uh, which, which forms a part of a project which includes your employees perk, taxes, maybe some contract labor, contingent labor, all those things has to be taken care or understood or monitored in terms of labor cost, right? And then we have some real cost maybe in terms of, you know, the cost which is uh, and it can be direct or you know, indirect cost which you need to take care of but again that form not the bigger cost but again this may be this may become surprise if it's not uh, you know, continuously tracked so these are the factors which will affect your overall cost uh, you know and then and you need to while doing the project cost control you need to make sure you are looking on this factor, controlling those factor and identifying any variation or delta so that you minimize the impact of cost variance on the project. So like we discussed earlier for cost management, there are other techniques, right? There could be other techniques which we can utilize 
for doing the overall cost management. So let's say one of the, uh, the levers or uh, technique which is used for controlling the cost is inventory control, right? Inventory call is, control is directly related to your revenue. So it's always mm, uh, better to ensure you have the optimum inventory, not more, not less. Basically, it's ensure that you have the optimum source of revenue by maintaining the optimum inventory, right? And that's what basically lead to the less operating cost or less cost in terms of, let's say, the project. And that will basically uh, maximize your profit. Uh, so that's what one of the you know tool which we utilize. Another thing is much for me, you know, uh, in projects in EPC projects, outsourcing. You try to outsource much work which you cannot do internally efficiently, or you can do that same work at lesser cost. So do you involve the third party, or use also some portion of your work to another party to do that efficiently? And it's like one time initiative, you can just simply provide the cost and do it instead of doing it in house, which may be, you know, more costly and may not be that effective. So that's a, one of the techniques which use the cost management of very often used in, uh, in construction project as well as other engineering projects. Then utilize the technology to the fullest. This is, I think, uh, applicable to all kind of project across this industry. Technology is the leading uh, I can say the tool which helps the project to do uh, their activity to complete their scope of work efficiently and that's you know basically helps to reduce the cost or optimize the cost so technology is another technique which you can utilize maybe in terms of software tools or maybe other machines depending upon that your type of projects uh, you can take the fullest use of technology then the market sense depending upon the market you make some crucial decision on a project and try to reduce the cost impact maybe let's say you do a bulk buying from the particular vendor or you if you understand that your material uh, the raw material cost is going to increase you will do you know some negotiation with the vendor and lock the prices uh, depending on the market situation so those kind of things is basically your market sense so if they're based on the business environment factor you can take several key important decisions on your project, which can save you a lot of money. So that's and that's becoming one of the tools to do the cost management. And then of course, organize time because your time is equal to money, right? Especially on project, your time is equal to money. So if you're organizing your time, efficiently saving your time, effectively you are basically saving your money so these are several other tools which you should be looking into it while doing the cost management and you can utilize these other techniques so when talking about the cost management tool in modern project management so if you see various current industry in industry you will see lot of project management software are available which focused on your cost part right they basically aim to monitor the profitability of the project and detect the any issues in terms of conservation as early as possible analyze them and then report it to the various stakeholders right so these kind of software basically allow to estimate the cost so they start from estimation then deliver it to different type of project then identify the actual cost compare it with the actual uh, you know actual or the plan progress and then also the profit so those kind of things can be done what we discussed in the process in software itself so that the whole process the whole project cost management process become management process is efficient right and cost effective so with the help of tools and softwares you can basically make your cost management highly efficient this is what the purpose of uh, you know when you say the cost management tool so benefits of cost management well control other project specific cost cost business costs right focus cost basically uh, focus the future expenses and cost predetermine the cost as a record of the company and it's assist the necessary actions for the objectives and goals 
Then it's analysis the company long term pattern. Again, it's very important. Your cost management has to be efficient. Then actual cost can be compared with anticipated cost. And it basically helps the company to make right equation. So I'm not going into much detail. There could be a lot of other benefits uh, for the cost management. These are some of the things I just uh, noted down for you guys. So you can go through it. Uh, but you know, it's, it's very obvious uh, the importance and the benefit of cost management to the project, to the company overall operation. So as an overall process, uh, let's uh, repeat or let's say revise quickly. So we have first plan cost management Right then this is basically you know you plan everything based on your policy procedure uh, how you will be planning overall the cost management process and then the first thing is that your cost uh, estimate let's say estimate the cost right so you first estimate this basically all the estimation technique you have to utilize to find out what will be the dollar you will be spending to do this activity then the next step is your uh, after you do the estimation you need to do the budgeting right and in this budget basically you define what the budget will be required uh, for this uh, the project and then once you do the budget then you need to do the control over the period of time so basically find whatever the budget we have spent whether this is aligned with your expectation or not so this is a quick summary in process point of view four step process right for step process start with plan cost management then estimate cost then budgeting and then control so quick summary weighted milestone milestones are assigned to the budgeted value at uh, budgeted value earned at the completion of the milestone this is basically called a weighted milestone cost of quality right the cost of quality is basically the cost which is incurred to achieve the quality of the product or the services which is uh, you know signed in the contract Reserve analysis is basically your cost and schedule contingency reserve analysis because remember for every estimate there is some contingency is maintained and we need to understand whether those reserve analysis are sufficient to cover the unforeseen risk or changes to the project right then you have the cost performance baseline a time phase budget that will be used as a basis against which to measure monitor and control overall cost performance this is what is mean uh, by the cost performance baseline and then you have the project budget which consists of funds authorized to execute the uh, Project budget. So these are the quick key terms which uh, you should be keeping in mind while doing the cost management. So so far uh, We have basically learned about the three uh, Constraint which is your scope management. So we have learned first chapter then we have learned about the time management and then we just finish the cost management right so these are the three uh, key component of pm triangle remember we call it pm triangle or also known as iron triangle right so we know from this you know uh, these are the three key constraint for any project now if you remember quality is basically epicenter of all those three constraints so what is mean by that whether you do any scope or any time you know time management or the cost management it all has to meet some certain quality standard right all activity has to meet some kind of standards which is already defined in the project so whatever deliverable you are delivering to the client whatever services you are rendering to the client it has to meet certain criteria certain kind of minimum quality requirement so that it can be met at per the expectation of the client or expectation of the end user and this is what it mean by the quality being at the epicenter of the uh, this uh, 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 pm triangle and this is what we are going to learn in our next section we are going to learn how do we actually manage the overall project quality while we are doing all those project management activity and we will understand the various key factor which actually impact overall projects in a big way either in terms of cost in terms of quality maybe scope variation and internal process impacts 
So let's deep dive into the project quality management processes. So after we learn about the cost, right? We learn about the cost, we learn about the time, then we learn about the scope, right? After learning all those three constraints for project management, now the next key important thing which you want to look is quality, right? Remember, quality is always the epicenter of the PM triangle. So it's very important to understand the quality aspects of each constraint. Okay, and this is what we are going to do in this uh, section. So remember, every project has to be done to a certain quality standard, and each project there is some quality associated with that for every product, every services which it produces, and the project team need to ensure that the quality requirement as per the project is met, manage, control whole the quality man management process has to be done and the same way like we have the various process for other project management area this knowledge areas also have a certain sets of process which we'll be learning in this chapter so before diving deep into the quality let's understand what do you mean by quality right what exactly do you mean by quality so if we go in terms of definition so basically quality is standard of something right it's a standard of something so it basically tells you at what level or what kind of uh, you know standard as a measured against a thing of similar kind or degree of excellence or something so if we try to define the definition it's a basically the standard of something as measured against other things are the similar kind the degree of excellence or let's say degree of goodness or degree of betterness which is basically what is mean by the quality right you have certain criteria you have certain standards to meet uh, you know let's say uh, you you want to uh, buy a good car right now a car which has uh, let's say the life cycle or uh, the longevity or the du uh, du durability of the car is two year or let's say one durable uh, the other other car has a durability of um, maybe let's say 20 years right so the car which have the durability or the life cycle of 20 years and the car which has durability of two years right so the, the quality of this car this car a and car B, the quality of car A is very less. So quality of car is very low, you can say, and the quality of car A is very high because consumer can use this car for 20 years or longer duration, whereas for this type of car, let's say cheap car, they can't use for longer duration. Let's say you know uh, they have to go for maintenance, they have to go for major overall repair or maybe you know scrap or all over the car or whole whole car itself within two years so the quality of car you can say is very low and quality of car is very good because consumer can you know utilize the car for longer duration and of course uh, this will bring in other aspects like quality and other criteria which basically makes one product of higher quality than another product right so this is what is mean by in terms of quality so quality is basically the degree to which an object or entity right it could be object it could be any entity entity means it could be any process product or any services which satisfy as specific sets of attribute or requirement right so let's say if i want a uh, a product right a product has some feature one two three right so i will say it's a quality product only when the product is produced and met all those three features right then i will call it a quality standard product so whatever the defined whatever the defined criteria is there for a particular product to producing if it's met then we call it quality product or the quality criteria has been satisfied right 
So quality of something can be determined by comparing the set of inherent characteristics and set of the requirement. So this is what we wrote. Let's say this is a product, right? This is how you wanted the product, right? This was your requirement. And when let's say the same product came from the production or let's say through the, you know, some processes or let's say through project, you got the final product. Maybe this product will be, you know, uh, having more features than it was, uh, you know, uh, initially planned. Maybe some feature is missing. It's not completely. Maybe some another feature is there. So the point is that the feature of one, two, three, if it's not here exactly one, two, three, then it's a low quality product, right? Or you can say the quality is not matched. The quality will only met once and once, uh, once the specified, remember, not more, not less. The specified quality is met with initial or let's say the required with what is actually produced. This is what is mean by the quality standard, right? And that's what we learn how do we manage this. Uh, this quality uh, management process goes in project management. So for any quality uh, study or any quality of a product or services, there are certain element which you always look into it because quality has, you know, uh, I mean, the, the definition of quality is pretty general, right? But there are certain things, there are certain elements which you need to understand or you, you, you need to take care of it when you say you maintain the quality of the product. So, one is a validation which assures the product is meet the agreed upon need. Then another is verification, compliance with requirements. So once you know what is the requirement, then you need to make sure those are comply with, those are met with. Then the precision, right? You need to see up to which degree or how accurately those compliance are met. That is your precision. Then the accuracy, like closeness of the measure of the true value how it is close to the true value and then the tolerance or so let's say if there is a gap between uh, the set uh, criteria or set standard then what is the difference what is the plus minus uh, you know of the delta which is uh, you know above or below the required standard so if we talk about in terms of the importance of quality well it should be very obvious but let me you know speak some of the quality so quality is very important to the customer satisfaction right whenever customer ask for a product or any services right or any let's say the project which he want to do which will basically give you some unique product okay these product has to be this has to be as per some certain criteria right when i say criteria this is basically your quality standards so this has to matter a certain standards you cannot you know uh, give any cause of product, uh, any sort of you know the product so let's say you have uh, your project is to deliver 100 computers now 100 computers if they are not of the good quality a good standard you can you know provide the cheap computer and say see i have provided you the 100 computer my project complete no it's not complete because remember the quality expectation of client was to have certain level it may be having certain good amount of ram maybe you know good processor good graphic processor and you know motherboard all those things feature has to be best or at least as per the quality standard required by the client and if and only if you provide those kind of product or services at the end of the uh, you know the product then only you will call a project is complete and that's why it's very important to understand what are those quality requirement from the customer is right because you need to meet those standards okay and that will basically lead to the customer loyalty so if you provide a good services a good product to the customer then this will basically helps you to bring the repeat customer 
customer will be loyal to you and you know you can make more business right this is what's mean and the importance of the qualities that's one now the quality management is his organization to create a developing product services desired by the customer so not only you know the external uh, uh, factor but the internal factor also if you don't have the internal quality management you will be having a lot of difficulty producing the desired results right it is not just only customer in fact for better efficiency for better efficiency of internal processes or let's say your company right internal processes or the company itself so if you want to do job efficiently and highly effectively you need to follow some quality standard that's must right and that's what the importance of quality and also this quality is helps you it's you know directly contributes to our the higher revenue and productivity to achieve the organization so if i have the set quality procedure if you're following this quality procedure this also helps to the customer right and also it helps your organization to meet its objective and make higher margins higher revenues and be high pro highly productive so let's come to you know this specifically to the project because since we are this is a project management course right we are talking about the project management so let's talk about the quality or the you know the quality aspects in overall project management right so to manage any project through the quality you need to have some sort of plan right remember for all the processes we start with planning something right we plan those processes and then we execute or complete it so similarly for project quality you need to have some sort of plan which helps the stakeholders and top management right to check the progress of the project you need to have some sort of quality plan developed at the project so it basically determines the scope what is going to be measured right that's very important but what exactly you will measure to see whether that object is at a certain quality or not and then what matrix will be defined right you need to define those matrices first thing you need to measure it before measuring you need to define it so that you can call it project is successful or project is meeting your quality standard right and this makes it easy for all the stakeholders not only you project team in fact for the overall management to analyze the performance of your project and this is what is mean by your project quality requirement right this is what is mean by your project quality requirement or let's say the standards requirement which you need to do or you need to meet for the project stuff right and this is what is mean by the project quality requirements so what exactly do you mean by the project quality requirement quality requirement refer to the condition or capability that must be present in any requirement or product or services like this so let's say if your project is to develop a product plant right let's say you want to, de you want to develop a power plant so this power plant has to produce some megawatt right the power plant is used for generation of electricity remember right this electricity goes to and uh, bulb right this is kind of oops uh, as in this is bulb okay now to basically you know the output of any power plant is measured in megawatt so maybe you need to have the 200 megawatt uh, of power plant you want to produce now if you make a power plant which is only able to produce 100 megawatt or let's say 150 megawatt then it means it's not meeting its quality standard the project has failed because it was not even though it, you know it's a complete uh, power plant but it doesn't meet the quality specification or quality standard set by the client 
right this is what is mean by the project quality requirement so project quality requirement they represent need to validate the successful completion so remember at every stage of the uh, phase or at the every deliverable stage these quality standard need to be measured validate and confirm so that project can be considered as successful or not right and the easiest of the quality requirement is to capture uh, the express ones right so when i say this is mean basically you need to capture measure at every stages and every phases so that you can easily you know capture those each phases and keep confirming it's not just you know at one phases and you say you find a progress this and this you may be required to measure those quality at various phases of the project so let's say if this is a start right and this is a finish so there are several phases in between which you need to measure your quality standard so we try to define the project quality management in terms of core uh, project management processes so it's a process of continuously measuring and quality of all activity and taking the corrective action right it's process of you know measuring all the qualities and taking corrective actions of the into the team achieve the desired quality so the two important thing you need to measure it right and then you need to take the corrective action so these are the two key aspects of any project quality management overall process right and of course there will be a lot of planning there will be a lot of an execution of the various steps which we'll be you know discussing in next uh, step but overall if you see this is basically nothing but measuring and correcting all the issues related to quality so the project quality right project quality uh, management project quality management basically helps to control the cost of the project right so don't think the quality is different uh, you know uh, it's, it's independent it's it's not independent of cost right remember we have the uh, project management triangle right in project management triangle we have here scope constraint we have here time constraint we have a cost constraint and the quality right so quality is directly related to your cost so let's say if you have the quality product at you know very first time and then you will be having you know uh, producing that uh, product let's say this is a product a type of product may be produced the same product this was required and this is the final product and if this product is meeting this criteria which is set then you don't need to incur you know the other costs when i say other costs let's say you come up with a product which is not equal to right which is not the product a is not equal to initial product initial requirement okay if it's not equal to initial requirement then you need to take a corrective action remember we had talked about the project, uh, quality management is basically identifying and taking corrective actions now if you take any corrective action this will require additional resources now this additional resources will lead to additional cost okay and this is what is mean by you know the control of the cost of projects so if you're maintaining a good quality level right then definitely you don't need to have the additional cost of uh, corrective actions right or rework or you can say you know the other uh, financial implications so you don't need to do the rework or other financial uh, implications so these other financial implications are basically avoided right these are avoided so that you don't incur these kind of costs by meeting certain quality standard and which basically establish the aim to determine the steps to achieve the standard right so one thing is that it basically helps you to reduce the cost also it tells the project team it continuously monitors and tells the project team that what should be the quality of your project 
and this is what is all about your project quality management so if we talk about the quality management process itself so like we have the processes earlier we have the processes for the cost we have the process for the time we have the processes for the scope so like for these knowledge area we have the set processes for quality management also we have a set process right which is basically the three step process so this has a three step process and this three process is first step is your plan quality like we mentioned earlier everything start with planning right so we have to plan and then the second step is perform the quality assurance so you need to perform once you plan it you need to perform it and then third step is control the quality right so once you perform once you know what's your quality assurance are then you need to make sure you are meeting those quality assurance criteria this is what is all about the quality management process so remember it's a three-step process first thing is plan quality management second thing is plan perform quality assurance and then the final one is control quality and we will be going deep into each step and understand various uh, elements or aspects of the project quality management so project quality management is tough that is very clear right let me tell you from the very straight it's not easy okay not easy so it's a really tough job because it's required a lot of efforts a lot of you know uh, the high analytical skill or a lot of technical skill i will say to ensure your projects are meeting the quality standards now the most project manager intend to create the best practices at the start of the project but even the most skilled or let's say the educated team or skilled team with the modern tool may fail right if we don't have the right quality management plan in place because it's like you know having a quality management plan is like having your compass right so compass basically what it gives you directions right so if you don't have the right direction then definitely you know if you want to go from a to b and you don't know the right directions so even though you have a very good car you have very good team or uh, you know so many things are available to you but if you don't know the directions where you want to go you will end up somewhere else right so that's why the project quality plan helps the team to you know uh, uh, have the better better results and that's why we need to have the quality management now measuring quality may seems like something you can do until after the project is complete so quality measuring of quality is not like you, you you know wait for the project completion and then you wait for the quality it's a continuous process right so continuous measure of continuous measurement of quality so it's a continuous measure of this quality and that's you need to do whenever you know managing a project right so you have to plan it and then monitor it throughout the whole process so let's say if it's start of your project and this is finish of the project so you need to continuously monitor throughout the uh, process step, okay so next step is plan quality management okay so when you say plan quality management I'll try to define the plan quality management so it is basically the process of identifying and documenting the quality requirement remember you need to identify and document this is the key here you need to identify and document the quality requirement and standard of the projects and product to determine how to satisfy them right how you will meet the criteria right or let's say requirements is the key here like right? this is what key here this is what you would like to you know learn or you would like to analyze or plan here in this process and that's why it is called plan quality management okay so quality planning is a big topic right it's not as easy it seems it's it's a little bit complex and you know that in detail uh, 
we'll start to the previous uh, process of previous planning which we have done for various knowledge area like cost quality and time in fact you know all those previous areas requires a lot of effort in fact they are also you know quite complex but even the quality planning is more complex than those process right so quality management plan basically start with clear definition of goal of the project of course that's very obvious you need to have a clear goal right what is you want to achieve in a project and to you know have a better quality management plan or what is the deliverable you are supposed to accomplish you need to be very careful not only you but your team had to continuously ask certain key questions right first thing is that if we talk about in terms of product or services what does it look like right what is supposed to do how do they measure the customer satisfaction how do you determine the project was successful so these are the certain criteria or certain standards you need to continuously monitor evaluate to perform your quality planning right and this will basically help you to identify uh, the quality point because remember each project each project is unique right every product is unique this means every project will have unique quality requirement right it's not like the same standard or same quality requirement is met for all kind of project or same kind of project so it's required a unique quality requirements right and that's you need to meet for the each project right this helps you to approach and keep the goals that include like assessing the risk of success then stand setting the high standard and documents everything quality planning basically you know not only just uh, reduce the risk but also it's make sure uh, it's documented properly standards are maintained throughout the process so what exactly your quality management plan is basically as we learned earlier is to remind the standards right which is need to be satisfied what are the things which a quality management plan in general should be doing right it should basically tell us the way the team implement the quality policy i mean what they should be doing how they will be implementing also it should tell the way the quality both project and product will be assured how you will assure the both project and the outcome of the pro project is assured right this will basically tell you the how the standard quality the qualities is assured for each project then the resource required what is the resource required to ensure the quality remember right this is just measuring for the quality the intention is here to ensure the quality so whatever resource is required maybe in terms of tools or maybe in terms of new processes or maybe people you know or maybe some other services or support is required so all those resources which is required to implement the quality standard is basically what you need to do here i mean this is what uh, will be uh, defined or explained in your quality management plan right then the additional activity necessary to carry out the quality plan so there could be other things which could be doing depending upon you know the projects to projects depending on the project type or let's say you know industry type you need to make sure you or identify the resource requirement or bring it everything in your quality management plan right so this is what your quality management tells you right and these are the key element which you should be measuring or you should be providing those information in your quality management plan right now how exactly you develop those quality management plan what are the process steps remember we were following some set of structure with uh, input output uh, kind of system let's understand you know those aspects for quality management plan so for planning a quality now like we discussed for previous systems so we have some sort of input which is basically means that we require some sort of informations right and then we will be having to learn some tools or techniques so basically this helps you to assess or analyze information and then we'll arrive at our goal or that is our output okay so 
when we say in terms of input so we will need project called project management plan register stakeholder register risk register required document memory factors and of course organization assets so these are the key information which you will need which you will be needing to do or as an information to do the uh, to do the planning of your quality management now what are the tools you will be utilizing so you should be utilizing the cost of quality cost benefits of benchmarking design requirements seven basic quality tools are there there's a steady sample uh, sampling there's a, so many different tools and techniques are available which you should be doing to perform your quality management plan right and once you did that so you will basically arrive at this goal now these goals are basically what it's a quality management plan then process improvement plan you will get some quality metrics you will get some quality checklist and project document update so those kind of output you're supposed to get through this process right and remember this is your first step this is your first step and quality management right it's a three-step process and this is the very first step and like you know uh, start similar for other uh, processes this also start with planning so uh, not much important here but it's, it's a quality plan which has the stakeholder a top management level to check the progress of the project right also determine the scope what's going to be measured and what's the metrics and all those things right so we have I think we already discussed this so uh, uh, it's pretty simple right pretty understood I guess if you don't then please go back to the previous section and you will be uh, it will help you to understand this then after you plan your plan after you did your planning right after you completed your planning then the very next step is you to perform the quality insurance based on the plan so perform quality assurance is your second step right this is your second step of the process and this second step is basically what application of plan systematic quality activities to ensure or provide the confidence that project will be employing or processes need to meet the requirement mm -hmm. so <coughs> sorry <coughs> so basically you know uh, this will tell you in terms of definition it's a application whatever you have planned or you know the qualities ensure those are have the assurance uh, the project will employ all the process and need to meet the requirements so i think this is just simple definition you need to understand whatever you have planned in your previous step you need to basically assure this right this is what it mean by assurance so you need to assure uh, all those planning in the next step so quality assurance basically provide the evidence to stakeholders that all the quality related activities are being done as defined in promises uh, promise so this is what is mean by the quality assurance so basically ensures all the stakeholders that whatever quality standard are there this are basically uh, defined or deployed and then it safeguards uh, in place guarantee remember every project when you do a project there is a client and there is a contractor right and then there is this contract sign between these two parties they come together they sign a contract right now when they sign a contract they commit contractor commit some kind of guarantee right roads provide some kind of guarantee or warranty whatever you say to the client that whatever product the contractor will provide this will meet certain criteria now if the product or the project is not going as per the quality plan or quality expectation right if it's not going where the expectation definitely this will lead to some guarantee cost or some you know some kind of penalty from the client so what based on a contract agreement so that will result in some losses to the contractor also the quality assurance done to the product services deliver the project as well as the processes and procedures so remember the quality assurance is not only limited to the product or services it's also deployed to the processes and procedures okay so you need to basically the quality is 
uh, can be applied to any and uh, you know several kind of entity it's not limited to the physical product or you know the tangible assets so how quality assurance are implemented i think it should be pretty clear now so quality assurance tests are use a system of metrics so what we have met is defined in a plan uh, section we utilize those matrices to you know uh, uh, though or to make sure all those uh, standards are implemented on the project right and then those uh, method could be you know qualitative or quantitative so qualitative means we define the text <laughs> what it would be quantitative means basically what are the matrices what will be thresholds right thresholds for all those uh, quality matrices then these tests of quality audits will be help will help you to predict and verify the achievement of goals and identify the need of corrective actions so this will help you uh, to verify the achievement of goals and identify the need of corrective actions now quality actions test will help you to map the quality matrix of the quality goal and also allow you to report right so it's not only just matching misery also the reporting uh, the stress of quality is very important. So remember the assurance has basically three you need to first you know uh, uh, Measure it Right measure your matrices measure and then report those So measuring and reporting is one of the you know the critical aspects of your quality assurance and how it is getting implemented to the project that you need to see so perform quality assurance This is our the second step, right? second step of the process remember this is we are here now now we are learning about this step and again we discussed previously that every process has some certain input and output right so and then this requires some sort of tools and tags to do this analysis so for the input point of view this process will require quality management plan process improvement plan quality matrices control measurements and then the project document so once you have this all information as an input you will utilize these tools what are those tools there are certain general quality management tools audits are there process analysis are there when you utilize those tools and techniques you will basically arrive at some output and those outputs are basically change requests project management plan project documents and then other organization process asset which you will be getting through this process so the next step is your control quality so once you have a plan right you have the assurance then you will need a control plan right and which is what is this all about so if we talk in terms of definition to control quality it's basically monitoring and recording the results of executing the quality activities remember it's all related to quality activity to assess performance of the recommended necessary changes right so this is all about monitoring and recording the quality activities which is deployed on the project to ensure the quality this is what is mean by control quality so control quality control quality involves operational techniques which meant to ensure the quality standard right this includes identifying analyzing and correcting problems so quality assurance uh, you know when we discussed earlier the quality assurance was basically it occurs before the problem is identified right this occurs this happens when your problem is identify before any problems identify this is what is mean by the quality assurance but let's say once problem is identified then the quality control come into the picture so that's why the quality control is your reactionary right whereas quality assurance is before the problem is identified so this quality assurance you know it's it's occurs when a problem so um, it occurs when problem is not identified or let's say problem is being identified before the problem identification but once the problem is occurred then the quality controls come into the picture and basically this happens when problem has been identified right and basically this is to suggest a method for the improvement so this is what is different uh, major bit uh, difference between uh, the quality assurance so quality assurance let's say you identified a problem at this point of time the project was going on from A to B. At this point of time, you have identified. So, 
a total process for this problem you know for these issues there was quality assurance in the place right and then when you identify this problem then only this problem your quality control will come into the reactionary way and start deploying your corrective actions right this is what it means so it's quality control basically measures the specific project output and determine the compliance with applicable standards right and also it's identify the risk factors and the mitigation plan and way to uh, prevent or eliminate the unsatisfactory performance so this is what is mean by the control quality now control quality can also ensure the project is on budget right remember and project is on schedule or basically you can say on time right this is what is mean by the quality control now you can monitor the project output through the various you know method or do some review or testing that they, there could be several tools that uh, there's a lot of tools available for quality control but the idea is that quality control is not only to a physical process as i said but it's also on budget on time uh, those quality control uh, will be applicable right so it's basically you know uh, by catching any review which is failing to meet the aggregate standard or through, through output is kind of you know the, the principle of control quality so in terms of process uh, like we, for the previous process we have input output system so again for this one also we have some input input means basically your informations what kind of informations you will be required or you will need to do the activity when the project management plan quality metrics quality checklist work performance data approved change request is a deliverable project document organization process as well. so these kind of information you will need to do the control quality process and then you will need some tools so when you see the tools so what kind of tools will be required so seven basic quality tools statistical sampling inspection approved change process request this kind of tools and techniques right this kind of tools and techniques you will need to do the control quality process so by utilizing this information utilizing these tools and techniques you will be arriving at some goals right or let's say some outputs so to do the control quality now what are the outputs you are supposed to get you will get the quality control measurements your validated change deliverables work performance information some change requests putting my main document and then you know organization process uh, ss updates so those are the things which you will be getting through the control quality process and remember this is your third step and final step of your project quality management process right management sorry about my process okay so this is what uh, is the overall process overview of you can see the control quality where you have to follow these three steps start applying management perform quality assurance and then control uh, the quality to do the overall project quality management plan so benefit of project quality management well it's very obvious so i'm not going into detail but yeah of course it helps to provide the quality product customer satisfaction we have already discussed this it helps to increase the productivity this also we discussed financial gain right so quality is directly related to the cost of financial uh, implications so yes this helps uh, to meet your financial goals then the last one is remove silo this is a very important one right so quality <clears throat> is basically you know very helpful to remove the silos so when i say silos what happens you know in any organization when a project start and finish right there are several functions came together or to form a team and then uh, you know do the activity project activity through the uh, this period from start to finish period right now in that case what happened many times uh, you know the function tends to work in silo environment means uh, there is very less information you know getting cross over from one function to another function and then they, this basically hinders uh, the optimum operation of overall project activity so to break or uh, to uh, remove those kind of situation or those kind of unwanted uh, the factors which basically overall impacts the project progress can be reduced 
uh, by utilizing the project quality management and this is what is mean by remove silo so it's basically boosts a collaboration between the teams with the project quality management tool and this helps the team to have better uh, you know the project results uh, by utilizing various uh, quality management tools and remove the silos. So quick review, project quality management plan includes the activity of performing organization that determine the quality policies, objectives and responsibilities, right? This is one of the key, or you can say the summary of the project quality management plan. Then we discuss, you know, various tools uh, is required for the quality management. I'm not going to detail the each tool, but Remember, when you're doing the project, you may encounter these kind of tools uh, while dealing with your know, project quality management process and activity. So some of the tools are like a Fenty diagram, a process patient diagram, and then you know uh, international diagrams are there. Then we have prioritization metrics are there. Network diagrams, it could be arrow or precedence diagram. They're, these are the very uh, you know, common tool utilizing project management, not only for you know uh, the quality management, but also for uh, the planning and other aspects of the projects. Matrix diagram is very much famous. It could be L type, T type, Y shape, uh, shape and X shape. So I'm not going to detail of this type of matrix, but yeah, these are the several, uh, you know, common tool which you can utilize for project quality management, right? Or at least when you hear you this, uh, hear you, when you hear these words in your projects, you don't need to be, you know, uh, doing a surprise uh, about, you know, what is this because mainly it's related to your uh, quality uh, control or the uh, project quality management process point of view. So other aspects of the quality management is again the software. So now we have a lot of advancement in technology world and then this basically helping us to do our processes or do our works efficiently and of course quality management is not uh, uh, exception to this. So there are a lot of quality management software which helps the team to do their work efficiently. So it's basically, uh, you know, provides a lot of dimension to do this quality, uh, uh, the project management in general, as well as for quality management processes efficiently. So normally these kind of process are multi, uh, you know, facet. So they uh, basically, you know, team must understand about these softwares that what is our expectation, how they will measure these KPIs due to utilizing these softwares, and then how they will implement those changes with the help of uh, the softwares and how they will, you know, coordinate or do the remaining work or additional work what is required. So ideal work management plan, if you want to just find out how the ideal software should look like. So it basically allow you to track, you know, every aspects in at one place, right? So tools, if I talk any tools in terms of, you know, software, so it should streamline the review and approval process to ensure the quality and avoid the quality mistakes. Remember, whenever you have the quality issue, the quality issue should go through various review and approval process, right? to have a corrective correction or identification or analysis. So in those cases, in those cases, a software can help you to do those review approval process very efficiently in timely manner and very accurately. And that's why, you know, the, there are a lot of quality management software available in the market, which is being utilized by a lot of companies to do their quality management efficiently, right? So what it does is basically become uh, help you to, to become very highly efficient and time effective. It's track down all the approvals, aggregate the feedback at one centralized hub, and remember the stakeholders access those information real time at one single place. All kind of information from approval, documentation, various document case studies, all kind of things can be available at one portal which can be accessed through all the stakeholders. And that's basically makes the process efficient and timely. So in a business environment, there's other uh, important factor which you, you know, discuss, which is basically comes at who is actually responsible for your quality, right? Uh, because projects have several functions involved. And who is uh, responsible for the project quality? Well, if we talk in general, it's the overall responsibility lies with project manager, right, for the quality management process. But remember, it doesn't mean that other team member of the, uh, of the project will not bother about the quality. 
in fact in 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 code the project quality responsibilities of each and every project team member right where they need to ensure that whatever activities whatever the uh, you know the project uh, activities that they are performing is basically align or you know uh, meeting the quality standard which is set by the company so even though it's overall in general project manager is responsible for that but it's the work of each team member to make sure they are meeting the quality requirement right so in many cases you will find the separate quality department right we have the specific quality department which ensures the quality standards are met through the project or maybe for overall whole organizations right you may find this kind of department or functions so the main uh, aim is to basically ensure the profit margin by reducing the inefficiency operations error and product defect this is the main purpose if you see the main, main motto of any quality department in an organization or let's say any function in any project management so some of the key uh, responsibilities so i'm not going into the jd or job description of a quality manager right so we have already you know discussed we, we will be discussing the uh, uh, project managers and other key uh, roles responsibility but for the quality manager uh, there, there are only three uh, the specific role which i will be discussing or responsibility uh, which is basically first thing is understand the customer need this is first and foremost thing then you devise and review the specifications that's the second thing third thing is that setting the requirement based on uh, you know the, all those analysis and understanding of customers uh, requirements so this you need to do these three things are uh, there's a key roles for any quality manager right in any organization this is a minimum i'm talking about there could be a lot of other responsibility that depends upon your know, jd or role specifics but these are the three key responsibilities which right three key responsibility which a quality manager has to so in terms of overall management process i think we have already discussed in detail but you know this is step one plan quality management perform quality assurance and control quality so three step process but very important very critical for the success of any project i'm not going to detail of this definition we have already discussed this you can go through uh in terms of you know um, have a better understanding or remember it for you let's say examination or pmp examination or any program and certification uh these definitions could be helpful uh, while acquiring those certificates so you can go through this uh but just in summary you can um, just remember it's a three-step process which includes your project quality management quality assurance and control quality so quick summary well you know um uh, depending upon uh, we have we have learned the various concept in previous section now we can you know, have a quick summary and see the key points uh, so one is a benchmarking which is related to your planning of project uh, quality management so benchmarking is basically comparing previous similar project result to the current project results and provide a standard for the measuring the performance so this really helps in defining your kpis so this basically compares the data from the previous project and then compare it to current project and see you know where your project is lying in terms of performance and very helpful when you're planning your uh, you know quality the project quality management plan so this helps a lot then the quality cost very important the cost is a key factor while uh, you know ensuring the quality of a project or quality of the activities which is uh, being performed on the projects and it's always uh, important or track important to track the you know, cost the quality cost then the cost of quality against the total cost this is uh, you know again related to the each activity now this is basically summation of all the cost at any point of time uh, for any project or let's say any portfolio you can define depending upon uh, it's a project portfolio program then the quality metrics again uh, one of the tool which we utilize to measure the uh, uh, the two the quality standards for the each activity and so operational definition is that describes uh, what is being measured and how it will be measured in the quality control process so again it's related to kpi one of the other two to identify kpis
right then the quality checklist again this is one of the very common tools which you utilize that you have some sort of list available about let's say some product a okay and then you will utilize this checklist and take this uh, list and make sure that all those activity which is listed here are present or met or uh, whatever you want to say so that's one of the very helpful tool uh, in your know, various uh, supply chain projects as well as your uh, manufacturing products projects so while managing projects any projects you know depending upon my experience of 15 years of project management I have seen there the three key elements which I call PPT are the always I know the driving factor or the deciding factor for success of any projects right and these key process three key are people another piece process and tools so with the help of these three things right these three things people process and tool you can ensure all the project mammy activity overall basically whether it's with success and if we are facing any problem you need to go into any of the three key areas and solve the problem if you see you know either you're going to some people problem people issues or some process issues or some tool issues this is at any point of time if you pick any problem or any issue of any project management it will fall under these any one of these three categories that is either related to your people or it's related to your process or it's related to the tool so project management is a, you know uh, basically in a broader term it's all about your people process and tool and i put them in the same sequence right so first priority should be your people second is your process and third one is your tool now people are the primary resource of every project remember every project is done by the people with a well managed team without people or well management team your project is simply failure right uh, you can't imagine any success without having good people on your team then the process so once you have the good people good team then you need to make sure those people are working under some set processes that's very important right but that will define the efficiency that will ensure the teams the efforts are efficient and timely and productive so that you get the desired results so and these processes again uh, usually defined by the people itself or the people or the whole team come together to define this process but the point is that once you define a set process people need to follow those processes right uh, basically the idea is to have some quantified goal and that can be only done through following the process so once you have the good process good uh, you know the team and the process then the key thing is a tool right Nowadays, when a modern project management world, tools play critical roles, right? Because modern environment uh, projects require a lot of data, a lot of supports. It's required tools at every place. You have the tools for scope management, cost management, time management, risk management. There are tools available for each and every knowledge area. And the single aim for all this tool is to make this process, make this project management process, make this uh, knowledge area management process efficient and effective, right? So remember the benefit, the profit, which is, uh, you know, which you can expect from any project will completely depend upon how efficiently, how efficiently, right? Or how productive uh, you are managing on projects that's what would be defining this so if you have a very good management team very effective project management this will result into higher profit or it can you know further increase maximize the profit and in reverse if you have don't have a very good management team or effective project management this will erode your profit in fact you it will bring the project in loss or you know uh, probably you may end up having a failure failed project so that's why it's very important to have the efficient and productive project management and that can be done by utilizing this three element people process and tool right so if you see the first element is people people are the most important element of any project management process so 
how do we manage these people how do we manage the human resources and that's what we are going to learn in our next section right so we will be focusing on how to manage the people so remember you know uh, we learn about the ppt right and in ppt your first p is people right so people is basically the human resources and how do you manage those that's what we are going to learn in the next section so like i mentioned earlier for success of any project the three component p p t is important and where p is your basically people another p is your process and another one is the tool so at any point of time whenever you're working in a project management environment you are basically working any one of this component right either it's a people or it's a process or it's a tool so first component which is your people right which is nothing but your humans these are basically called the human resource right so how do we manage those human resource in a project environment that's the question here right because remember every project has a unique uh, product to, uh, to deliver or to services to deliver that's require the unique set of team maybe separate team is involved which is working on this project to make those deliverable uh, occur or succeed to deliver those uh, items at the point now the question is that how do you actually manage those or how do you you know uh, do a complete the resource management uh, for the overall uh, right so that's what we are going to learn in this chapter so to complete any project successfully right you will need all those three component people process and <coughs> <coughs> two all three at the same time right we need to need the right people at right time at right uh, you know uh, with the right processes and right tool so all three ppt has to be at same time right you need to have provide the optimum combination of three component at particular time to achieve the success so the next question is why do we call human resource actually right so human refer to the skill workforce in an organization remember right this is basically refer to the skill workforce organization uh, workforce in an organization when we talk about human resource and the resource is basically refer to the limited availability of all skills so human is basically you know the skill workforce but then it's added with the resource which means its availability or whether it's how scarce it is whether it's really available or it's uh, you know a very rare kind of uh, skill or maybe sets of people uh, which you require to complete your work so that's why if you see human resource term right human resource terms it has two component one is your human which is basically your skilled uh, workforce organization and resource is basically limited to the availability factor right so and then, then management is simply if i we learn right so basically how to optimize and make the best use of those uh, you know the human resource this is what is mean by human resource management so this is what you you know uh, see in terms of human uh, resource uh, management right so human is basically related to a skill organization skill workforce resources is related, related to availability and management is how about how you optimize or deploy so that you reach the objective at minimum cost so this is all about you know if we try to break this each term and understand what exactly the human resource management is so this is how you can understand the concept of human resource so hr is very common department in any organization will find human resource department right and this is basically responsible for all the things worker related 
right so when i say worker related it means like recruiting vetting selecting hiring onboarding training promoting paying firing and you know some independent contractors so all those activity are basically related to or done by hr department right this is what the hr department means right so human resources because management recruitment skill training hiring ability career and other things are also included so this includes a lot of uh, various other key activity or key uh, you can say the roles which is played by the hr department so and and you know uh, if you have ever worked in any organization and even if you not work in an organization you must have some sort of experience communicating with hr department of any organization right and most of the time yeah, many people yeah, sometimes you like it sometimes you don't like it the way they function but you know that depends on a lot of various other factors right so most usually you may you know, feel like this whenever you are interacting with hr department but anyway that's not real just just for fun but don't take it seriously and and and, and if you have any comments regarding the hr department how is your experience i would like to know you know what's your perception for hr department so if you guys have any any suggestion or if you want to share your comment please let me know what is your experience with hr department of any organization or uh, in your professional or personal life uh, that would be really help to uh, understand for me yeah maybe not good not bad maybe in in middle but let's see you know what are people's experience with hr department or general perception about that so five human resources right when we talk about the human resources what exactly the resources mean right and what are those duties so we say first thing is a talent management another one is compensation one of the critical part employee benefits additional to compensation there are certain benefits which uh, human resource people are discussing or um, managing then training development compliance is also part of your hr remember right and then of course workplace safety comes under the hr so these are the five key main duty of any you know hr organization a talent organization compensation and employee benefit training and development compliance and workplace safety so in terms of project environment how do we actually manage the overall you know the human resource uh management for project right how we are going to do it for project that's what we're going to learn in this section so if we try to define what exactly mean by the human resource and remember like all other process this process also start with planning step right so very first step we do plan how we are going to do the resource management so if we try to define the process very first sub process of human resource management that is basically plan human resource management and from definition point of view it is identifying documenting assigning the project roles and responsibilities and required skills reporting relationship and creating a staff management plan that is the whole you know the description of your plan human resource management process which is basically how you're going to manage the process uh, by basically identifying, documenting, assigning the project roles, responsibility and required skill. And then, of course, you know, you need to report <coughs> the relationship and creating a staff management plan. So this is what you call as a planned resource management, right? Let's understand the detail of the overall human resource management for the project. So human resource management plan, first step, right? This we have. Uh, remember for doing the project management, uh, human resource management in a project, it's required basically the four steps, right? It's a four step process. First one is the human resource management, another one is acquire project team, then it's the develop project team, and then you have the manage team. So these are the four step is done in project human resource management section area. And we will be discussing the step one, right? Step one is this is plan human resource management. So 
like previously we have discussed several uh, you know sub process so it has basically the three component one is your input or the information which we will be required or which we will need to do some analysis this is the first part then we will utilize some tools and techniques right and then we will arrive at our goal which is nothing but your output right so in terms of input or information you will be basically you will require some sort of you know uh, the information and those are mainly your project management plan activity resource requirement enterprise environment factor and organization process asset so these are the key input right which you will need to do your analysis now to do the analysis you need some <coughs> tools and techniques so you gather the information whatever information is required then you utilize some tools like networking organizational theory expert judgment meetings organization chart question description so these are the general tools which you are supposed to utilize which you utilize to you know arrive at some plan right so if you arrive uh, in terms of output if you want to know what exactly output is basically your human resource management plan so it's a simple plan which is you know, developed based on the input you received uh, regarding the project and then utilize some key techniques uh, and then you arrive at a plan which basically tells how you will plan your overall overall human resource uh, management right human resource management of a project right this is as simple as this so you will decide before doing all those critical activity you will decide here how you're going to do the manage uh, manage it and develop a document which is your human resource management plan so this is what your first step is uh, and this is what is called the project human resource management plan and then let's move to the next step and we will you know discuss in detail what are the elements of uh, the human resource management so the next uh, sub process is a choir project team so once you develop your plan how you will be managing a human resource very next step is to acquire people right to acquire the project team so it's basically confirming the human resource availability obtaining the team needed to complete the project right remember project has certain finish uh, start and finish date right and then at different phases it quite possible that you may need some some uh, specific people from this date right to this date you may not need to deploy them all over the project you have to just you know want them to start here and then finish there complete the activity and and then move on to another other, other job so like that you have some start and finish date of those people when they are required and then make sure their uh, you know availability is there because you know human resources are being they, they are resources right so and they are in demand and then there's possibility that they are not uh, able to work because they are working somewhere else so they have already committed to work somewhere else so acquire project team is all about confirming the human resource availability remember right availability is key here because if human resource is not available or the resource which we are targeting is not available at this point of time it means the activity which is planned from here is going to delay right a delay means it has again financial impacts on the projects right so that's why it's important to sh make sure the human resource is available and obtain the team to complete the project and not only just one resource but of course it will be a whole team right team of people so make sure all those people are available at time at right place so as a next process when you acquire your project team right uh, so the, you need to follow some uh, the similar sub process like we follow for plan human resource so again we need some input or information right and then of course we will need some tools and techniques and uh, outputs okay so in terms of inputs you will need human resource management plan which we uh, you know developed in previous step then we need environment factor enterprise environment factor and then organization process asset 
right and then uh, we will need some tools and techniques so when talking in terms of technique this is a pre-assignment uh, another technique negotiation acquisition virtual teams multi criteria decision analysis and there could be other tools right so these are the general uh, human resource management tools which you need to utilize to arrive at some output now the output is project staff assignment then your resource calendar project management update so these are the key output which you need to produce while working on this step so remember this is your second step your first step was plan uh, human resource management second step is your acquire project team which basically ensures your resource availability at the required time because projects you know depends upon those resources and is there any delay or impact on those availability this will directly impact your project in terms of delay as well as financial impacts will be there so this is your second step acquire project team then we'll move to the next step that is to develop project team and let's stand how you know let's let's deep dive how we do that develop uh, while developing project team now developing a project team right if you talk in terms of definition it is the process of improving competency team member interaction and overall team environment to enhance the project performance report this is what is mean by develop uh, you know project team right so how you do that right if you see the definition closely it is basically what is called improving competency right that's important part improving competency so you acquired a project team and you make sure they are competent throughout the project or throughout the de deployment so that the productivity or the expected work as being done as it is planned right and this is basically helps you to you know uh, develop a better working environment for uh, project team and also enhance the overall project performance <clears throat> okay so in terms of process how we do that right so again it has uh, like input output system so when you say the input it's basically you know about gathering the informations right and when i say the information it's all like getting the project staff assignment project management plan and resource calendar you simply gather this information and again you need to utilize some tools and techniques which is mainly interpersonal skill training training uh, you know you can be direct training team building activity co-location uh, recognition and reward you know again this is uh, another tool and that falls under your develop uh, project team and then you basically arrive at some outputs now the output is basically the goal the goal is basically team performance assessment this is the one output which you will be getting at the stage or let's say the step number three which is all related to your you know uh, the performance assessment okay and so this is what the third step means and this is what you output in terms of human resource management and then after you do this you move to the step four this is your manager project team so once you have uh, you know the acquire the team you know you know what's the team you develop them you have all the uh, everything is in place in terms of how you develop those team and then you need to manage them right manage means you need to basically manage them throughout the project deployment right so from start to finish you need to continuously you need to continuously mon manage them right i will not say monitor but you need to continuously manage them so let's understand how this happens in a project environment so manage project team right it basically tracking a team member performance providing feedback resolving issues coordinating and changing to the enhanced project performance so this is what is required so when you say the manage project team you're basically tracking the team member performance you're providing feedback resolving issues coordinating changes that there could be several changes in terms of human resource so all those activity are you doing to manage to manage a team t 
theme which is product here right and and efficient this is what you are trying to achieve by manage uh, project team process so in terms of uh, input output system so again you will need this information like human resource management plan project staff assignment uh, for team performance assessment issue logs if there is any issue uh, previously discovered then uh, work performance report and organization process uh, process asset so this kind of information you will need and then you will need some specific techniques to do that so we will need some techniques related to conflict management observation and conversation are another key techniques or tools which you will be required as a project, uh, hr management professional then project performance appraisal and of course your interpersonal skills so these kind of tools and techniques you will be need so that you can utilize this information the data you receive and analyze it so once you analyze it you arrive at output right which is your uh, this section and the output when i say you may become up with some change requests update new project management plan for document or enterprise environment or other factors or maybe you need to update your some of the organization processes so these are the eight output you can expect while you know uh, doing this management uh, projecting process so uh, with this management projecting process you remember this is your fourth step okay this is your fourth step so this in this first step this is the last one and then and then by doing this management this, the following this step you can complete your project human resource management plan and accordingly you can you know solve the issues or let's say human resource issues human resource issues related to project so in short human resource management includes a process like organize manage and lead the project management team right it's very important to see underline this term project management team so remember every project is being managed by some pmt right there is project management team project management team basically overlook all the functions other you know the department all together all related activity to this project and this is what is the aim of uh, this pmt is so in terms of overview of whole process of human resource or let's say you know uh, human uh, resource you your see resource management right so these are the five, four steps we have learned right this overall process so first thing that you need to develop a hr plan then you need to acquire a project team then you need to make sure you develop the project team so they are efficient you know you know they are performing as per the requirement and then you need to manage them right so basically track their performance provide feedback resolve issues manage the changes and all those things have to be done here so this is the overview of your human resource management plan and then we can move to the you know, next section so next thing some of the key important uh, terms or summary which i wanted to discuss uh, with you which is especially related to your hr management so one is your ram or rasi ram means your responsibility assignment matrix or rasi is, uh, is more or less you know same thing uh, is basically responsible accountable concert or informed charge so where you basically have some list of activities let's say right uh, this kind of table you will form oops I'm sorry let me just remake another table here. so let's say you have uh, this is responsibility table right some responsibilities are there so let's say this is one responsibility two three and four so against this they will be you know some person will be responsible someone will be accountable someone will be you know just consulted or someone need to be informed right based on decision so you need to find out which person 
for a particular activity need to be either responsible or he will be accountable or he will be just uh, you know consulted or maybe just his uh, for information so like this you can develop this matrix this is what is mean by your ram or resi matrix Tight matrix again we have discussed this is related to your function type whether functions is uh, related to separately or working together you can refer to our the very uh, first section where we have discussed what exactly do you mean by tight matrix or matrix or uh, organization and you can get into detail right so basically tight matrix means the placing the project team member under one roof or you know as close as possible so that they can frequently communicate and you know work on the uh, given objective hero effects another terms in a project management is a special variable trait of the individual specific uh, to you know the individual with that is promoted not transition to a higher level of skill so well it's it helps the team but you know it, it doesn't help to grow you know exponentially or let's say in a longer term so uh, this is another term for the human resource another one is transformational the person uh, with the leadership style is true leader who inspire so it's again another trait of uh, uh, the persons who is basically having a transformation characteristics or these kind of people are normally you know leads organization right then another one is the transactional leadership this is basically more like uh, i can say the technical or mechanical uh, uh, in terms so they are very good at technical knowledge or how the you know uh, the each nitty gritties of the system processes work so they mainly focus on short term task right so their leadership is basically driven by focusing on each short term task and activity so that you move to the next steps so these are the you know uh, key things or uh, so the less known uh, human resource terms which you, you will you may encounter uh, which may be helpful to you to uh, discuss have a great full great discussion with the team or identify the issue or basically you know helping you uh, effective human resource management plan so let's move to the next section so whenever you get a team let's say you have a team right you acquire a team okay and you you basically you know develop their uh, development plan and manage you are managing a team now once you assign a team a team is nothing but you know the group of people right the group of people so whenever you have the group of people you basically do a uh, first very first thing you do is communicate right you try to communicate with the people that's the first activity which you're going to do right when you say communicate this is the way the human interact with another human right they interact with another human through communication and this is what the first thing which you do whenever you have team member or assigned team member so the very next question is that how we communicate with people right especially how we do the communication communication on projects right because communication will basically tell the each people what they have to do so communication is basically you need to provide the right information at the right time to the right people and that's become very critical in terms of project success so how we do it in projects right how actually we do communicate professionally on project and make sure the you know all the key information are passed to the key stakeholder at right time so this is what we are going to learn in our next chapter and this is one of the critical component of project management so now comes the communication management right this is one of the key area of project management so anything all activity every <coughs> every activity you do require some sort of uh, communication right every activity we do require some sort of communication so communicating a report communicating progress communicating decision made in various meeting all those things has to be communicated properly to 
the correct stakeholder so it's communication is basically about right information right right information at right time to right people right this is the gist of communication or let's say i will say effective communication this is what is mean by effective communication is you need to provide the information but you need to provide information to the right people at right time and you know uh, basically the right information okay so let's discuss all those things in in this session and learn about the overall communication management how it's managed manage in the professional project so what actually lies behind the successful communication so we you know the element of any communicating what is basically means that how the communication will be effective how do we call or what are the things which is basically considered as effective or successful communication so if we see for any successful communication to happen it has to be seven element right this need to consist of an element uh, so this is basically the sender right who is sending the information whatever may the information is the next element is the receiver right so whenever you are transmitting any information so there is a person a and person b so he is a sender he or she is a sender right and he is transmitting some data right some data or information through verbal written or any any form right is performing uh, uh, transporting or let's say transferring the information to person b and this person is basically nothing what is known as receiver right so there is a sender there is a receiver and then there is a message itself so message means this is thing this is basically a message so this message could be your data it could be you know uh, some information it could be in written form it could be electronic form whatever form or whatever way the signal you can see is basically there is a sender there is a receiver and there is a message which has to be transferred from a to b okay and then the channel is the right channel which is basically through which this message is getting transferred is message is getting to transfer through email right or through phone or through chat or through face to face meeting right there could be lot of channel lot of ways the two people can connect right given the current technological advancement information technology development there are numerous way numerous way a person a can be connected to person b and this basically means there could be lot of channels between person a and b to get the information transferred right then there is a noise so what we can utilize right there is some noise there is some sort of disturbance in terms of some disconnection disconnectivity or maybe some misinformation right there may be some misinformation in the message which is actually uh, embedded in the message so that is what basically noise means noise means what is different than an ideal message or ideal uh, information becomes your noise right and then you have a feedback so once that person or let's say the receiver receive the message right then he will reply back right or he will provide a feedback right so either he will send a message or he will you know uh, maybe read it and wait for some time and then send it a message uh, maybe he provide some feedback verbally maybe he is not providing the feedback and remember providing not a feedback is also a communication right this is one of the matter of communication no feedback is a communication right maybe intended not intended that's a different thing but no feedback itself is a communication and then the context right context means basically the overall topic or the message this is what is all about the topic the context which someone is talking about right so these are the seven key elements of any communication which is happening around you in project in professional life personal life anywhere you will see you will find this seven element is always present there right so 
every good communication or even say if you're planning your communication plan for your project it should answer basically five w's right when i say five w's five w's is basically who what when where and why so in any communication plan you should must answer these five w's who what basically who will be providing information or will be sending information what information being sent when it will be sent where it will be sent and why it has to send so once you answer this five y or five w's you will be basically having an effective communication plan so these are the key thing right i'm not saying this is everything but these are the key uh, mantra i will say or uh, the key uh, key secret i will say right secrets of your uh, successful communication management so the very next question comes that what are the key steps or in practical sense let's say you decide to implement the things implement the communication plan in actual sense in a practical way what are the steps you are supposed to take right what are the practical ways or practical sense you are supposed to take to uh, you know implement those communication plan now in general there are five steps so one is basically establishing the goal basically what do you want to achieve right what do you want to uh, achieve from the communication that is important okay very very important then you need to find out who are the key audience whom you want to send this information right and then in the message itself the information which you're sharing right the information from a to b what will include what are the what will be the content of the message maybe just one line some paragraph some report some documents what are those things which you want to include in this information or your key message right then creating a tactical outreach plan right so basically what it's mean when you send a message from one person to another person or transmit a message there could be several scenarios or several response from the various person including yourself including you as a sender so what are the plan for those i mean various uh, situation or scenario how you will basically you know outreach those situations or outreach uh, the particular queries maybe or depending upon the situation you may have to reply in a different way so the thing is that you need to have some sort of idea for that right then you need to specify the timeline for moving forward so any communication any communication which is not time bounded remember time bounded so any communication to be effective it has to be attached with your timeline if a communication is not attached with your timeline or the boundary of timeline its effectiveness decreases probably it will become ineffective over a duration so it's very important to have a defined timeline or definite timeline attached to your communication plan which will basically ensures the effectiveness or it will tell you you know if whether the plan is going to be effective or the communication is being effective or not so we have discussed enough about the communication right so we have discussed various element what is a successful communication now what do we exactly mean by communication management itself right what do you mean by communication management communication is so simple thing right we are doing every day in your personal life professional life everywhere you see the communication so why there is a management is required why do we need to you know do it in very uh, structured or serious way so what is the basically you know uh, mean by this when you say communication management isn't that so simple uh, why do we have to be professionally recognize it so if you see the definition of the communication management right so communication management is an umbrella term referring to the flow of information within company between the multiple companies maybe within company it could be within teams within persons right uh, depending upon that you know it can be communication between even two machine also 
right machine a and machine b they do transfer data or information right they also communicate so it is simply means a flow of oh sorry flow of information this is what is mean uh, by your communication management so this is what definition is now what exactly is that is focus the company's target audience right when you say the communication management communication management is very much specific to the stakeholders so when you include the management word it means that you are doing a communication with specific uh, you know the specific audience specific targets and with specific objective right so and that that include maybe different kind of communication it has different method of communication different way of implementing those communication channel communication method throughout the project and get the effective you know get the results what is required so this is what is mean by your communication management in professional world i will say right and we will you know, soon discuss is what exactly it means in project management right that we will be discussing in later slides so if you talk about the role of management well it's a no-brainer right so i'm not going to discuss much in detail but if we see simply it's promote the motivation by informing and clarifying the employee about the tasks to be done in the manner they are performing the task right or they are supposed to perform the task is basically improve the performance so this is what the role of communication in any organization or any project or any small team even you know between the two team in your personal professional life so it's basically promote the motivation right and then second thing it helps the team to identify the performance or track the performance or where they can improve in terms of you know uh, performing their activity or their task assigned to them So initially we discuss, you know, various type of communication. Now we talk about the effective communication and especially in, you know, the management uh, world. What are the type of communication we would like to know? I mean, how many ways are available in normal, generally in management world or let's say project management world where we communicate, right? So there are basically, you know, these five uh, way you normally communicate. One is a verbal communication, which is kind of very much formal, right? Which we mostly use in meetings and face-to-face uh, -face meetings or maybe video call conference. Written mode communication, most common method is, or the most common uh, uh, tool which we use uh, to utilize this mode of communication is emails, right? We communicate a lot in emails in terms of written mode. Body movement, yeah, this happens well, less frequent, but do happens, you know, especially during the face-to-face -face meeting, right, or uh, official gathering, you can say that, right. Okay, so there, there you see this kind of uh, communication a lot. Facial expression, again, it's uh, during, happen during face-to-face -face meeting or maybe official gathering or the meeting in person right gesture right this is again predominantly uh during the face to face or there we have uh, you know the a meeting uh in person with with people with team with the officials so these kind of communications are more more used in this scenario whereas verbal communication are mostly used for meetings face to face or these days it's more like you know the video conferencing or meeting uh, over the internet through the face call or whatever then written mode is predominantly i say emails it could be documents also something you can write in document printed form written form depends upon that but mostly if you see the current modern project management world scenario emails are the major tool here which utilized to do this kind of communication so 
we have talked about the communication, we have talked about the professional communication, we have talked about various elements of communication and where the various methods through which the professional communication happens. Now coming to our main agenda, what is the project communication, right? So what exactly do we mean by the project communication? So if you go by definition, basically what happens is it includes the processes, right, which require to ensure the timely and appropriate generation, storage, retrieval, distribution, disposition of project information, right? Remember, so we are basically utilizing or communicating with the various data or information of the project uh, through you know generating the information storing the information retrieving or distributing or maybe you know disposing of even Disposing of the project information which is not required which is supposed to be confidential all those things do happen in certain project and Doing all those activity managing all those activity defining how you're going to do those activities is basically your project communication management means this is what it means by project communication management okay and this there is a structured process like we have the other, other knowledge area in the same way project communication process also have structured defined processes which we will be learning in next session so uh, project communication management process right if you see this process is basically contain three major steps one is your plan communication management then you manage communication you need to manage the communication and then control the communication so these are the three steps which you should be taking or which is a part of your project communication uh, management plan which you should be taking care of as a project manager right. uh, let's let's discuss detail each each step and see you know other key elements for those uh, each processes so plan communication management right so plan communication management is basically the same thing which we you know we did for all the other knowledge area we started all the knowledge area let's say the cost we have cost the plan cost management for scope we have plan scope management we have uh, for time plan time management process so before starting any process we did some planning right we need to do some planning and which becomes your step number one in all those knowledge area process management so the same case applies here right so to have a proper project communication plan you need to plan it before you know even doing those activity so this is what is mean by that plan communication management and if we want to go by definition it says the process of developing an appropriate approach and plan for project communication based on stakeholder information needs requirement and available organization assets so whatever information you have as of now depending on that you need to basically plan your activity or plan your overall you can say uh, blueprint how you will be basically planning your plan uh, project communication this is what it's mean by that overall uh, you can say overall management I will not say management but overall planning uh, for communication communication management okay. so like every other process we have this process also which is plan communication management and remember this is your step one right why is step one saying that this is a part of your plan communication management of overall project communication plan project communication plan this is the first step right step number one so and like we discussed the all the steps have some inputs some tools some goals and everything so in terms of input you need to do basically communication management plan then we have the work performance report then you need to basically provide the uh, enterprise environment factor, then organization process assets. So this this kind of information you need to collect and and utilize this information with help of this some tools or let's say techniques to 
arise some output. Now, what are the techniques you're going to use? There are a lot of communication method techniques, technologies available. So I'm not going to detail all of those techniques, but there are some performance reporting, some information management system, communication technologies are there, their methods, models are there, which helps you to have a better communication or analyze the data in better way, depending upon the context of the data. So those kind of things and techniques you can use. And then by utilizing those, you will arrive at some output, right? Or let's say the goal. So what is your output would be in this process? So first thing, you will get the project communication. Basically, what exactly you will be communicating, right? What are those communication means? Definitions, what will be content, those kind of information will be there. Project management plan. So of course, you know, your project management plan will get updated based on the new communication plan. Then you the documentation and organization process that of course depending upon the new uh, information or analysis or output you receive, you may need to update your previous document, right? So this is what about your planned communication management process, right? This is a step number one, and this is what you're supposed to do for completing this step one, right? So once you plan your communication, the next step, right? The next step is your manage communication. That is a basically uh, step number two, right? So if you go by definition, it's basically a process of creating, collecting, distributing, storing, retrieving, and ultimate disposition of project related information. So whatever you have planned in step one, right? Whatever planning you have done, you need to basically execute those planning in step two, which is basically called manage communication. So if you decided to create some document, some format, some process, you need to create those. Then you need to collect the information or you have decided to distribute this report regularly basis to some or store this information. Depending upon that, whatever plan you had, you basically implement those plans to have effective project communication, right? This is what it's mean by the managed communication, right? And this is what become the part of your communication management plan. So this is what mean by the managed communication. You need to actually do all those activity, whatever you plan in terms of communication. So manage communication, right? Now manage communication is your second step. Remember, this is a step of this overall three step process. Now in the second step, what are the information you will be required? These are your inputs, right? Or let's say these are the informations which you will need as an input to do this process. So you will need project management plan, stakeholder register, of course, an enterprise management factor and, and, and process asset, organization process that this is common, right? So once you collect this information, you will, with the help of some tools, right? Or some techniques, so these are technique, communication, like methods, models, all those things. You need to utilize or need to utilize this tool to arrive at output, right? These are the output here. You should be doing that. What are those output is? Communication management plan is the first output. Second thing is, again, project document update. Depending upon the new findings, you may need to update your existing documents. Project documents, depending upon, you know, or whatever input you got, right, or whatever results you got with the six, uh, with the six uh, sorry, the second step. So, the second step is basically related to the management or, or managing or let's say the executing whatever you have planned in first step, right? This is what it's mean. Okay, so first step is planning, second step is executing, and then the next step. That is your third step is your control. Now, once you planned it, executed that, of course, you know, project is spread over a long duration. So there's a start, there's a finish, right? In between that, suppose you started, you planned it here, and then you make some document and implemented those process, document reporting, everything. Now, over this time period, there could be different of changes which may happen accordingly. You need to, you know, see, control how you will be actually controlling those information. You may need to stop some of the information sh uh, sharing. You may need to add some of the information sharing. All those things may happen during this period, right? And this is what you need to do as a control management or control communication. 
okay so this is what it means so that we are going to learn in next phase uh, and and this is what the overview of your managed communication process so control communication okay now control communication is basically the process of monitoring and controlling communication throughout the entire project life cycle to ensure the information needs on the project and stakeholder are met right so basically it is throughout the interior as we discussed in previous slide right so throughout the project life cycle from the start till finish you need to do the controlling monitoring all those stuff so that you have the effective communication right and, and the right information is received by the right stakeholders so uh, in terms of process input output system we have some input information which is basically issue logs work performance data project man plan project communication and uh, you know and uh, then organization process asset so these kind of things you will be need as input basically what they are in uh, what what supposed to be informed what is information required uh, what is a plan what is the data performance data and is there any issue is already logged so all those kind of information you have to get it and then utilize some tools or let's say some techniques now those techniques are information management system expert judgment meeting and all those stuff you need to utilize to achieve or to arrive at this goal right and this goal is basically what your output okay now so output is basically work performance information you may need to update this information based on the latest uh, development of the project you may need to do some changes in your processes you need to update your project plan then you document those things and of course they may be need to update of your process organization process or organization of uh, documentation stuff so this was your third step right remember so this is overall full uh, combination of uh, project management plan for communication so first step was plan communication management then the second step was a manage communication and then third step is your control communication so your project communication plan is you know not it's not just a plan but it's sort of agreement between the collaborators stakeholders right so all kind of stakeholders collaborator they outline they basically agree that what when how the project performance or project information i will say uh, inform including information will be shared at key interval or the key you know uh, time bound or time manner remember every communication every communication has to be time bounded has to be time bounded to be to be effective otherwise it's no more effective it's not time bounded right so this is what it means so we are the company all team they come together and they give some sort of sign off or get an agreement that what information when they will be sharing how they will be sharing uh in all those information of that agree this is what it mean by a project communication plan right so in project communication plan performance report or i will say you know project information report project uh information reports play a key role right key roles in you know communicating the various project information now you must be curious right what are the non usual I, you know there are some key reports uh, which is most commonly used report which i will be discussing now but you know it can vary depending upon type of projects or industry but most common reports are like status report so status report basically contains what the project team has accomplished in relationship of schedule and budget so as of now as on date what actually has been completed in terms of scope budget what was the cost consumed what is the position of the budget how much we are consuming the budget what is the timeline are we on time or delayed or basically uh, you know uh, we are ahead of the schedule those kind of information you need to provide in the status report okay now once you get the status report now next thing is your variance report so variance report is remember whenever the project starts we commit some time cost 
scope right we decide we know that what will the time take we know what the cost is going to take and then it also aware we are also aware that what are the scope of work and the timeline right we know when it will start and when it is supposed to finish right now when we starting remember it's always a plan right we plan at this point but when the project progress during the time or over the period there may be a lot of changes it may not be as planned it may be more than planned it may be ahead of the plan now comparing with baseline and the current situation and the finding the delta is your call basically variance report now delta could be in your terms of schedule what is delta in your schedule what is delta in your scope what is delta in your cost or less the budget so this is what is mean by the variance report then the next important report is a trend analysis report trend analysis report basically predict what could happen in the future so if you see for let's say uh, 10 months right 1 2 3 4 7, 8 9 10 for continuous 10 months some activities are getting delayed right then it is very likely that this activity is going to delay in future also because you see there is a continuous trend of declining or delaying of the activity which basically indicate in future you may have those activity delay most likely right most likely those activities are going to delay until unless some miracle has happened right miracle so on projects usually people Sometime I see you know, people rely on miracles, but it, it, it doesn't happen, right? Miracle never happens in project. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So other key reports are the progress report. Then progress report is again which tells you how much project have proceeded, and what is remaining progress is there, and what is the for, you know forecast for those progress. Forecast report basically is predict the future status and progress depending upon the current situation plus the various factor which we have about the project. Project, uh, you know, forecast report can tell if our cost will keep on increasing or cost will go down, maybe time we will have delay or maybe have, you know, we will have some scope reduction from the client, blah, blah, all those things. So this basically tells you or forecast you what could happen to all those key factors. Then the earn value report as is one of the key report or key tool for control, project control, right? I will have a separate chapter for this one, but in simply it basically integrate your scope, cost and time to measure overall project performance, right? Uh, and uh, I don't want to go into detail in this report now, but uh, we will definitely discuss this later on. So there are some I will say the key principle for any you know communication especially on the project which you need to follow to have a concise and very effective communication one is a comprehensive right be comprehensive people should not be left wondering that what he's talking about or what you are talking about you should be very concise right and comprehensive right to the point right to the point what you want to discuss or what you want to share what you want to know clarity is another principle right the in purpose of the message should be very clear worded that what exactly do you expect from the message what is your ask or what is your task from that what do you think that you could be doing with that information or expecting someone else to do for with the information then the attention is tied of course when you're sending a message it should be attentive and it should be directed to the cons you know uh, concerned stakeholder you cannot write the general email or addressing the general people depending upon the topic right and 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 the message which you want to convey to the particular person it has to be attentive and of course it has to be styled depending upon the various situation and tone and everything has to be you know uh, aligned with the topic or the context of the problem or message Coherency again, okay, you need to it has to be coherent in terms of attention, style, context, and other messages. Then timeliness and urgency very important. So as I mentioned earlier, every communication has to be effective, 
and if it has to be effective then it has to be always time bounded a communication without a time bound as a timeless timeline is an ineffective communication right then the importance of feedback remember right so communication which is not one way or it shouldn't be one way it should be always both way and that's basically increase the effectiveness so that's why it's very important to receive the feedback right until unless you get the feedback it will be very difficult for you to decide the future course of action or how you can better tackle those situation uh, depending upon you know or upon sharing uh, those information then there's one more critical factor which is very common and very easy but I'm not going to tell you you have to tell me think upon it and just let me know by putting a comment below so to do the communication skill uh, so to the effective communication you would need some sort of communication skill in fact you will definitely need some good communication skill to have effective communication so what are the five common communication skill or must have a communication skill to have effective communication one is your written communication you should be very good at conveying your idea through writing language to, uh, or to write uh, through emails or messages or drafting message whatever you have to be very much good at written communication then oral communication too because you know in normal in professional world you have a lot of meeting you interact with a lot of people throughout the meeting understand their idea share your idea maybe conflict with the idea or resolve those ideas and these all could be possible only if you have the good command over oral communication right you should be able to convey your idea and your information through the spoken language then the other critical element is your non-verbal and visual communication basically your body language the way you say the things the way you interpret the things or react to the things is very very important fourth one is active listening so remember if you if there is a communication has to happen between a to b and if the both person a to b a is speaking to b b is speaking to a at the same time basically they both are trying to convey or send their message at the same time this will be a complete disaster right so to have effective communication skill you need to have effective listening skill right effective listening skill very important you need to have very very uh, you know effective listening it is more important than even you know speaking than listening to be have effective and fruitful uh, communication then the contextual communication also important right remember every communication happens on sub subject some topics some context is there for any communication to happen some kind of history some kind of references you need to always understand to have a good communication that what is that context you're talking about what is the context of the talking what is the topic what is supporting information about the communication which helps you uh, you know uh, send your idea across the board or all those uh, the people or stakeholders uh, who is involved in the communication channel right so these are the five communication skill which you should be working on it if you don't have any of them please start working on them if you have none of them no problem you can start with first one and try to you know acquire all those skills so overall summary right project communication plan so we have seen various sub process and this is overall overview of our project communication communication plan or let's say communication management right this is a overall process project communication management process first step project communication second step project communication uh, project communication management plan project document update and then organizational process you know update right so you can go to the definition and just uh, i'm not going to detail we have already discussed in detail in previous slides so please go through this doc, uh, definition understand the processes and then also also understand these definitions right so process point of view just you know uh, uh, basically first thing you need to plan it 
right and then you need to basically execute the communication which is basically manage communication right and then control communication three step okay plan manage control so next summary points right for the communication management plan let's see some of the you know the key I, uh, ideas so there's a type of communication right i have not gone into the much detail but there's a type of communication one is called push pull communication the push means you're sending out the information to a specific recipient whereas pull means your content at your own description right the pull means the recipient will basically access the content based on your own description so let's say sending an email to a you know selected recipient where you decided to send some message is kind of push method where let's say you have uploaded a doc or you continuously upload document at uh, some box server and where you know from where people pull this information so this is kind of a pull um, example where sending an email is your kind of push example right issue logs the document maintained by the project team including resolved and unresolved issue basically it's contain all, all all issues change log we use a document change that occurred during the project so basically all the changes which you get throughout the processes is basically your change log you try to understand what are the changes what happens and all get recorded so that you know anyone can refer to those uh, change logs then the focus report this basically predict the future of the project status and progress this will depend upon the current status various data various feedback you got it from the various uh, function and depending on that you, you know, basically get this focus report now the progress report is contains you know how the project team has accomplished as of now as on date what is the progress is this is what's different uh, represent to you uh, the progress of the project will depend upon the current status uh, in terms of your cost progress in terms of your uh, schedule and how much scope you have covered as of now okay so we have seen a lot of things as of now right we have seen scope we have seen time management we have seen cost management we have seen you know uh, just seen communication management right we, so far we have learned about uh, scope management time management cost management quality hr and communication right now after learning this knowledge area after understanding how we manage these knowledge area in project management world the next concept which we want to like to learn is your risk right because why at this point of risk remember these are the elements which we have learned which are based on you know the actual uh, contract or the kind of uh, a contract signed between uh, contractor and client and which is basically uh, uh, you know some sort of fixed information i would say which is already known to you based on that uh, mainly based on those information uh, you can do the planning or you can plan or you know arrange or have management plan to basically manage this knowledge areas now from this point of onward right from this point of onward now we need to look into those areas where the things uh, you know the things which you are not sure if this will happen or not right things which is uncertain right uncertain or let's say not sure about probability of occurrence right so so far i mean you have learned uh, or you plan everything is was certain here right whatever we have planned so far so you know what was scope you know it was time you know you know based on those uh fixed scope and time you know what's the cost and then you know what is the quality requirement and based on that you know what is your resources and everything is required and then you know who to communicate right because you know your folks uh, you know your scope time uh, quality everything 
So based on that, you have determined on of things where you have 100% probability of occurrence, right? You know these are going things going to happen. But now on project, there are certain things or there are a lot of things which you are not sure whether they will occur or not occur right so those element where you have the probability means you are not sure about about occurrence or non occurrence those are basically known as risk right we call them risk and project is always surrounded by a lot of risk remember projects is not just one time event but it's a series of event over a period of time right let's say this is your start point and this is a finish point and the projects is has to operate or go certain various activity maybe you know till your project is completed so during this period of time or during this uh, duration there could be a lot of factors a lot of unknown factor let's say unknown factors which may impact your projects right and those are basically known as risk which you need to think or plan or assume based on your knowledge area feedback from various uh, stakeholders team members you need to identify those risks and have a mitigation plan or have a planning in place in case of those events occur how you will be planning those things how you will be minimizing the cost impact so those kind of things are basically done at risk management section and that's what we're going to learn so let's deep dive in this subject so what is risk management well if you talk in terms of definition so risk management is basically the process of identifying assessing controlling threats right Remember, your project is always bounded with a lot of threats throughout the uh, you know duration of the project from start to finish. There's different kind of risk which continuously coming in a uh, project, and the team need to identify those risks and try to mitigate the impact of those risks. Right? This is what is mean by the risk management in terms of core concept. So, these risks can be you know from the various uh, sources right they can come from various sources because it could be due to the financial uncertainty some legal pro issues there some technology issues there staging management factor internal accident uh, some accident that happened some natural disaster and so on I mean there's an infinite infinite reason infinite reasons which can bring you the risk right so the thing is that you don't have control over all those you know uh, the infinite reasons the thing is that you need to identify based on the current information what could be the possible risk and imagine the max impact or the ma uh, worst case scenario so that you can assess you know what could be the, your major maximum risk what could be the minimum impact maybe some risk can provide you benefits some risk will provide well uh, can be proven a disaster to you so the thing is that all those options you need to assess depending upon the possible risk and then have a mitigation plan in place so that you ever you are in a position when those risk occurs right this is what it's mean by the risk management okay so i mean why it's important to uh, you know uh, deal with risk management why it is so important to have a uh, that much amount uh, that much amount of focus or I would say I know uh, a major portion of your planning actually goes for risk management right or let's say the major portion of your management activity is actually has to focus on risk management right because a uh, risk successful risk management program can help an organization to range basically face various kind of uh, risk right because like I mentioned earlier a project start from uh, start to finish 
right? It could have impacted by infinite number of risk, right? Infinite number of risk could impact this. Now, thing is that due to this infinite number of risk, shall we stop do stop doing a project because there's infinite number of risk? Well, no. The thing is that out of those infinite number of risks, what are the risks actually valid risk, right? Which could happen, all right? And maybe some of them are completely imaginary, uh, which may not happen, but maybe some are some valid uh, risk, which may happen given the current scenario or given the various situation in which the project is being carried out. And that's why it's very important to focus on those factors and manage those uh, risks, right? So risk basically, you know, also, examine the relationship uh, between your strategy goal and what are the risks we have and uh, among those risks basically you explore the opportunity to benefit or to attain your financial goal or let's say the company's financial goal even though by meeting you know those uh, dealing with risk while you are doing your project work. So this is, uh, you know, the concept or this is the strategy in way the things are managed in professional worlds, right? So that's why you can't simply ignore the risk management and you can say, okay, I will not do a project where there's no risk. Well, that's not possible because without risk, uh, there is not a single project which exists in the world, right? So you need to assess it carefully since you can't ignore it, right? You can't, you, you can't stop uh, or you uh, simply don't, uh, I mean, follow a strategy where you don't do the project. I mean, that's not possible, right? You have to do the projects to grow your business. Now, that's not, if that's not an option, then of definitely you need to look into the risks and manage those risks, right? Have a practical look, all your available risks and try to come up with some mitigation which helps you or which helps your company strategy or goals to reach uh, that objective. So let's say, I mean, you know, what if you don't deal with risk at all, right? Don't deal with risk. I mean, that could be one option, right? You simply don't deal with risk, either you leave it or you completely ex accept it and, you know, uh, take the impact of those uh, risks. Now, let's say you just ignore the risk, right? because there is a probability it may occur it may not occur you're not sure about it so you decide okay uh, we'll just ignore it so in that case what happened if your organization you know hit with something unforeseen event right and it could be minor or major remember right i'm not saying every risk is a major impact or every risk has a minor impact it could be major or minor depending upon that uh, the risk or the condition now, in minor situation, there is a possibility you may able to mitigate or you may able to, uh, you know, or your project may bear the impact or it may go through uh, the impact. But if it's major, right, or let's say if it's worst case scenario, then in that case, it could be catastrophic or even your project is failed or maybe your company shut down due to this one risk it's it's possible right we have several examples in history where just one event one event brought down the whole company right and that event is was basically not something which is not imagined before the event that occurred those were kind of risk and probably there was no proper mitigation plan was in place to deal with those, those risks. So when those catastrophic events occurred, company cannot survive. A company could not survive. There are a lot of examples we can discuss uh, in history where these kind of events occur. So that's why it's very important to look into the risk, even though they are, you are, they are not sure at the current point of time that they will occur or not but once they occur they have a huge tendency or they may have a huge implication on your uh, overall project or let's say your company also so that's why it's very important to reduce risk 
right it's very important to reduce the risk and of course to do that to mitigate that you will require some resources addition resources you will require additional to monitor and control to have the mitigation plan in place but yes working on those mitigation plan reducing those risks actually benefits the project in long term right so there has to be a consistent and systematic approach right for to risk management which basically determines how best you can identify remember the risk is all about first identifying it and then managing it and mitigate it so these are the several things which you need to do in your IR risk management basically identifying managing and mitigating so that you have the least impact least impact of those event when they occur on a project that's why risk is something which you can't ignore you have to deal it if you want to succeed in your long term if you want to secure your in, uh, project's interest or project's benefit you have to deal with the risk there's no other option so uh, well once you clear that there's no other option with you know except dealing the risk so you have to deal risk in any situation there is no uh, you know uh, no no ignoring or let's say there's no option that you can simply leave this risk right you have to deal with risk now risk management is not an easy task right risk management is tough and why it is tough there are several factors but some of the big factors are some of the main reason i will tell you first thing the risk itself are complex right so when i say complex means as the time passes then a lot of you know uh, risk related to projects so let's say how the projects arrive right how do we get the projects or how do company gets the project right company gets projects from various financial event or various uh, economic events which occur uh, let's say in the particular eco uh, ecosystem or through the various countries through the various government or various policies so those projects come through various uh, you know complex decisions taken in modern world right and they are continuously decisions are being taken based on the decisions some projects are um, uh, decided by various authority organization even the private organization and then that's how they get float uh, you know uh, float tenders and then it's become projects and some contractor will come and start doing the project so it's becoming very complex and complex scenario right and especially uh, if you see the global globalization factors right and the various uh, other uh, economic factors which are involved so what happens all those factors are basically bringing some complex project right complex projects are being dealt more uh, in, you know in, in modern world or let's say the modern um, project management history and that's what brings the complex project actually brings a complex risk right so complex project simply means complex risk so if project is complex definitely it will have the risk associated with its uh, you know uh, complex in nature and that's why it's become very difficult to manage because once the risk is complex then definitely to manage the risk will become double or even more than uh, that uh, in terms of complexity because there's a lot of factors which can impact those risks and there's a lot of events or outcome can come due to one complex risk right so and that's why it's become very difficult to have a efficient risk management because of increasing complexity right next thing is volatility remember we are living in a volatile right volatile um, world i will say well not volatile but i will say i think the most suitable word will be dynamic we are living in dynamic world right which is basically growing at faster and faster pace which again brings various nature of risk and of course then managing this kind of risk and even identifying them it's difficult 
then the next factor which actually make us difficult is your technology evaluation right we are living in a you know, technology era i will say the best technology area of whom uh, age of human or let's say mankind so we are living at the best technology age a best technology era now this technology itself brings a lot of risk right so this could be you know uh, coming from the digital technology this could be uh, various kind of risk which is related to technology because a lot of technology are new we are still learning about those technology so always there is a risk associated with these technologies right and we are in a continuous path of utilizing or interacting or bringing those technology in our daily life in our all kind of decision which we make whether we make it personal decision professional decision and of course when those technologies associated technologies are involved with decision uh, the risk related to those technology get also associated with that and that's what basically brings the complexity when we do any project uh, which brings you know those kind of risk then the manifestation right so when i say manifestation there are other things in fact you know including these various factor that self become a new factor which manifests by itself let's say the corona right there is an example is corona corona is actually nothing but it's a manifestation of various other factors it could be your climate change it could be your some uh, there could be various reason you know which actually brings this kind of factors and it was completely unknown and the whole world was caught at surprise so there could be certain risk which manifest based on the new event which may not be even you know anyone is aware of it and that's why uh, you know this this these nature actually makes the risk management tough right so in short risk management is really tough all right but anyway it's not an impossible task but of course it's, it's tough and it's required a lot of attention a lot of effort so that team can you know better manage the risk when they're doing their project so remember one thing we do not manage the risk that we have no risk right basically means the risk management purpose is not that you identify some all the risk you identify all the risk right and you simply remove all those risks right that is not the purpose you cannot remove the risks risk or risk right the unit at maybe in today's situation you may think the risk will not occur maybe very next day some event did occur and then that risk is again came into picture so the purpose of risk management is never to reduce all the risk to zero or just simply make the project risk free it's not possible you cannot make a project risk free remember and that is not the purpose of risk management the purpose of management risk management is to identify whether that risk is worth taking or not right since you cannot remove the all the risk from your project right you cannot remove the project uh you know the project you cannot make the project a risk free so in that case you would like to know okay what those risk risk number 1 risk number 2 out of which risk which i should be taking which i should be accepting which is worthy and which is not worthy that is the main purpose of the risk right when i say worthy worthy means whether it will give you the enough payout or, or enough benefits right or enough you know um, uh, maybe some financial benefits or some other benefits which actually helps the project or the company in their objective so that is the whole purpose of the risk remember risk is not about reducing uh, the risk or making the project risk free risk management is all about to identify those risks which is worth taking and which can help you uh, provide you some benefit that's what the purpose of the risk management so risk management is always related to risk appetite right when i say risk appetite it's a risk appetite of company right maybe you know uh, some particular organization so 
risk appetite means let's say there are some projects right and which are inherently risk risky projects let's say uh, nuclear power plant right they are very risky projects right any technical things which go wrong which can bring disaster right disasters to the uh, organization disasters to country it, it, it can have a huge impact if something goes wrong on a nuclear power plant project but still companies do that right still we have nuclear power plants are being built still a lot of pro projects which are going on related to the power plant we have not stopped building the power plant right why because there is a benefit associated with that right there's a benefit in terms of your uh, energy uh, securing or uh, in terms of your uh, uh, meeting the demand of the power so there are certain benefits which is still attached with this project right so even though this project is so risky the project is being done right and that is what is mean by and by your risk appetite so there's a capability there's a big company who can still build these projects and having some you know expected risk exposure right they think that okay if some events occur maybe you know you will be having this kind of uh, event and this kind of risk it may bring but still let's do those projects because we have bigger benefits we have bigger benefits out of those projects so it's always given the risk management is basically varies from companies to company organization to organization maybe you can say government to government so while doing any project the company always look at their policy how they take a risk or whether they have the capability to navigate through those uh, risk event or to bear those uh, consequences of the risk and still you know able to meet the project objective and that will completely vary to vary a big size company may have you know bigger uh capability or bigger appetite to take risk and then uh, operate their business whereas a small company they will not be able to survive so they will not even you know uh think about some big risk or big value of risk which may have huge impact maybe in terms of finance or in, in terms of you know the monetary benefits so that's all depends upon what is your risk appetite or uh, you know uh, uh, of a company and then you have the risk tolerance right so risk tolerance is basically related to the limit right you may have the certain range let's say you have uh, some big company right a multi uh, billion company right so they may be able let's say the risk of if they say some risk event which is between which can in, uh, bring an uh, impact of 0 to 50 million dollar well they are very good at it I mean fine even those uh, at in one project they may have a loss of 50 million they can recover it from other projects by doing you know billion dollar project so that may be a risk appetite for a company a right but for a company b who is just you know few million whose uh, overall turnover is let's say 100 million now for this 100 million company it's not possible to take a risk of 50 million right they have very less appetite less capacity to deal with this kind of risk but a multi-billion company they can easily you know bear this risk so that's what is mean by your range or capability of uh, you know uh, dealing uh, with the risk so it's, it's just like you know driving a car so you have certain limit green range where you can drive the car which is basically your risk appetite right you can drive the car safely between this range then there is something risk tolerance basically it means let's say if you want to drive the car and maybe you need some urgency or some uh, particular focus you can increase your limit uh, you know by certain range and then there is some range which are very dangerous right now you 
it depends upon your company's policy or let's say you know it depends upon the particular requirement whether do you want to take the risk or not right let's say it's driving a car so when i say it's a safe range of driving a car maybe in some cases you may increase your car a little bit more the speed depending upon you know uh, the particular situation but after certain range it's become very dangerous where you can say the lethal if you drive in this speed because this will have very severe consequences right and that's kind of become your unacceptable risk or let's say the limit zone or the speed limits which is unacceptable so same way for any risk there is a green zone there is a yellow zone and there's a red zone now the, your idea is to operate somewhere between green to yellow and not to reach in a red zone where it's if this even occur let's say in this speed case if something happened wrong at this speed definitely it will be disaster right it will be simply lethal so in the same way if company has to operate or manage a risk then they need to basically identify these risks and not accept this and they need to work on these ranges of risk we will be you know dealing later detail what do you mean by uh, those ranges of the risk but this is how you know uh, the risk uh, management concept or in overall whether it's a project or the company this is how it works like uh, and that's what it mean by what is your risk appetite and what is your risk tolerance right and then what is your unacceptable range so it's all about your risk exposure right like we discussed earlier so basically risk management is looking at your risk exposure so what exactly this exposure is so if you go by definition it's a basically quanti uh, quantified potential loss from business activity which is currently underway or planned so basically it's a quantified impact you will say right quantified impact so that basically means as your risk exposure now once your risk exposure is calculated you need to understand the value the impact which you are getting whether that makes sense or not so basically it will depend upon how uh, you are assessing those risk exposures there are the certain level of calculation there are certain way of calculations which depends upon you know type of industry type of projects there are a lot of complex factors which brings uh you know which gets into the calculation of your exposure and it's become very complex and it can become a uh, become very complex depending upon the project to project in fact the similar type of projects the two similar type of projects may have very complex uh, you know or different approach of calculating the exposure so overall i mean in general for every risk when you calculate exposure you basically calculate two things one is the impact what could be the impact of that risk and what is the probability of the risk the for occurrence right this is the you know the key i will say the uh, the main uh, globally inherently nature of any risk exposure uh, calculation right so every risk exposure calculation will have some sort of impact assessment and then what's the probability of that event occurrence so when you multiply these two it will give you risk exposure this is what's mean by the risk exposure so risk exposure remember is nothing but your impact multiplied by probability of occurrence of that particular event this is what is mean by your risk exposure so why it is important i think it's very uh, obvious because that will form the basis to make the decision you need to basically find out based on this risk exposure you can basically list out your risk and see which risk let's say risk number 1 risk number 2 risk number 3 risk number 4 like this were several risk and based on their exposure value right based on the exposure value you can basically rank them 
right which is highest exposure uh, which is lowest exposure which has medium exposure like this you can rank it and then focus on the top maybe high risk or medium value risk uh, and then first mitigate those risks right you would not like to focus your resources on those risks where we have the very minimum or very least exposure of course you would like to first focus on those uh, risks where we have high exposure right and that's why it's very important to understand what is your risk exposure is right because uh, remember a risk has two factors one is impact one is probability so there could be some risk where impact is high but their occurrence is very low so probably you know uh, you may not be much worried but there are some impact where probability of occurrence is very high and impact could be medium or uh, you know uh, maybe high then you need to focus on those kind of risks because this is most probable or let's say the highest probability of impacting to your project right and then again and then most common type of risk exposure it could be brand damage compliance failure and you know security breach liability issues financial issues right those are also the risk um, something happened to the client uh, those are the risk something related to climate change there could be several risks which occurs you know uh, in, in a project environment so you need to basically keep on scanning throughout your project duration uh, all the risk right start from finish and understand what exactly happens or what exactly going to happen which will impact your project right and this is what we uh, would like to understand in the risk exposure uh, uh, concept so I think um, uh, by now you should be clear what is actually the risk what could it do you to your project and why it is important to deal with this uh, kind of risk to have a successful project management so coming back to the project risk management right so this is one of the knowledge area remember risk is one of the knowledge area of project which we need to manage and in terms of project specifically we talk about so basically if we go by definition it's a process uh, you know which includes uh, the activity which is required to increase or decrease the probability of occurrence or the impact of the positive event or let's say reduce the impact of the negative event so for positive event is basically known as your opportunity we call them opportunity you know positive risk are basically nothing but opportunity and then decrease the probability of negative impact so negative impacts are your risk right so you need to basically increase your opportunities and decrease your risk this is what the mean by your project risk management because every project may be some associated risk and associated opportunity and you need to deal with these two so you need to decrease this risk and increase the opportunity this is what you need to do in just or in, in principle while you're doing the project risk management so how this process work well i mean mainly it has four uh, component one is your first process you will identify them then you need to assess them and then make sure you're controlling those risks and then you continuously review it and based on that again you update your mitigation plan so this is how the risk management process work in general but let's understand this risk management process specifically for the project uh, various project steps and see what kind of steps are involved uh, while managing these projects so when we talk about the risk management process for projects right if we talk about the risk management process for the project so basically it involves these steps so first one is plan risk management this is basically the planning like we see for other uh, processes where everything starts with your planning and same is true for your risk management so you need to plan the whole process before you even start working on the process then the very next step of your risk management process identify those risks identification is the very first step of managing any risk and then you need to do the qualitative analysis qualitative means first you identify you don't need to get into detail in terms of quantification or let's say the magnitude or uh, find the assess the impact where you can measure it 
but first you need to simply identify them in a qualitative way that what are those risks what are the nature of this risk what are the properties of this risk this is what is mean by your qualitative analysis risk once you identify the qualitative then you move to the quantitative then you, where you try to identify okay you have this kind this nature of for this type of risk then what will be the impact of this risk in terms of how many values what will be the impact in terms of financial how many millions are going to lose how many duration let's say how many days uh, it will impact your project in terms of duration so this is the number of days or uh, in terms of monetary value or maybe other maybe it's bring some LD risk or liquidity damage then what's the penalty uh, value how many millions of penalty may be imposed if some risk is occurred so those kind of quantification basically it's about numbers right we need to put some numbers maybe in terms of your delay in terms of your financial loss in terms of your cost increase all those stuff is basically mean by your quantitative risk analysis right so uh, first you do the planning then you do identify then you perform the qualitative analysis then you do the quantitative analysis and then based on this you actually plan your risk response right so once you identify it you know it's what's uh, its qualitative quantity impact then accordingly you need to plan the risk response this is basically nothing but your risk mitigation plan which you need to put in place so that you reduce the impact this is what the purpose of it so you need to reduce the impact of the risk to have a successful management or let's say if it's opportunity you need to have to have place enhancement right uh, enhancement plan in place so that you can you know increase the probability of uh, opportunity and then of course you know I need to monitor those days throughout the period like uh, you know uh, if your risk is identified at this stage at the start you would like to monitor till the end of the project that because a risk is not something static thing right risk is very dynamic in nature sometimes the same risks become opportunity and sometimes the opportunity will again you know become a risk so that's why it's very important to continuous monitor and control this risk but in terms of process i think we are clear so these are the um, uh, the process which start with your plan identification performing the analysis which is a uh, qualitative and quantitative and then you plan the response and controlling the risk all over the projects so let's understand this processes in deep detail by going through each step by step and understand you know how we do the risk management so the other term or let's say the decision matrix which is uh, you know uh, which we will be utilizing throughout the whole processes right this is basically your emv the expected monetary value so this is basically nothing but a decision tree which is based on the expected uh, impact the financial impact which you will be getting due to that risk event right uh, this is all related to your risk event now when i say the risk event it's a probability and the impact which we discussed earlier right so this is basically nothing but risk exposure value in terms of let's say dollar or whatever you call it right dollar or money so this is emv is nothing but a risk exposure in terms of value which is basically dependent upon your probability and the impact so what is the probability of occurrence of that event and then if that occurs what is the impact what could be impact will be in terms of financial or the risk um, monetary value and then you calculate actually expected monetary value based on the probability of occurrence and impact okay and and then this is how so let's say there's a project you may identify some risk and then based on that risk you may have some uh, you know uh, various events which may occur which can bring you this kind of uh, impact assessment so based on those you know the probability and the impact you will identify those risks and develop a mitigation plan maybe you abandon the risk or maybe you will uh, you know uh, decide that just you know accept the risk so depending on that we will be discussing various approaches how we deal with risk uh, but overall I mean in concept this is uh expected monetary value is nothing but your uh, risk exposure which again you know uh, depends upon your probability and impact so coming to our very first step right remember our all steps start with planning 
so our first step for the risk management and planning which basically deciding how to approach to plan and execute the risk management activity right before even doing the risk management process stuff you need to plan everything that how you will be managing the whole process right and that's first step is basically known as planning sorry planning the whole uh, process right. and this is basically what is your mean by plan risk management right this is what it's mean so uh, how we do that so plan risk management is again like we discussed various process previously uh, again it depends upon some input or I will say some information which is required to do this uh, or to, to complete this step again you will need some tool and techniques which you will be basically utilizing this tool and techniques and then you have some goals goals is basically some outputs which you will be getting so in terms of you know the input or plan risk management you will need some management plans some project charter stakeholder register and personal factor organization process these kind of inputs this kind of inputs you will be getting you will be getting or uh, you will be required to do your analysis right so once you get this information you need to basically utilize some tools and techniques apply some tools and techniques maybe analytical skill expert judgment meeting some you know deep analysis you may be doing this to arrive at some goal or let's say some output and your very first output for this process is your risk management plan remember you know this is the first step okay first step your overall risk management process and in this step you are aimed to produce this document that is your risk management plan okay this is what you are aiming to get it as output and this is what uh, uh, in terms of you know input and output uh, this is how your plan risk management work so once you plan your risk management process now the very next step is your identify the risk right so once you know how we'll be doing uh, what are the things we'll be looking at it we'll be to gather information the process and all those things the very next step of the risk management is to identify identify I mean basically you need to list down all the risk right maybe one two three four five six and something like that so you need to just list it down simple list it down or uh, note down all the risk simply identify them document them with the cases of the risk that might affect the project it is as simple as simple don't to worry much detail about this so your first step your first thing or uh, let's say first step is to list all the possible risks right just list it down simply don't worry much worry about uh, the type and all thing just list them and then provide the description or the characteristic just you know what kind of risk you're talking about right uh, so just simply come up with a list of risk and then we will deal other things in the next steps right so first step identification of risk and now of course you know this will also uh, require some input and output that we are going to discuss in the next section so identifying a risk right again it's a process it's a sub process remember and this is a second sub process so we are at this process remember we have planned risk management now this is the second step the second step is identify risk and this identifying risk again follow the same format which we have been following you know earlier so it requires some sort of input or let's say the information okay then we will be utilizing some tools and techniques to achieve some outputs right so what are the information we'll be requiring well these steps require in fact you know i will say mostly every document so almost majority of key documents of your project so it's required cost information schedule information quality information human resource plan baselines activity estimates duration estimates registers stakeholder registers procurement document material then environmental factors organization presets you see all the key 
information the key document which uh, require which demands for your risk management right so this will basically you know take all the key information or the documents or the information which is mentioned uh, or which is developed in the project as of now and then utilize some tools right when you say utilize some tools maybe very first thing is it will be it will require a review whole documentation review has to happen there will be some analysis or a checklist you may be having some risk uh, checklists available there will be some assumption this is basically you know all those cost schedule time quality estimates everything forms some boe right boe means your basis of estimates so you need to review whether those estimates the basis are actually posing some risk or not right because those are assumptions only so every assumptions have some sort of you know the risk which may be less minimum minor significant insignificant all those things but the thing is that once you review those assumptions right reviewing those assumptions actually helps you to identify those risks what could possibly go wrong while assuming those things and then you identify those things and you need to list it down okay you can take the opinion of expert judgment because you know experience matters a lot so what happens that you may discuss with a team of expert who has done similar kind of projects so let's say similar kind of activity they can tell you you know what are the possible or what are the common risk or events occurs while dealing with such kind of projects and you can immediately you know uh, look uh, into those factors and list it down which may be applicable for your project SWOT analysis again are standard tools uh, to do this kind of analysis which is strength weakness and opportunity and threat analysis uh, you can perform this uh, techniques to arrive you know to identify those risks then again information gathering technique there could be a number of ways you can have a direct uh, you know interview with the stakeholders uh, sort of uh, information gathering session other things to basically get the key key information or the key factors uh which could basically bring some risk to the uh, project right some other techniques diagram technique the diagram basically you uh, connecting all the key events together and then see uh, where could be the uh, possible risk uh, lying or possible uh, associated event which can occur and impact the projects so these are the few of the techniques which you should be utilizing it so uh, the purpose of the utilization basically to come up with the risk right so the output is basically your risk register so risk register is basically you know list of all the risk right it's number one two three four five six, like this you will get the list of risk uh, with some you know brief description what exactly it is right so this the whole purpose of this uh, process is to have the list of all the risk this is what we want to achieve in this process so once you have the list of the risk available with you you know you know what are the risks which is applicable for your projects now the very next step is to have a deeper analysis of each risk right so let's discuss about our next sub process for risk management so once you identify the risk right the next step is to perform the qualitative risk analysis remember qualitative risk analysis i'm talking about so it means basically you need to prioritize your risk assess their probability of occurrence and the impact and then basically based on that you will have uh, you know the uh, some sort of assessment in terms of subjective right so when i say subjective means you need to come up with whether it's a high impact low impact or medium impact so what happens that every risk it will have some probability right and it will have some impact right so here you need to basically say whether it's probability is high low or medium uh, also you will say the probability is high low and medium remember you know you don't need to um, uh, they provide some numbers here right you need to just tell them whether it's high impact probability low probability and medium probability or it's high impact low impact medium impact so what happens based on a company policy 
in, at, at the back end there is some numbers associated with that maybe let's say this is a uh, scale on process of 1 to 10 right 1 to 10 so if it's high then maybe it's like between 9 to 8 or let's say 8 to 10 is basically high probability 7 to let's say 5 uh, let's say it's medium probability and let's say 5 to 4 is a low probability so 5 to let's say 0 or 1 is your uh, sorry 4 to 1 is a low so like this you can define this range uh, across subjective range you don't nobody is going to ask for that okay give me the exact probability impact and give me the exact dollar value what's impact this is not we are asking to do we are just saying in this step you need to say whether it's high low or medium in terms of probability as well as impact and based on that you will be having some kind of you know the range defined this varies from project to project or company to company but you need to simply identify or do the subjective uh, assessment of probability and impact so this is what is mean by your qualitative risk analysis so you have the list right you have the list of the risk against every risk you have to say it's high probability and low impact low probability high impact based on that you can you know basically identify for the each uh, risk this is what we meant by your qualitative Let me write it down qualitative, I guess, right? Qualitative risk and analysis. Okay, so this is what is mean by this. Now, in terms of process, let's see what are the things information is required and what will be your output. So, in terms of process, we are at third step, remember, right? This is third step of overall project risk management plan, and here again, it will require some input. So it will require baseline information, it will require the, your management plan, risk register, which we developed in previous step, the environmental, uh, environmental factors for enterprise and process asset uh, update and all those things, right? So you will need these all information and then you will need to use some tools and techniques. Then there are some, you know, risk and probability impact assessment uh, metrics, then there is a probability and impact matrix is there data analysis categorization urgency assessment there are certain tools which you can utilize to you know basically do this this kind of analysis and then arrive at the output the output is nothing but project document update remember so output will basically you know in this process you will be getting some subjective high low medium high low uh, medium for your probability right probability and the impact so based on this uh, quanti uh, qual uh, you can say quali uh, qualitative uh, analysis you will simply you know uh, take this information and based on that probably you need to go back and see where all some changes are required so when i say the process document objects so let's say you identify some risk Based on the risk, you had some estimation of the cost and time impact, and then you do the analysis and you find out that oh, the cost is higher than what is uh, expected. Since then, you need to go and update your cost. Maybe then in terms of impact of days or the duration estimate, you find that some duration is lesser than what was initially assumed. Then you go and update your uh, schedule uh, or the duration, the activity duration estimate. So these kind of updates can happen to your scope cost and time maybe something was missed uh, and what not taken in your scope so again you need to go back and correct your scope baseline or include it in the scope then the, uh, those kind of thing has to be done basically whatever you learn in this process you need to again go back and whatever the document you have produced in your previous processes previous you know the scope time cost quality those uh, process and update all those documents wherever it is applicable so this is what the key uh, purpose or let's say goal of this process is to update your document based on the new information 
So once you complete with your qualitative analysis, the next step is to perform your quantitative analysis, right? So in quantitative analysis, you need to basically provide the actual numbers of the effect of those risk or event in terms of you know numerical rating. So you need to now provide some actual numerical figures, right? Numerical figures, so let's say numbers numbers when i say in terms of your dollar value in terms of your delays number of days how many delays or impact so all has to be you know quantified in values right and in actual values with respect to your project so this is what is mean by uh, you know the quantification of the risk so it's perform on the risk that have been prioritized that we have already identified and then we have done the qualitative analysis for those risks uh, you need to basically do these kind of analysis which is basically related to number crunching right i call this step is as number crunching okay so once you completed your qualitative analysis, now the next step is to do the quantitative risk analysis, right? So remember, this is your fourth step of the whole process. And again, like the previously we have done about the input output system in the same way, this process also requires some sort of information, right? To do its analysis. Now, what are the information? Those are risk management plan, cost and schedule management plan, risk register, amount of factors, and process assets. So, this information which will be required to do the quantitative analysis, right? And what are the inform uh, what are the tools and techniques which will be used? It's basically data gathering and representation, qualitative analysis, risk analysis, and modeling technique. There's a lot of techniques, tools, software is available. I'm not going into detail of those things, but yes, those are the tools and techniques which you or which as a team member will be utilizing this. Expert judgment is another, you know, the basic tool. By utilizing the tools and techniques, again, you will arrive at some sort of output, right? And that output is basically project document updates. Again, here, based on this analysis, based on the new information which you have, uh, uh gathered which you have basically received based on this analysis information you would like to update all your previous document which you have developed during the various uh, knowledge area let's say for scope time quality and so on right so you need to update all those information and let's say if there's no new information is available it's already you know uh, the similar information same information probably you don't need to do any major changes in your document so that's fine but in case if you find something and normally it does because remember it's the uh, coming to the risk identification which may require update of your cost right which you probably uh, previously you did or update of your time or let's say the schedule you need to basically you know update those information based on this analysis so remember once you have identified then the annual analysis and then you know quantitative and qualitative analysis so now at this point of time you know what is your risk what is your qualitative of the risk what is the property of the risk and then what is the prop uh, you know uh, possible impact of the risk if that risk occurs so you basically at this step till this step you know all the information all the key information of your risk <coughs> Sorry. so at this point you basically know all information all information about your risk and now it is time to plan your risk response so once you know everything about the risk now it's time to you know plan what actually you will be doing to mitigate those risks to reduce impact of those risk and this is what this process is all about planned risk response so if you go by definition it's a process of developing options determining action to enhance opportunity or reduce the threats or this means basically reduce the risk of the project this is what you are trying to do here either you basically enhance your opportunity right or 
reduce your risk impact right and whatever things actions right or activities are required to do this to in a, to reducing the impact or enhancing the opportunity is basically called your mitigation plan right so this is what is mean by mitigation plan a list of the activity or sequence of the activity which you are supposed to do to get the benefit from opportunity or reduce the impact of the risk and this is what it's mean by plan risk response right so plan risk response in terms of uh, the process again it's a quasi input so which is yeah, you know some sort of information which is a risk management plan and risk register these are the key input which you will be requiring to do the analysis tools and techniques well some you know uh, strategy you need to develop you need to discuss uh, with experts to have a positive negative risk to understand you know, what kind of activity you can or what kind of uh, actions you can take and then output will be a simply update to risk register so in the risk register you need to see the risk you have to list it on the risk you need to know the what are your impacts and assessment then accordingly you need to update your risk register with planned action right you need to basically update mention those actions or those mitigation plan in your risk register and that is but is your key output okay so this is what is all about your plan risk response and remember this is your fifth step right now the final step is your control risk so you basically did overall plan how you're going to basically get the information which steps you will be doing and you know all those things you do a overall planning then you move to an excel that's having five risks then you move to the qualitative analysis then you move to the quantitative then you did the plan risk response so once you know what are your risks what is the impact what you will be doing what will be your response to those risks and then the next thing is that once you plan everything it's time to monitor and control whether your planning goes as per your plan or is there some changes is there or you need to basically focus on those changes and make sure you know those changes are uh, completed or those changes are taken so control risk so if we try to define this control risk it is basically a process of implanting the risk response plan identifying analyzing and planning for newly arising risk keeping the track of the identified risk and residual risks and secondary so there could be several risks right you know main risk secondary risk residual risk all those things has to be tracked identify the you know the mitigation plan status what is the impact of those mitigation plan and then update those things this is what is all about your controlling the risk right because remember any projects is basically spread over some duration right some duration or some timeline so you have some start date you have some finish date and in between these dates or these duration a lot of risk can happen right your mitigation plan is going on so you need to basically compare and see whether those are going as per the plan is there any change or some new actions are required all those things has to be done in this step that is called your control risk step okay so in terms of output or input process so again this will require some sort of you know information and this is mainly output from the previous step that is uh, uh, project management plan your risk register work performance indication on, on information this kind of uh, data you will be requiring to do this analysis as an input once you get this input you need to utilize some tools and some techniques right so maybe risk audits variance and trend analysis risk assessments reserve analysis this kind of you know analysis you need to perform right to arrive at some output and those outputs are basically you're updating your risk register recommend corrective action that's very important right you need to see how your risk is moving what's impact is happening to the risk and based on that you need to provide the new action or some corrective action which can basically improve the risk position 
then you need to prove maybe you may request some changes or you may recommend some preventive action so that you uh, you know don't occur or don't expect it cost or monetary value and all those things you need to be worried uh, you know about the status comparison and then implementation of the corrective actions especially this is the main uh, focus of this process because you know we have already planned everything we have identified our risk we have done the quality uh, qualitative analysis quantitative analysis and we also you know noted down what kind of response what are the action we will be taking so everything is planned now the thing is that once the projects move to the execution phase or once the project moves or uh, and and you know uh, activity started you need to make sure you need to monitor control whether things are going as per this plan uh, or for the risk management or not and if something is changed then what are the corrective actions right that you need to identify and implement those corrective actions right this is what you need to do identify the corrective actions and implement those actions this is what is all about control risk okay so with this uh, process basically your complete set of project risk management is completed remember we have the step of planning identifying then analysis and then uh, you know the response and the control risk so this completes overall project risk management process so so far we have basically learned you know in terms of identification our responses and you know how we will be doing those corrective actions identifying throughout the uh, projects now there are several strategy let's say some risk happens okay so let's say there is some risk which you identified at some stage at some point and then uh, later on you realize that the risk is realized or let's say risk is going to occur now what are the options available for you at that point of time right so if we talk in terms of you know overall strategy or the approach so basically we have you know the three major categories of your approach either you will try to avoid that risk that it doesn't occur or you will simply say accept this risk means okay if risk is happening then let's let's accept this risk let's see what are the corrective actions we will take what will the impact and all those things you will uh, try to bring in the projects or you will transfer the risk the transfer the risk means there's a possibility that instead of let's say you want to do some activity uh, and then now the cost of activity is increased now probably you can outsource <coughs> this activity to some another party or maybe transfer it basically shifting the real risk to another uh, you know the, uh, the party or another person through which you can basically avoid or reduce the impact or negative impact of your uh, you know the particular risk so this is a common approach three approach which you take when you have the risk right so when i say the avoidance avoidance is basically changing the project management plan to reduce or the threat of the uh, or protect the project objective right this is what you mean by avoidance acceptance means simply passive or active acceptance means you sub simply say that okay let it happen and then based on that your impact you just see how you uh, is, is, is impact your overall progress you don't make any changes you uh, maintain the status quo and carry on and let's see you know at that time when the project uh, the risk happens uh, you simply you know absorb those uh, impacts then the transfer the shifting of negative or maybe threat any <coughs> Uh, risk which is occur you simply transfer this ownership to another third party so that you are reducing your uh, you know the impact of the risk so these are the three common strategy or approach i will say which is followed by the ways company and organization to manage their risk or let's say this is how they develop their strategy in terms of risk management so similarly uh, there's opportunity also which can happen in the projects, right? It's not only the risk always uh, You know, there's opportunity Which also can be present in any projects, right? So when we see the opportunity again, there's several approach 
uh, to manage any opportunity or to deal with any opportunity so in general there are four approach uh, which is followed by uh, the companies or which is followed by the project management team or organization to exploit uh, you know uh, to manage this opportunity the first one is exploit basically make sure the opportunity occurs right so that you have take the full benefit of your opportunity and realize it second thing is that enhance it so enhancement may be to increase the likelihood or impact of the risk so so that that uh, that opportunity definitely occurs so you may need to take some additional action so that your assumption or the expected benefits occurs or opportunity occurs right so that's a one approach so you try to enhance them you exploit them basically make sure you know the opportunity occurs and take the full benefit of it uh, you know without any um, uh, you can say with, uh, without any leaving uh, of any possibility of uh, you know the reducing the benefit expected benefit so you take the full maximum benefit exploit it enhance it you take some additional action to basically make that opportunity occur or you accept this accept means you don't do anything as it's occurred like in the risk mitigation you simply you know accept the consequences so maybe it's possible that at the end of the day opportunity doesn't occur uh, so you but you don't do anything additional there so that's one approach you can follow next thing you can follow the share remember you know for transferring the risk we involve the third party and transfer the risk to them so that it's impact the companies uh, uh, the impact on the company's uh, benefits or uh, the gains is less similarly when the opportunity come there is possibility that you can share this opportunity with third party maybe you can get a change order from the client and then share the change order with your another third party contractor and get a benefit so this is how you can share the opportunity and utilize uh, or manage your opportunity so these are the four approach which you can take while managing the opportunity depending upon you know various uh, situation to situation demands of maybe management instruction maybe how you want to manage uh, you know the project so that you can see the maximum benefit at the end of the project so you can follow any one of this strategy to manage your opportunity on the project so we have learned already you know the overall project management process we have learned you know what how to approach those risks or opportunity so this is all about you know the in terms of strategy and, and and learning how the process work how the planning happens how you basically deals with all those uh, you know the risk or the event or opportunity in a theoretical way right but when those planning those concept goes into practical implementation they are the certain key element which you need to you know uh, uh, you need to take care of it or you need to you know constantly pursue so that whatever planning whatever assumption whatever mitigation plan you have taken they effectively get implemented on the project and you get the maximum result uh, of the benefits or the of, of your risk management right and in fact at least you are trying to reduce the any additional negative impact or try to enhance the opportunities so there are some practical aspects which you should be taking care of which you should be focusing on once you have your plan everything is figured out everything is decided but when it goes to the actual implementation certain things you need to take care of it so there's some key element so those elements has to be taken care of. and what are those elements are the very first thing is your communication and consultant you need to continuously right it's not just one time event you need to continuously follow up continuously communicate with the team get the status tell them the decisions what has happened you need to seek the opinion consultation from the subject matter expert so this is a one of the key element which you need to be aware of it you need to be focusing to have a successful risk management right first key element that is your communication and consultation not once but throughout the project till that risk is realized or no more valid okay <coughs> so raising awareness is very important and not only you know uh, to your risk leader but from top to down bottom it's very important to tell them what is your risk what is the status what we are planning 
and what kind of support we want to see right it really helps the organization as well as you know the project project team employees to perform better if they have the communication about the risk very clear and have the clear understanding of it right so that's the first key element now the next thing is establish the context it's very important right because we all are human right people are the key element of any process uh, on any project management process and when we talk with the people people would like to understand the full context of the problem or the risk to make decision to align their activity so that you know uh, they can take the right step at the right time so we have the maximum uh, impact of our mitigation plan or we can have you know the better realization of our opportunity so it's very important to share your context right if so before sharing you need to have the full understanding of the context there may be certain i know organization wall certain company policies are there certain i know business objectives are there there are culture factors is there legal political there could be lot of factors right in a while while you know developing or explaining the context you need to make sure all those factors are taken care right all those factors are taken care means you have considered all those factors while defining your risk while you know having a proper definition and then communicating it to the team and making sure team also have the same level of understanding what you have so that everyone is aligned on the same page and their action oriented to the common focus goal right so that's the second element the third element is risk identification now remember risk identification is again it's not one time activity let's say you start a project at that time time you identify the risk you develop the risk register right you at this point of time you risk register and then you just forget it no you don't have to you have to continuously identify whether the whether the previous risk was valid whether the new risk is added whether a new opportunity is added you need to do this continuously you cannot simply leave this activity at once and say your job is done no that's not that's that will simply lead to failure if you follow that approach you have to be on the top of this uh, you know other risk elements throughout the project and continuously update them and have a coordination with the team and also you know uh, tell the team that this is what's going on what the risk right so <clears throat> next key element is risk analysis right so risk analysis means remember we have qualitative uh, qualitative and then quantitative analysis right so you have to do this analysis again continuously right it's not just one time once you do the risk review you need to assess because you know those assessment uh, the impact and probability can change any time it can change from high to low low to medium depending upon the probability of occurrence or the impact because risk is kind of you know the dynamic in nature so you need to continuously do the risk analysis now once you do the risk analysis you need to have the evaluation also evaluation means whatever what will be the impact in terms of numbers you know uh, depending upon that how you will be uh, analyzing that or based on the anal analysis is basically data crunching once you get the data you need to basically translate those data crunching into actual impact numbers right so once you get this impact numbers you can basically evaluate what kind of action you are going to take you will mitigate that share it transfer it accept it so all those thing evaluation in terms of mitigation you need to think about it and plan it right and then comes the risk treatment which is basically nothing but whatever you have evaluated here you need to apply those right you need to apply those processes you need to apply those actions you need to agree discussion with the you know various stakeholders and make sure whatever you have planned or whatever the through the evaluation or or information you got through the analysis then the all the corrective actions or mitigation actions are actually implemented right and then once those are implemented you need to continuously monitor them right because you need to see the impact of those actions what happened actually when you implemented those whether those 
uh, uh, those actions <coughs> produce results as expected or you need to do some additional action or you need to, don't need to worry about it and all those things you need to monitor and then monitor means you need to basically observe this flag it and inform the team that what is the current status in terms of indication uh, or you know, some measurement key performance uh, criteria so that all you need to do in monitor review. So these are the seven key elements of any successful risk management, right? And you need to make sure that all the seven elements are there when you are doing the risk management for the projects. If these elements are not taken seriously and not taken care of, definitely, you know, very likely you are going to fail, going to fail on your risk management. Remember, risk management is already complex. And then in case of this, if you're missing this key element, well, that's the perfect recipe for failure. So risk management is actually very vast, right? Uh, it's a vast area. You can find in you know, the risk analyst or risk management. In fact, for the project, you may be having some, you know, the proper uh, dedicated risk management team who will be working on this. So it's a very vast area, complex area, difficult area to manage. But the thing is that there's no way of, you know, you, you can't get rid of this in, while managing a project. So it's really uh, uh, helpful when you follow some standard practice or let's say the best practices whenever you are doing your risk management, which helps you to improve your efficiency or productivity for the risk management. Right. So there are certain sets of principles which is coming through the ISO, which you need to be follow or which you need should be following so that you get maximum out of your risk management processes. Right. <clears throat> so what are those practices are? First thing is create value for organization. That should be your prime goal. So remember risk identification, mitigation, Especially, you know, when we talk about the risk, risk is quite subjective. Subjective means it depends upon your assessment uh, about the, some topic and which could be different than other, you know, completely different for the other person who is assessing the same topic. So it's very subjective. Hence why you need to have some certain principle of objective focus. Uh, which basically guides you to make decision and that's your basically you always think first to create value new value for the organization if any risk op opportunity or the risk identification doesn't add any value to organization you should pro probably deprioritize that you should be focused or priority should be focused on your creating value for the organization right that is what you should be doing while working on the risk part then it should be the integral part of overall organization process right you cannot do the risk management in silo environment right you have to have an integrated approach so that you it's a collective approach from the various function various department from top management middle management in fact the lower level so you need to basically integrate horizontally and vertically to have a proper risk management or effective i will say effective risk uh, management right then the next one is overall decision making process decision making process has to be again you know inclusive and it has to be like overall decision making process means which includes not only some of the factors but mainly you know all the factors or cross-functional factors you know and the discipline wise factors so that you have you know most optimum decision when you're working on the risk then you need to address the uncertainty very for in a focused way you need to know what are the uncertainty associated with that then you need to be very systematic and structured you need to have a systematic process and structured way to deal with any risk starting from identification till the implementation of mitigation plan right then you need to work on the best available information remember you know uh, you to make decision on any risk you need to get the information latest information and most i can say the accurate information available at that point of time then tailor to the project like i mentioned earlier every project is unique right every project is unique 
Now, once project is unique, then your approach, approach to solve risk is, should be also unique, right? It should be unique depending upon, you know, the type of uh, contractor, type of client, type of, you know, the team you got it, based on all those things, you have to develop or customize your approach so that it's well suited for your project environment, right? Take into account of human factor, right? People are the you know one of the key element, uh, and then then remember, we all are human. So even though you know uh, there's always human error factor is there, right? And that's all you need to take into care or take into account while making decision. Be transparent and all inclusive. Very important, especially for the risk management because risk is something you know the unknown territory. And in that case, if you're not transparent, basically you're adding more risk to the risk which is already there. And you are simply amplifying the risk impact and uh, you know uh, the magnitude. So that's why it's very important to be transparent in terms of definition of the risk, its the impact, what could they possibly go wrong. All the thing has to be transparent and inclusive means you need to involve all the associated stakeholders but it is stakeholders so that everyone is aware and have a common understanding be adaptable to the change right it's very important so, so once you have some risk then definitely when you discuss with the various organization based department we could have the several options or several suggestions from various uh, kind of people or various kind of uh, you know functions now you need to be, you know, uh, treat all those suggestion or the changes recommended unbiasedly, right? You don't need to have a pre-biased uh, idea or approach. So you need to have uh, a very, you know, balanced and adaptable uh, approach so that you can implement those changes effectively and get the maximum results, right? And then of course continuous monitoring and control is key right because remember risk is dynamic in nature right they are not the constant or they are not the fixed thing which is like one type of uh, risk is there and that will remain same throughout the project in fact the property of the risk change risk may convert into a, you know something else their status may change all those things are happening when we're talking about the risk right so continuous monitoring and taking corrective action is key there then the digital reform right we have as i mentioned right we are living in the technology era of digital age there we can leverage the digital tools software all those things you can do that and there are several technology advancement which can significantly help you to manage the risk better way efficient way and very cost effective way right so always be open to you know some new technological advancement or solution which can help your project your organization so failure to act well i mean it's very obvious uh, you know the, the cost of failure or failure to act on the risk is huge right I mean you can't quantify it it could be infinite the magnitude could be so high so devastating that it can I mean you know have a very bad impact now impact when I say it's within project right in your organization in your personal way that, that, that has a lot of impact right if you simply ignore the project management so it's very important to you know uh, uh, the act on this risk right and if you fail to act on the risk you didn't treat it you didn't you know identify those potential harms and avoidable risk out of face of the business that will directly if you talk in terms of company it will directly first hit your reputation in your market among your clients and it will basically you know bring down your bottom line means basically it will increases your losses right simply it will you know bring and then there's other other thing also so it will basically lead to the transparency lag then there will be problems in supply chain there will be you know other programs which will be 
uh, hurting you they will be you know security control governance issues will be there work culture is you know another byproduct of failure of uh, to act on the risk inefficiency will key in and you know there's us numerous numbers of problems right i cannot enumerate all those things the idea is that numbers of problems numbers of problems you will be facing if you fail to act on the risk so do not right do not ignore risk management so one thing i was referring right the importance of continuous monitoring and control right why why we are focusing on this continuous monitor and control right now this is what the i want to demonstrate here why uh, it's very important to have uh, continuous monitoring because remember any event any event or any factor which is risk today right may convert into opportunity tomorrow right it may convert into opportunity what is seen as risk here right so it is dynamic it is dynamic in nature so a lot of other factors which impact this situation which will bring and this this could be in a both way uh, opportunity can become risk a risk can become your opportunity so that's why it's very important to continuously monitor these status from the start of the project till the finish of the project right because these can be changing or this will change uh, throughout the project so here if you see it's a complete disaster right it's a complete disaster or the risk if you take this situation but if you think about this situation as is a benefits or maybe opportunity of growth or you know so same situation same stakeholders but different situation right these two stakeholders in this situation has become a risk this situation this become opportunity right or benefit so idea is that always continuously right continuously uh, monitor and control the risk or let's say opportunity throughout the project throughout the project this is what you need to do throughout the project so make sure that you never lose any opportunity to take benefit or you minimize the impact of risk right so like every you know uh, management process has some limitation so the risk management also have its limitation remember risk management is many time many times it's a subjective so even though you manage risk you have a proper mitigation plan you do the proper continuous monitoring and control you have everything perfectly set up but it doesn't mean that it's a hundred percent perfect right because there's certain limitation which is inherently built in your risk management process right so even though you have a perfect plan of risk management but it doesn't guarantee hundred percent success so you need to understand and that's what you know you need to take the practical approach in many places when you're doing the project management because risk management is just a management process which helps you to reduce or minimize the impact but it doesn't guarantee you the 100 percent success 100 percent success means it doesn't make the risk go away right it, it doesn't simply you know uh, uh, convert all the risk into opportunity or uh you know make the, all the opportunity realize right so there's no uh you know it's not a solution of all problems what i mean to say that because it has certain limitations so it's very important to understand what are those limitations whenever you know you are approaching or taking uh working on the risk management so <clears throat> first thing prior to the risk management process is too high right it's very important sometimes what happens organization make it very tough very tough for the risk, uh, risk management process very high requirement stringent requirement 
which basically choke the system and what happens it's basically kind of uh, you know hamper the uh, the overall business operation so that's why it's very important to have a very balanced approach here right you need to have the balanced approach uh, while dealing uh, with the risk management you cannot be very stringent at the same time you cannot be very lenient right and many times which i you know uh, notice in my experience that companies simply not able to take the new project because of very high stringent risk requirement or sending a high high standard sets uh, by organization for the risk and in that case company loses a lot of business a lot of opportunities right so i see many projects are suspended until the risk management process is complete right and during that time what happens many opportunities are lost many new business uh, opportunity which is basically ignored and basically companies are at the loss of due to this kind of approach so again this could be a limitation or this could be you can say the negative uh, uh, impact of your risk management so which you should be you know keeping in mind or having uh, you know these factors in your mind while looking after overall risk management right now <clears throat> distinction between risk and uncertainty right sometimes what happens that you are not clearly able to define what is your risk and what is your uncertainty right and then what is your whether that risk is actually the event actually event or not so what happens you may identify uh, you know the risk is basically related to your probability of occurrence right and the 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 impact itself that's a risk exposure now any event where the probability is 100 percent of occurrence then it's no more risk it's a direct impact only thing is that you're not sure about the financial impact right it's no more risk it's a kind of actual event or certain event which is going to occur any event which has probability is like greater than zero uh, of occurrence so it's basically uh, sorry less than 100 the probability of occurrence is if it's less than 100 then it's a kind of risk but once the probability of occurrence move to 100 percent it means it's a risk uh, it's, it's an event it's known event right so you need to be careful while defining the risk you need to be very you know uh, uh, cautious what is risk and what is uncertainty associated with risk and whether it's actually a risk or it's a, a certain event so that you need to be you know sure or you need to look into it because it's again subject to depending upon the uh, there's no hard and fast rule to decide these uh, probabilities or these certainty factors so you need to be careful here then the risk uh, if risk are improperly assessed because remember you know there's a high chances the risk is getting not properly assessed and you have very subjective assessment there so you can you know put very uh, crude uh, categorization let's say high low medium impact or then that will translate into your impact calculation and all those things so and that could be wrong also so it's very important to be very cautious when you're doing those kind of qualitative analysis okay and again then spending too much assessing and managing is unlikely to be avoided so remember one thing even though you spend a lot of time resources to doing risk analysis to perform risk analysis and arrive at the risk uh, you know the mitigation and everything at the end of the day risk are risk right you cannot guarantee 100 percent that whether the risk will be occur or not occur or even so you need to be very balanced again here how much time how much effort do you want to devote and so that you have get the practical uh, results you should not be landing up some situation where you you know uh, spent more cost on planning and everything instead of you know uh, having the actual impact of the risk itself so you need to have the proper balance approach there right and unlikely even to occur the risk is likely enough so here you need to again uh, you need to see what are your losses and then what is your benefits and then decide on those you know losses and benefits factors in terms of approaching or solving any you know the risk management approach here right so like i mentioned earlier quality risk management is very subjective and of course many times it become inconsistent so it's very important to 
have a closer look on your qualitative assessment process. So this basically marks the completion of our risk management process for the project. Let's take a quick review. So plan risk management is your first step, which you should be doing, right? Which is basically process of defining how to conduct the risk management activity of a project. Then the second step is your identifying the risk, which is process of determining which risk may affect the project and document those all their characteristics, uh, basically coming up with the risk register. And then the next step is your perform qualitative analysis, which is again categorization in terms of high, low impact or probability uh, so that you can, uh, you know, categorize those risk or basically, uh, you know, um, sort those risks in terms of exposures. Then the quantitative analysis come up with the firm impact of this number in terms of numbers where how, how many dollars, how many days, all those impact has to be quantified so that it can be measured and assessed. And once you have those, then you're basically the fifth step is plan the risk response. So once you know the, all the information, all the detail about the risk, its nature, its impact, its assessment in terms of uh, ma majority uh, the my uh, the monetary impact you need to develop the response to mitigate or to enhance those opportunity and this is basically process of developing options or action to enhance opportunity or reduce the threat of the project right so this is what is planned response and then you need to move to the next step that is your control risk right control or monitor risk this is a process of basically implementing risk response plan tracking identify risk monitoring the steward risk and find the new risk or evaluating the risk process in terms of effectiveness and then again giving the some corrective actions right so this is what is all about your uh, risk management which involves this you know uh, the six uh, steps and by doing this too you can you know uh, manage uh, your risk for the projects uh, very efficiently so some of the key topic which i wanted to discuss uh, for the risk management in terms of summary which you should be focusing you know or which you may hear during the risk management uh, so one is your SWOT we already discussed this is basically kind of one of analysis tool that is a strength weakness opportunity and threat right which basically increases the breadth or uh, try to understand what is your risk in terms of opportunity strength or weakness of your company uh, in terms of your project implication and then you know the business approach residual risk remember we have mentioned residual risk earlier so these are basically the remaining effect or remaining risk once you uh, implemented your mitigation plan and did all those approach like avoidance transfer or mitigation response even though you take those actions action there may be some portion or some aspect of the risk which is still lying there this is basically called as your residual risk Secondary risk, the risk that is arise as a direct result of implementation of risk response. So what happened when you develop a mitigation plan, right? You have the mitigation plan and you implement those mitigation plan and actually take actions. These actions may result or may uh, lead to, you know, the new risk, right? This may lead to generation of new risk. The thing is that those risks are basically known as secondary risks, which are basically the byproduct of your uh, action plan fallback plan is known as basically plan b which is depends upon you know uh, if the risk has very high impact and you suppose some uh, mitigation plan but this mitigation plan doesn't work out what should be your response in, the, in that case this is basically what it mean by your fallback plan avoidance as it says it's simply you know you try to avoid those risks either simply do not accept it or transfer it or whatever way you want to say it's simply that you don't want to take that negative impact and try to uh, make or try to find some options which basically help you to avoid that risk or some you know unwanted situation okay then this is the final uh, final end of let's say your risk management right so remember we have come a long way started from scope management time cost quality hr and now your risk management is complete okay now what next 
what else you should be planning or you should be looking after in your project management process so that you have project success right remember so so far we have completed all those elements now the remaining elements are these three and the next important element is your procurement remember procurement is all about buying stuff it's direct utilization or direct uh, you know uh, investing your money or i will say spending your money on the project and that's why we are talking this at very you know last of the project because until unless you have all the information related to scope time cost quality these things are fixed it's foolish to start spending your money and that's why we will talk now procurement not in you know that's why we have not talked it earlier so at this point of stage at this stage you know all the information about the project and and not only certain plus uncertain information both informations are available and now you can make your spending decision which is basically your procurement and we are going to discuss in our next section so so far we have learned uh, you know about the scope right time cost quality hr communication and risk right so we have learned so far up to this uh, knowledge area right now the next important thing is about the procurement right and remember we are learning about the procurement after the risk we haven't uh, you know uh, planned it uh, procurement earlier because there is a reason behind that right why we are doing procurement at this stage right so before that we have already learned about this uh, seven uh, knowledge areas right and then uh, we are coming to the procurement because procurement is actually uh, related to direct spending right this is related to direct spending so when i say direct spending means you will be spending direct dollar uh, at this point now to do the spending you will need all informations right all informations will be required to do the purchase right and when i say all information all final uh, information right not just plainly or some kind of uh, in, uh, estimation or let's say uh, you know which is not finalized or planned or not def, uh, decided by the team you cannot utilize that information for doing the procurement right so for the procurement you need the form information because you need to connect with vendor and uh, issue a purchase order or sign a contract depending upon that you know what kind of vendor it is so you need to do a, a formal uh, contract between vendor through the known information so that's why it's very important to have the form information at this stage right now that's why we are uh, you know learning about the perk amendment at last because the input of the project management has to be formed and uh, very uh, you know uh, clear information will be required so that uh, form decision can be made or a very clear uh, spending plan is made without any uh, you know ambiguity so that's why we are learning uh, you know procurement at this stage and let's understand you know how actually the procurement process manage in projects so what is project procurement well project procurement is basically creation and maintenance of relationship uh, with external sources which need to complete a project right so project management if you talk in terms uh, of in a brief or key activity this is basically creation and maintaining a relationship with external resources right that is very important external resources and this need to be complete the project so when i say external resources it could be material 
okay, it could be manpower or it could be some services right so it's be manpower material services which you are not taking from internal or which is not your internal company is manpower but this is external this is basically from different than you uh, own company you need to connect with maybe another vendor the third party vendor or some other uh, company from where you can you know get those uh, resources which can help you to complete your project this is basically about maintaining relationship uh, with those kind of external resources so this is what the main i would say uh, you know the main motto of project procurement management right so if you talk the importance of project management process so project management first thing is important for every industry whether it's software industry construction industry or research industry any kind of industry you have procurements play a very important role for the success or completion of the project so there are major uh, you know industry i can tell you like construction manufacturing engineering technology finance and healthcare these are the major industry which utilize you know uh, the procurement process uh, or I will say the one of the key process uh, for their project management process because if you talk these projects these projects are basically you know high value projects right and generally they are long duration and that's why you know the procreation play a key role in uh, managing these projects because one thing they have the very high value second thing they are the long duration it means they need to monitor over a long period of time remember uh, if any project which is start and finish date unless it goes for four years so four years managing a procurement is not an easy task because remember procurement depends upon your external resources right it depends on external resources and there could be a lot of factor which can influence this right uh, and, and that includes your uh, external uh, market depending upon various situation a lot of things changes so that's why it's very uh, challenging task to do a successful project management process for any project especially if it has high value and long duration project so procurement management process basically helps the companies to increase their quality right which allow the organization to negotiate the detailed contract or let's say service contract maybe uh, you know uh, the other material contract uh, th there are several type of contracts we will be learning later but it helps to negotiate a better contract right this basically suits the companies or let's say the organization or maybe i think better share projects right this basically suits the project's needs which really uh, helps to improve their quality and which in turn you know it basically helps them to provide a good uh, high quality of services then the decrease risk also it helps uh, organization to reduce their risk maybe in terms of you know the cost the process and quality because they have several options right we will vendor options subcontractor who can connect with them and try to mitigate their risk right so and also they have several contract terms with the vendors remember so whenever there is a procurement there is a project right or let's say there is a company involved and this company forms a contract right they have some sort of contract with let's say this is our vendor or let's say subcontractor or some third party service provider so there is always contract involved between two parties right company and vendor and which basically this contract helps to fix a lot of things which are variable and through this basically helps to reduce the risk right then the next thing is controlled cost so remember procurement uh, means basically you're spending of uh, money right so it's directly related to your dollar values and it's really helps to negotiate the term the procurement term with vendors or third party or service provider which basically helps to reduce the cost or at least control the spending in certain limits right so 
that's that's really helps uh, or you say one of the key uh, leverage we can utilize from pro uh, procurement management process to control the cost or to reduce the cost of your project also you know it helps uh, the organization to have a better understanding of the cost with the pro procurement management this basically helps you with respect to the market condition or other you know external factor uh, what what is your cost positions uh, for the various product and services and then you know that helps to uh, negotiate again from the vendors and services not only for this project maybe a previous project as well as uh, you know you can utilize this information uh, for the future projects so for any project procurement process uh, procurement manager generally you know a separate or dedicated project uh, procurement manager is assigned and a procurement manager basically communicates with the vendor uh, to buy rent or contract product or services which is needed to you know achieve the project's objective right so this is was the main uh, responsibility of any uh, project procurement manager to communicate with vendors right or let's call that subcontractor or maybe you know any third party provider whatever you call it third party services third party service uh, provider okay so this is what the main uh, role of a uh, project procurement manager is so like we mentioned earlier contracts play a critical role any you know management of procurement for any project right so contract basically means that when there is a two party involved, let's say A and B, A is your, let's say your company or let's say, you know, uh, some project company who's doing the project, B is service provider, right? So they are basically bound through some sort of documents or some sort of, let's say, agreement, formal agreement, right? We call it formal agreement. This is formal and this formal basically nothing but known as contract this is what we call a contract which defines you know under which condition what will be terms and condition where party a and party b agrees uh, to you know uh, b provide services to the co company and then a of course uh, return the financial uh, benefits to the uh, service provider so this is all defined in your contract right now there are several type of contracts so mainly there are three type of contract we talk in terms of project procurement process one is a fixed type fixed uh, pr price contract which basically means you have the fixed uh, the contract value which is mentioned and accordingly you need to provide the services cost reimbursable based on uh, you know the what is the actual cost incurred by the subcontractor plus there will be some incentive you can say uh, which is involved uh, that could be the form of basis or they will be time and material so depending upon the actual uh, you know the time or material or resources spent on the project uh, company a need to pay to b right so let's let's discuss this each contract type in detail and understand what does it mean uh, when we say it's fixed price or cost reimbursable or time and material contract so uh, fixed price contract right as it's mentioned here fixed or uh, sometimes it's also known as lump sum contract right so these kind of contracts are very much uh, you know uh, uh, very much famous or I will say mostly it's EPC contracts are utilizing this kind of contract right so what does it actually means it means that you let's say a company A or let's say some company is going to pay the one fixed amount so they will just pay one fixed amount regardless of how much it costs your contractor to do the work so let's say you have a company a right and you have some contractor call it b so 
company and contractor they will agree to one some lump sum amount right some lump sum amount which is your fix which is not going to change which company a will give to company uh, the contractor b to provide the services right so suppose at the later date if the contractor incurred more cost than what is mentioned here then it doesn't mean that contractor uh, the company will provide that additional amount no the company is going to pay only that fixed amount not any additional and then the contractor had to be at the loss right so these kind of no, uh, uh, the fixed price contract are normally signed when the contractors know what is the full scope of work right when scope is defined it's clearly defined it's known what exactly this contractor need to do on basis of that contractor will quote their prices and then company and contractor will agree to a lump sum price this kind of uh, contract normally you know uh, agreed under these conditions so like i mentioned right here if something increases or uh, costs increases then the contractor is at the higher risk because remember you know company has already uh, mentioned that he is going to pay this lump sum price they are not going to increase the uh, the contract value and then the additional cost is basically borne by your contractor so fixed price contract the risk is high on the seller side or let's say the contractor side so contractor is taking lot of risk now reverse is also true so let's say if contractor is able to finish the scope of work less than the fixed lump sum then definitely that delta will be the profit of the contractor or the company so uh, that's why you know uh, it can go in both way so if contractor always try to minimize their cost so that you know we can have the more profit so further this fixed price contract can be divided into you know several categories one is a fixed uh ffpp which F, which is basically firm fixed price contract uh where is uh, you know you, everything is fixed then company is not going to pay anything more than that so in a single penny then another one is fixed price incentive fee where company provide the provision that okay if you complete the project uh with this cost and some timeline then i will give you some additional uh, you know incentive if you are able to meet that so there could be that kind of uh, contract agreement is there and then there will be some you know fixed price economic uh, price adjustment contract depend upon uh, the various conditions of the market company can agree to pay, uh, pay some additional price based on you know economic condition uh, plus the what is lump sum contract so these are the three uh, categories of your fixed price contract normally what i saw uh, in construction industry this is a uh, very much predominant uh, type of contract then you have the cost reimbursable type of contract right this is second type of contract which is uh, uh, which we see in the project management so which means that company any to pay the seller back for the cost involved during the work plus there is some you know agreed amount which you will pay on the top of that so what happens that let's say there is a two party involved your company right and there is a contractor and you agree to a contract right in the contract it says that whatever work the b is going to do so whatever the contractor will uh, contractor will do the work there will be some cost involved right so that cost plus some you know uh, additional margin or additional markup uh, need to be paid by the company to company b and then they provide the services so in that case what happens that company a need to pay the total cost which is incurred by the b the contractor plus there is some markup cost which is again decided in the contract uh, which these two cost uh, company a need to pay to the contractor b now these kind of uh, you know uh, the contracts are normally uh, uh, signed where the scope 
or the define the, the definition of work right i will say the scope or the definition of work is not clearly defined or not fully known right not fully known then we use this kind of contract cost reimbursable contract is used in, in this condition and in this condition what happens remember so contractor is not bound by any limitation of the cost or market price so what happens at this case the risk is basically high for the buyer side or let's say the company side the company who signs a contract with the contractor is highly risk because as you know the uh, here the contractor can increase the cost right as per their convenience you know and the time is uh, if it's long duration project and high value and expected high value project then definitely your cost may rise exponentially so that's why you know buyer is at higher risk side because there's no control there's no fixed limit is defined so and that can you know uh, basically push up the cost than expected and then you have to pay the markup right so that's why it is called that these kind of contracts are normally not preferred by con uh, companies because they know that they have a higher risk and they can have a huge financial losses uh, you know huge financial losses if they sign this kind of contract so again this kind of contract can be further broken down to three category this is simply like uh, coming from the previous uh, uh, you know the fixed type contract that cost plus fixed fee contract so where you have the all the reversible cost uh, which is incurred for the total work right this is work cost uh, plus there is some you know a uh, fixed fee which uh, contractor we charge right because remember if you do the work at the same cost what is incurred then there is no benefit to him uh, to contractor so but contractor need to make money because whenever they, they do business they need to have some profit so uh, company need to provide some additional fee so that they can you know uh, have some margin in their uh, business then the another uh, contract type is a cost plus incentive plus uh, fee contract again there is some incentive involved which depends upon how the contractor performs the, the project which is called cpif then we have the cost plus award fee contract so there is already you know fee involved at the time of the award so you will be basically uh, contractor will be paid all the cost plus there is already fixed award is mentioned uh, in the contract that okay that uh, the contractor who will get this contract he will get this award plus uh, you know uh, whatever the cost is incurred for doing the work that will be reimbursed by the company so these are the three modality which uh, can be uh, followed under the cost reimbursable contracts and these kind of contracts are actually less uh, known um, normally you know for the small top value contract this kind of uh, contract assigned or uh, especially you know the government uh, where they have very long term projects where there's not uh, much definition involved uh, especially like research projects so these kind of contracts are uh, normally signed in those areas now coming to the third type of contract there is your tnm contract now TMN contract is normally used for the labor contract so as it says it's basically time and material contract right so I just mentioned here so it basically depend upon time time means basically labor man hours right when we say labor contract it's nothing but your man hours right and then you have the material based on your bulk material whatever uh, your cost is there that's involved so time basically means buyer has to you know provide some labor at fixed rate so they will be rate will be fixed at which rate they will be providing their man hours so that is basically means by your time and then the material basically they will be also fixed rate for you know some uh, bulk material like steel or some uh, or some kind of equipment or some office space those kind of things are rates are already fixed so here what happens unit rate unit rate of each service is fixed right it is determined in the contract and then depending upon you know what is actual number of units is utilized the total number of units 
uh, based on that it's uh, your cost is calculated or the the contract is calculated so this is what is mean by the time and contract so remember in this unit rate uh, all the cost all the cost is is covered by the contractor there is no additional fee incentive or profit is added here so this unit rate is include all the cost plus whatever the margin uh, which contractor wants to have that is already built in in this unit rate and so company will simply apply this unit rate to the total number of unit consumed on the project and they will arrive at you know the cost which need to be paid uh, to the uh, the contractor right so you will simply pay the unit rate which is agreed uh, in your cost uh, in projects or let's say for the material cost so whatever the agreed rate for material um, time which you're going to pay for it so coming to the quick management uh, pre, uh, pre procurement management process itself so it has it is basically the four step process right and the first one is your plan procurement so like every process we started with planning procurement then we conduct the procurement and then the control procurement and then you have the close procurement right so let's understand in detail what are these processes are so plan procurement management process is basically documenting the project processing decision specifying the approach and identify the potential seller so this is what you do you do the planning planning means basically you identify what is your requirement what are the decision what are the vendors there could be several vendors who provide one uh, services you need to identify those that then you need to identify the approaches how you will be approaching to various uh, you know the sellers there is could be seller a b c there could be you know several sellers right so how you as a company will go to which seller what kind of negotiation you will be doing how you will be you know making the contract with those sellers so you need to plan all those <clears throat> you need to plan all those you know in terms of your condition your company policy whatever it is uh, defined there you need to according those uh, conditions uh, you need to basically plan how you will approach and perform your uh, procurement so this is what is all about your plan procurement management process so this is what is called planning right in every other management process we have seen that planning is your first uh, step okay so defining our plan procurement management in input and output process so like we discussed previously for all the sub process there is input involved which basically means your information right information required to do this activity then you need tools and techniques right and then you have well, some goals or let's say some output will be there right and this is your first step remember this is your first uh, step of the sub process now when we say the first step process and what kind of input required so we basically require a project management plan requirement documents risk registers very important then activity resource requirement schedule what were your estimate right then stakeholder registers enterprise environmental factor and organization processes so these are the in minimum input right these are the minimum or let's say the minimum uh, input required to plan your procurement activity now once you get this information you need to do some analysis right so one is you make a buy analysis based on this information you will basically approach to various vendor and understand you know what are their offers and based on that you decide uh, whether you need to buy it or make it right so there could be a possibility that where uh, you know the vendor has come up with offer or some quotation but that quotation is very much high and you can make those same amount same uh, services or product in-house or in the company rather than you know giving contract to another third party so that you decide whether you will make it or buy from outside then again you will need some expert judgment the market research and those kind of uh, tools and techniques will be required to decide uh, you know first thing whether do you have to make it or buy it and if you buy it then from whom you will buy it right so in terms of output once you do uh, you know this analysis so you will need basically procure, uh, procurement management plan then procurement state of uh, statement of work uh, for each uh, activity or uh, depending upon each WBS 
then you will need the document making by decision what exactly you decided based on that you know you can go ahead with purchasing requirement then you need to uh, understand what is the selection criteria because you know every vendors is evaluated based on the company standard as well as in you know, the project requirement so those criteria has to be uh, mentioned what, are, what will be those criteria then of course if there's any change request so let's say you have estimated some budget and then based on the quotation you receive you see there is an increase of additional additional right additional budget is required then this will basically trigger you change request right so this kind of information will be required then the same thing can happen with time also uh, other things you know uh, so you need to basically uh, do this change request there could be several numbers of changes uh, which you can identify at this stage and then of course you know based on the changes you need to update your project document so this is what you output you know for the plan procurement process and based on that output you need to you know plan accordingly or update your plan as you uh, come up with new information so some of the key elements when you say the planning procurement so project procurement managers have basically look into various aspects while they are planning for you know procurement so one is that they need to know what is the material and resources required right which is normally called a boq or bomb bill of material or bill of quantity which is required for them to complete the project right then second thing is that they need to make a decision either make or buy right so this is what it mean when i meant earlier make or buy make or buy means you either you make it means internally you you can, you can arrange if it's possible or you need to go outside and then buy from third party so that decision you need to make right then you need to find out what kind of contract you will be agreeing right that that you need to decide in terms of uh, you know uh, key uh, activity project ma procurement manager then you need to decide what are the key dates remember right once you decide the contract or value the next important thing is that the key dates because those equipment or those material those services need to be arrived at particular fixed date because we have the deadline associated uh, with projects right the timeline associated with that and this has to be met for that particular uh in the time commitment which we had made to the client so and then again you know this related to your project milestones they has to be met with the, all the deadlines that is has to be made sure by uh the procurement manager that whatever services uh, being provided they are meeting uh, deadline or the milestone criteria then of course next thing is the legal terms and conditions or so whatever terms and condition which is mentioned in the contract also very important because that has to comply uh, with company policy maybe project requirement has some uh, policy to have follow up have uh, you know the legal terms or conditions with each uh, vendors and subcontractors so we need to look into those things uh, while doing the procurement and then of course the safety is also there so you need to make sure that whatever uh, contract you're signing the safety standards are assured uh, regarding whatever material you're procuring resources or any other services right and then of course uh, before doing this you need to analyze or research other vendors and then uh, you know, understand what are the various criteria for the partnership so these are the key uh, planning or let's say you know the important thing area which uh, project procurement managers should look uh, while they are planning your procurement so once you finished uh, uh, with your procurement uh, planning then the very next step is you conduct the procurement right so once you planned it once you planned it you need to basically conduct it conduct the procurement so connective procurement is simply about obtaining the seller response selecting a seller or awarding a contract so this is what it's mean by conducting you basically depending upon plan or information you're going to the market and choose the final seller and avoid them the contract right this is what it's mean by conducting procurement so conducting procurement basically it's required team to assess the bids you will simply you know get the bids from the various vendors select the partnership basis uh, which what kind of terms and condition you will be following to do the work or do the business with those uh, contractor 
any vendor negotiation the whatever has to be taken place this has to be done at this stage right and all the involved party has to be signed uh, you know in the contract so there could be several party involved while we are having contract subcontractor or vendor all party and terms and condition need to be agreed and uh, this is what we need to do in a contract procurement right and also it's make sure what are the payments and how we will be payment maybe it's one time payment phase time and what are the services those all need to be agreed at this time right this is what is meant by the contract procurement so you need to uh, basically make sure all the key information or the key terms and agreement with respect to the third party not only you know third party but all their related parties involved in the contract are clarified and formally signed or let's say you know in a, in a, in a legal contract uh, so that you know uh, you can render those services from those uh, a service provider so for conducting the procurement uh, normally uh, these are the five critical steps which you need to follow so one is your requirement which is very important which is related to whatever the document you have or information what exactly you want to purchase that is important second thing is your vendor selection once you know what is required then you need to find from whom right you need to this is basically about what is required then this is about from whom you uh, will be finding then negotiation and contracting so once you find out whom then you will basically do a contracting a formal you know or let's say the legal uh, agreement right so this is a third uh, important thing so then the fourth thing is service delivery so once you legalize it uh, and, and you know while legalizing you need to make sure whatever delivery or services are being delivered those are uh, you know as per your expectation and then of course you know monitoring becomes a part of it so once you make a contract then it's very important to monitor and make sure that contract is meeting its obligation and uh, whenever there is a requirement of additional communication or maybe you have some deviation from what the vendor is uh, committed uh, you need to uh, get inside and then start managing and controlling those deviations and then uh, you know fifth thing is renewal or contract so depending upon the situation you may renew the contract or maybe close a contract so it's very important because remember it's a legal document so you need to formally formally close uh, all those documents right all those contract so these are the key five steps for any procurement while we are doing conducting procurement and each step is only important so make sure uh, if you are doing any project management uh, on uh, procurement management on your project these all five steps are met or done so that uh, there's no additional risk or uh, in terms of cost or other other kind of risks involved so conduct procurement uh, we talk in terms of input and output system so what kind of input is required so what kind of information right uh, it's needed so it's really procurement management plan documents so selection criteria seller proposal which is basically your bids or various quotation you received project document make and buy decision and psow right this is procurement scope of work what is mean by psow so once you have this information you will basically do uh, you know various tools and techniques utilized those are basically called bidder conference proposal evaluation techniques are there independent estimation and there's negotiation expert judgment advertising analytical skill those kind of tools and techniques which you can utilize so basically you know uh, conduct the procurement and then once you utilize this information and then perform this analysis using this tool and techniques you will arrive some output right and those outputs are basically nothing but what is a selected seller agreement resource calendar basically when they are providing those resources change request depending upon you know this analysis and input there may be possible you need to change some of the document or additional uh, requirement may be there then the project management plan updates and then documents other documents update for your project so this is what is uh, you know the output of the goal of this sub process right so this is what uh, we need to do in terms of input output process and remember this is your second step in overall project 
management file or project management process uh, for the procurement. So once we are done with control uh, conduct procurement, the next step is basically control the procurement, right? So once you award it, once contract is signed, right? When the contract is signed and it is awarded, basically what happens, you need to monitor, you need to control how the vendor is uh, progressing, how vendor is performing. So the process of managing procurement relationship, monitoring contract performance and making changes and corrections as needed. This is what is mean by control procurement. So you need to basically manage those relationship, monitor it, control it and perform the changes if it's required uh, so that you know project objectives are met. So control procurement. Uh, well, again, in terms of input and output process, so what kind of inputs required? So it's required work performance report, work performance data agreement, then procurement documents, uh, project management plan, approved change request. This kind of information is required. And in terms of tools, again, there are a lot of tools you can utilize. Uh, several tools are there. So contract change control system, payment system, claim administration, record management system. I'm not going to detail of all those uh, tools and techniques, but this you can utilize. Uh, to basically analyze this information and then you are expected to have some output right or some goals So this is basically your work performance information uh, What kind of performance of uh, contractor will be looking at it change it first? Then again, yeah, you know if depending upon that you need to update your project management plan document and organization process So these kind of things uh, You know, we will be doing as a control procurement and this is your third step, right? So first you need to plan it, conduct it, and then you need to control it uh, for the procurement point of view. So while controlling procurement, you know, you need to basically see some of the important things. Uh, and, and it's one of the critical thing because, you know, once the um, vendor get the contract, you need to make sure the vendor is maintaining, uh, you know, the relationship or the expectation what is required from the company, right? Which basically ensures your final services or functions uh, will meet the requirement or what is their initial purpose they are meeting those uh, requirement right so controlling procurements are normally basically involve these kind of activities like you know the evaluating the regular internal status what are the status of, uh, of your pro product or the deliverables contract agreement do with the progress performance of the vendors and inspections is also one of the part of the controlling uh, procurement Right, then assessing the work orders and then issuing any additional payment or payment status. So all kind of uh, do uh, uh, the jobs which you are doing is basically related to your controlling procurement. Then after controlling procurement, the next step is basically your close procurement, right? So once you conduct, uh, conducted your procurement, control it and finished it, you need to formally close it, which is basically the process of completing each uh, project procurement, right? So when I say um, when I say the closed procurement, right? So it's basically the in, requires some input, which is project management and documentation mainly. Then you need to basically do the uh, documentation, which is record management system and neg negotiation, final negotiation with the vendor. And the goal is to basically close all the procurement document and update your uh, organization process. And this is what your fourth step is, right? Uh, so you need to formally close all your uh, obligations with the uh, subcontractor so uh, closing procurement straightforward right this involves in almost all uh, companies organizations a standard required to do this right so you need to basically do a final negotiation once service is completed and then confirm basically that vendor has fulfilled all the terms with the original contract as well as company has also you know uh, completed their obligations so both party basically uh, uh, relieve each other from their obligation and finally you know contract is closed this is what is mean by the closer of contract so this uh, you need to make sure it is done when any procurement uh, activity is completed so quick review uh, the first step which was plan procurement management which is all about planning then the second step is a conduct procurement and then once you conduct it, you need to control the procurement and once your procurement is finished you need to basically formally formally close it right your procurement this is what it's mean uh, you know my, my project procurement management process so quick summary for a few of uh, the keywords ffp which is basically firm fixed price cpf cost plus fee 
cost plus fixed fee which means by CPFF CPIF cost plus incentive fee TMNM time and material contract right this is what we learn about the type of contract this these are nothing but uh, types of contract okay then uh, we have again the single source which is basically means so preferred seller which is from where you are selling and there could be several uh, you know, vendors for one providing one services and when there is one single then it's called single source sole source is only one qualified vendor because where you try to find out some activity uh, some uh, resources or activity a supporter from the various market but you couldn't get uh, you know uh, the expected vendor so there is only one vendor is available in the market so this is basically called one qualified seller RFQ request for code fact complies basically uh, the condition where party may claim that whatever we have asked so whatever is we have mentioned the contract that is provided uh, to party B this is what in, it can be from both way right it can be a party a can claim to party b or party b can claim to party a uh, so this is what is mean by factor comply and you can find this you know uh, the legal terms in uh, the contract document or any uh, vendors uh, po issued or purchase order so this is just a legal uh, term so far you know we have learned various knowledge area we have just completed a pre procurement uh, knowledge area so if you see initially which we discussed that project management is all about you know applying or utilizing your knowledge right your skills tools and techniques so when you combine all this together you basically do your project management a successful uh, you know project uh, management so this is what is needed when you want to do a successful project management so remember skill is basically related to your people right people and people are the key stakeholders uh, you know uh, of any uh, any any project so when I say stakeholder it could be you know not only the people who is directly working on project but there go the people who are not directly with the project but they can you know highly influence the the project so stakeholder involves various kind of people so project team project director project manager senior manager companies company director those all people are called as stakeholder for any project right so and and it's very important to uh, manage those stakeholders identify those stakeholders uh, to have you know the right people at the right time and in, a, in a, the right uh, way so that basically helps you to get the optimum resource which is required to complete your project so like you know we as a human being in evolved right similarly project management field is also evolving so each area there are several areas starting from race, tool, budget, success, sponsors, integration, project management overall, time analysis. I mean, there are several areas involved in a project, right? It's a combination of various areas, right? Combination of areas, uh, which is what is project management. And this is basically, you know, uh, how you manage those areas, how you integrate those areas and uh, how you combine all those stakeholders to arrive at you know the your success or you know achieve target whatever is a target you have in terms of your scope wb is all as a plan cost this is basically achieving your goal by managing your people tools and processes right this is what is mean by project management Okay, so uh, we have finished the procurement, right? Remember, procurement uh, is one of the key knowledge area. Now, once you completed the procurement knowledge area, the next thing is that stakeholders, right? We just discussed that. There are several kind of people involved in a project, right? And we need to manage their expectation, their, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 
the expectation they are having from the project because every stakeholders has some sort of expectation some sort of interest in a project and we as a project manager you need to make sure that those interest uh, those requirements are met and this is what is all about your stakeholders management right and this is what we are going to learn in our next